Section 1 of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Part 1. The Telemachade. Episode 1. Telemachus. Part 1. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing-gown ungirdled was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, In Troibo ad altari dei. Halted, he peered down the dark winding stairs and called out coarsely, Come up, Kitch, come up, you fearful Jesuit. Solemnly he came forward and mounted the round gun-rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding land, and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight of Stephen Dedalus, he bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on the top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, equine in its length, and at the light, untonsured hair, grained and hued like a pale oak. Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl smartly. "'Back to barracks,' he said sternly. He added in a preacher's tone, "'For this, O oh dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine, body and soul and blood and owns. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscles. Silence all.' He peered sideways up and gave a long, slow whistle of call, and then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysostomos. Two strong, shrill whistles answered to the calm. Thanks, old chap, he cried briskly. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? He skipped off the gun rest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump, shadowed face and sullen oval jowl recalled a prelate, patron of arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. The mockery of it, he said gaily. Your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over the parapet laughing to himself. Stephen Dedalus stepped up, followed him wearily halfway, and sat down on the edge of the gun rest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet dipped the brush in the bowl, and lathered cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is observed, too, Malachi Mulligan, two dactyls. But it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the aunt to fork out twenty quid? He laid the brush aside, and laughing with delight, cried, Will he come, the Jejun Jesuit? Ceasing, he began to shave with care. "'Tell me, Mulligan,' Stephen said quietly. "'Yes, my love. "'How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower?' Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. "'God, isn't he dreadful?' he said frankly. "'A ponderous Saxon. "'He thinks you're not a gentleman. "'God, these bloody English, bursting with money and ind indigestion. "'Because he comes from Oxford, you know, Dedalus, "'you have the real Oxford manner.' He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife-blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun-case? Ah, woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said with energy and growing fear. Out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther. You save men from drowning. I'm not a hero. If he stays on here, I'm off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scutter, he cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Lend us a loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner dirty, crumpled handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over his handkerchief, he said, The Bard's Nose Rag, a new art color for our Irish poets, snot green. 
You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay, his fair oak-pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, isn't the sea what algae calls it? A great sweet mother? The snot-green sea. The scrotum-tightening sea. Epi oinopa ponton. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks. I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata. She is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mailboat clearing the harbour mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his grey searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kitch, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm hyperborean as much as you, but to think of your mother begging you for her last breath to kneel down and pray for her, and you refused, there is something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again lightly his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely mummer, he mummered to himself, Kitch, the loveliest mummer of them all. He shaved evenly and with care and silence seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow and grazed at the frayed edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain that was not yet pain of love fretted his heart. Silently in a dream she had come to him after her death, her wasted body with its loose brown grave clothes giving off an odor of wax and rosewood, her breath that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge he saw the sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the muffled voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of white china had stood beside her deathbed holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning and vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, poor dog's body he said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. How are the second-hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it, he said contentedly. Second leg they should be. God knows what poxy bows he left them off. I have a lovely pair with a hair-striped gray. You look spiffing in them. I'm not joking, Kitch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they're gray. He can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face to the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear green trousers. He folded his razor neatly and then with stroking pulps of fingers felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night, said Buck Mulligan, says you have G.P.I. He's up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman. General paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror a half-circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight, now radiant on the sea. His curling shaven lips laughed, and the edges of his white glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong, well-knit trunk. Look at yourself, he said, you dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out for him, cleft by a crooked crack, hair on an end. And as he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog's body to rid of vermin? It asks me, too. I pinched it out of the skivvy's room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The ant always keeps plain-looking servants for Malachi. Lead him not in temptation and her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban at not seeing his face in a mirror, he said, if Wilde were only alive to see you. Drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, it is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked-looking glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stephen's and walked with him around the tower, his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had thrust them. It's not fair to tease you like that, Kinch, is it? he said kindly. 
God knows you have more spirit than any of them. Parried again, he fears the lancet of my art as I fear that of his. The cold steel pen. Cracked looking-glass of a servant. Tell that to the oxy chap downstairs and touch him for a guinea. He's stinking with money and thinks you're not a gentleman. His old fellow made his tin by selling jallop to Zulus or some bloody swindle or other. God, Kinch, if you and I could only work together, we might do something for the island. Hellenize it. Cranley's arm. His arm. And to think of your having to beg for these swine. I'm the only one that knows what you are. Why don't you trust me more? What have you up your nose against me? Is it Haines? If he makes any noise here, I'll bring down Seymour, and we'll give him a ragging worse than we gave Clive Kempthorpe. Young shouts of moneyed voices in Clive Kempthorpe's rooms. Pale faces. They hold their ribs with laughter, one clasping another. Oh, I shall expire. Break the news to her gently, Aubrey. I shall die. With slit ribbons of his shirt, whipping the air, he hops and hobbles around the table with trousers at his heels, chased by aides of Magdalen with the tailor's shears. A scarf-cast face, gilded with marmalade. I don't want to be debagged. Don't you play the giddy ox with me. Shouts from the open window, startling even in the quadrangle. A deaf gardener, apron, masked with Matthew Arnold's face, pushes his mower on the somber lawn, watching narrowly the dancing motes of grass alms. To ourselves, new paganism, omphalos. Let him stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him except at night. Then what is it? Black Mulligan asked impatiently. Cough it up. I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Bray Head that lay on the water like the snout of a sleeping whale. Stephen freed his arm quietly. Do you wish me to tell you? he asked. Yes, what is it? Buck Mulligan answered. I don't remember anything. He looked in Stephen's face as he spoke. A light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair, uncombed hair and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, do you remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quietly and said, What? Where? I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said, and went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked you who was in your room. Yes, Buck Mulligan said. What did I say? I forget. You said, Stephen answered, Oh, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. A flush which made him seem younger and more engaging rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that? he asked. Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death? he asked. Your mother's, or yours, or my own? You saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the Mater and Richmond, and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on the deathbed when she asks you. Why? Because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you. Only it's injected the wrong way. To me it's all a mockery and beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor Sir Peter Teasel and picks buttercups off the quilt. Humor her till it's over. You crossed her last wish in death, and yet you won't sulk with me, because I don't whinge like some hired mute from Lalouette's. Absurd. I suppose I didn't say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, shielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I'm not thinking of the offense to my mother. Of what, then? Buck Mulligan had asked. Of the offense to me, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung around on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. He walked off quickly around the parapet. Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, veiling their sight, and he felt the fever in his cheeks. A voice within the tower called loudly. Are you up there, Mulligan? I'm coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offenses? Chuck Loyola, Kitch, and come on down. The Sassanac wants his morning rashers. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. Don't mope over it all day, he said. It's inconsequent. 
Give up the moody brooding. His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed out of the stairhead. And no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery, for Fergus rules the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and further out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light-shod hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea, the twinning stresses two by two, a hand plucking the harp-strings, merging their twinning chords, wave-white wetted towards shimmering in the dim tide. A cloud began to cover the sun slowly, wholly shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay beneath him, a bowl of bitter waters. Fergus's song. I sang it alone in the house, holding down the long, dark chords. Her door was open. She wanted to hear my music. Silent with awe and pity, I went to her bedside. She was crying in her wretched bed. For those words, Stephen, love's bitter mystery. Where now? Her secrets, old feather fans, tassel dance cards, powdered with musk, a god of amber beads in her locked drawer. A birdcage hung in the sunny windows of her house when she was a girl. She heard old Roy singing in the pantomime of Turco the Terrible, and laughed with others when he sang, I am the boy that can enjoy invisibility. Phantasmal mirth folded away, musk perfumed, and no more turn aside and brood. Folded away in the memory of nature and with her toys. Memories beset his brooding brain. Her glass of water from the kitchen tap where she had approached the sacrament. A cored apple filled with brown sugar, roasting for it the hob on the dark autumn evening. Her shapely fingernails redded by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. In a dream, silently, she had come to him, her wasted body with its loose grave clothes giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath bent over him with mute secret words, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes staring out of death to shake and bend my soul. On me alone, the ghost candle to light her agony. Ghostly light on a tortured face. Her hoarse loud breath rattling in horror while all prayed on their knees. Her eyes on me to strike me down. Liliata rutilantium te confessorum turma circumdet. Eubilantium te virginum chorus excipiat. Ghoul, chur of corpses. No, mother. Let me be and let me live. Kinch, ahoy! Buck Mulligan's voice sang from within the tower. It came nearer up the staircase, calling again. Stephen, still trembling at his soul's cry, heard warm running sunlight in the air behind his friendly words. Dedalus, come down like a good mosey. Breakfast is ready. Haynes is apologizing for waking us last night. That's all right. I'm coming, Stephen said, turning. Do, for Jesus' sake, Buck Mulligan said, for my sake and for all of our sakes. His head disappeared and reappeared. I told him your symbol of Irish art. He says it's very clever. Touch him for a quid, will you? A guinea, I mean. I get paid this morning, Stephen said. The school kip, Buck Mulligan said. How much? Four quid? Lend us one. If you want, Stephen said. Four shining sovereigns, Buck Mulligan cried with delight. We'll have a glorious drunk to astonish the druidy druids. Four omnipotent sovereigns. He flung up his hands and tramped down the stone stairs, singing out the tune with a cockney accent. Oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer, and wine, on coronation, coronation day. Oh, won't we have a merry time, on coronation day. Warm sunshine marrying over the sea, the nickel shaving bowl shone, forgotten on the parapet. Why should I bring it down, or leave it there all day, forgotten friendship? He went over to it, held it in his hands a while, feeling its coolness, smelling the clammy slaver of the lather in which the brush was struck. So I carried the boat of incense then at Clongo's. I am another now, and yet the same, a servant too, a servant of a servant. In the gloomy domed living room of the tower, Buck Mulligan's gowned form moved briskly to and fro about the hearth, hiding and revealing its yellow glow. Two shafts of daylight fell across the flag floor from the high barbicans, and at the meeting of their rays a cloud of coal smoke and fumes of fried grease floated, turning. "'Well, be choked,' Buck Mulligan said. "'Haynes, open that door, will you?' Stephen laid the shaving bowl in the locker. A tall figure rose from the hammock where it had been sitting, went to the doorway, and pulled open the inner doors. 
Have you the key? a voice asked. Dedalus has it, Buck Mulligan said. Janie, Mac, I'm choked. He howled without looking up from the fire. Kinch! It's in the lock, Stephen said, coming forward. The key scraped round harshly twice, and when the heavy door had been set ajar, welcome light and bright air entered. Haines stood at the doorway, looking out. Stephen hailed his upended valise to the table and sat down to wait. Buck Mulligan tossed the fry on the dish beside him. Then he carried the dish and a large teapot over the table, set them down heavily inside with relief. "'I'm melting,' he said, as the candle remarked, when— "'But hush! Not a word more on that subject. Kinch, wake me up. Bread, butter, honey. Haines, come in. The grub is ready. Oh, bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts. Where's the sugar? Oh, Jay, there's no milk. Stephen fetched the loaf and a pot of honey and the butter cooler from the locker. Buck Mulligan sat down in a sudden pet. What sort of kip is this, he said. I told her to come after eight. We can drink it black, Stephen said thirstily. Then there's a lemon in the locker. Oh, damn you and your Paris fads, Buck Mulligan said. I want Sandy Cove milk. Haines came in from the doorway and said quietly, The woman is coming up with the milk. The blessings of God on you, Buck Mulligan cried, jumping up from his chair. Sit down, pour out the tea there. The sugar is in the bag. Here I can't go fumbling at the damned eggs. He hacked through the fry on the fish and slapped it out in three plates, saying, In nomine patris il fili spiritus sancti. Haines sat down to pour out the tea. I'm giving you two lumps each, he said, but I say, Mulligan, you do make strong tea, don't you? Buck Mulligan, hewing thick slices from the loaf, said in an old woman's wheeling voice, When I makes tea, I makes tea, as M old Mother Grogan said. And when I makes water, I makes water. By Jove, it's tea, Haines said. Buck Mulligan went on hewing and wielding. So I do. Mrs. Cahill, says he. Begob, ma'am, says Mrs. Cahill, God send you don't make them in one pot. He lunged towards his messmates and turned a thick slice of bread impaled on his knife. That's folk, he said very earnestly, for your book, Haynes. Five lines of text and ten pages of notes about the folk of the fish gods of Dundrum, printed by the weird sisters in the year of the big wind. He turned to Stephen and asked in a fine puzzled voice, lifting his brows, Can you recall, brother? Is Mother Grogan's tea and water pot spoken of in the Mabinogian, or is it in the Upanishads? I doubt it, said Stephen gravely. Do you now? Buck Mulligan said in the same tone. For reasons, pray? I fancy, Stephen said as he ate, it did not exist in or out of the Mabinogian. Mother Grogan was, one imagines, a kinswoman of Marianne. Buck Mulligan's face smiled with delight. Charming, he said with a finical sweet voice, showing his white teeth and blinking his eyes pleasantly. Do you think she was? Quite charming. Then, suddenly overclouding all his features, he growled in a hoarsened, rasping voice as he hewed again vigorously at the loaf. For old Marianne, she doesn't care a damn, but hising up her petticoats. He crammed his mouth with fry and munched and droned. End of section one. Section 2 of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Part 1. The Telemachade. Episode 1. Telemachus. Part 2. The doorway was darkened by an entering form. The milk, sir. Come in, ma'am, Mulligan said. Kinch, get the jug. An old woman came forward and stood by Stephen's elbow. That's a lovely morning, sir, she said. Glory be to God. To whom? Mulligan said, glancing at her. Ha, ah, to be sure. Stephen reached back and took the milk jug from the locker. The islanders, Mulligan said to Haynes casually, speak frequently of the collector of prepuces. How much, sir? asked the old woman. A quart, Stephen said. He watched her pour into the measure and thence into the jug rich white milk, not hers, old shrunken paps, she poured again a measure full and a tilly. Old and secret, she had entered from a morning world, maybe a messenger. She praised the goodness of the milk, pouring it out, crouching by a patient cow at daybreak in a lush field, a witch on her toadstool, her wrinkled fingers quick at the squirting dugs. They lowed about her whom they knew, dew-silky cattle, 
Silk of the kine and poor old woman, names given her in old times. A wandering crone, lowly form of an immortal serving her conqueror and her gay betrayer, their common coquin, a messenger from her secret mourning. To serve or to upbraid, whether he could not tell, but scorned to beg her favor. It is indeed, ma'am, Buck Mulligan said, pouring milk into their cups. Taste it, sir, she said. He drank at her bidding. If we could live on good food like that, he said to her somewhat loudly, we wouldn't have the country full of rotten teeth and rotten guts. Living in a bog swamp, eating cheap food, and the streets paved with dust, horse dung, and consumptive spits. Are you a medical student, sir? the old woman asked. I am, ma'am, Buck Mulligan answered. Look at that now, she said. Stephen listened in a scornful silence. She bows her old head to a voice that speaks to her loudly, her bone setter, her medicine man. Me, she slights. To the voice that will shrive an oil for the grave, all there is of her but her woman's unclean loins of a man's flesh, made not in God's kindness, the serpent's prey. And to the loud voice that now bids her be silent with wandering unsteady eyes, do you understand what she says? Stephen asked her. Is it French you're talking, sir? The old woman said to Haynes. Haynes spoke to her again in longer speech, confidently. Irish, Buck Mulligan said. Is there Gaelic on you? I thought it was Irish, she said, by the sound of it. Are you from the West, sir? I'm an Englishman, Haynes answered. He's English, Buck Mulligan said, and he thinks we ought to speak Irish in Ireland. Sure we ought to, the old woman said, and I'm ashamed I don't speak the language myself. I'm told it's a grand language by them that knows. Grand is no name for it, said Buck Mulligan. Wonderful entirely. Fill us out some more tea, Kinch. Would you like a cup, ma'am? No, thank you, sir, the old woman said, slipping the ring of the milk can on her forearm and about to go. Haines said to her, Have you your bill? We'd better pay your mulligan, hadn't we? Stephen filled again the three cups. Bill, sir, she said, halting. Well... It's seven mornings a pint, two pence, is seven twos, is a shilling, and two pence over. And these three mornings, a quart of four pence, is three quarts, is a shilling. That's a shilling and one and two, is two and two, sir. Buck Mulligan sighed, and, having filled his mouth with a crust thickly buttered on both sides, stretched forth his legs and began to search his trouser pockets. Pay up and look pleasant, Haines said to him, smiling. Stephen filled a third cup a spoonful of tea colouring faintly the thick, rich milk. Buck Mulligan brought up a florin, twisted round his fingers, and cried, A miracle! He passed it along the table towards the old woman, saying, Ask nothing more of me, sweet. All I can give you I give. Stephen laid the coin in her uneager hand. We'll owe you two pence, he said. Time enough, sir, she said, taking the coin. Time enough. Good morning, sir. She curtsied and went out, followed by Buck Mulligan's tender chant. Heart of my heart, were it more, more would be laid at your feet. He turned to Stephen and said, Seriously, Dedalus, I'm stony. Hurry out to your old school, Kip, and bring us back some money. Today the bards must drink and junk it. Ireland expects that every man this day will do his duty. That reminds me, Haynes said, rising, that I have to visit your national library today. Our swim first, Buck Mulligan said. He turned to Stephen and asked blandly, Is this the day of your monthly wash, Kinch? Then to Haynes, the unclean bard makes a point of washing once a month. All Ireland is washed by the Gulf Stream, Stephen said, as he let honey trickle over the slice of loaf. Haynes, from the corner where he was nodding easily a scarf about the loose collar of his tennis shirt, spoke. I intend to make a collection of your sayings, if you will let me. Speaking to me, they wash and tub and scrub, egg and bite and inwit, conscience, yet here's a spot. That one about the cracked looking-glass of a servant being the symbol of Irish art is deuced good. Buck Mulligan kicked Stephen's foot under the table and said with warmth of tone, Wait till you hear him on Hamlet, Haynes. Well, I mean it, Haynes said, still speaking to Stephen. I was just thinking of it when that poor old creature came in. Would I make any money by it, Stephen asked? Haynes laughed, and, as he took his soft gray hat from the holdfast of the hammock, said, I don't know, I'm sure. He strolled out of the doorway. Buck Mulligan bent across to Stephen and said with coarse vigor, "'You put your hoof in it now. What did you say that for?' "'Well,' Stephen said, "'the problem is to get money. From whom? From the milkwoman or from him? It's a toss-up, I think.' 
I blow him out about you, Buck Mulligan said, and then you come along with your lousy leer and your gloomy Jesuit jibes. I see little hope, Stephen said, from her or from him. Buck Mulligan sighed tragically and laid his hand on Stephen's arm. From me, Kinch, he said. In a suddenly changed tone, he added, To tell you the God's truth, I think you're right. Damn all else they are good for. Why don't you play them as I do? To hell with them all. Let us get out of the kip. He stood up, gravely ungirdled, and disrobed himself of his gown, saying resignedly, Mulligan is stripped of his garments. He emptied his pockets onto the table. There's your snot rag, he said. And putting on his stiff collar and rebellious tie, he spoke to them, chiding them into his dangling watch chain. His hands plunged and rummaged in his trunk while he called for a clean handkerchief. God, we'll simply have to dress the character. I want puce gloves and green boots. Contradiction. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then. I contradict myself. Mercurial Malachi. A limp black missile flew out of his talking hands. And there's your Latin quarter hat, he said. Stephen picked it up and put it on. Haynes called to them from the doorway. Are you coming, you fellows? I'm ready, Buck Mulligan answered, going towards the door. Come out, Kinch. You have eaten all we left, I suppose. Resigned, he passed out with grave words and gait, saying well nigh with sorrow. And going forth, he met Butterfly. Stephen, taking his ash plant from its leaning place, followed them out, and as they went down the ladder, pulled to the slow iron door and locked it. He put the huge key in his inner pocket. At the front of the ladder, Buck Mulligan asked, Did you bring the key? I have it, Stephen said, preceding them. He walked on. Behind him he heard Buck Mulligan club with his heavy bath towel the leader shoots of ferns and grasses. Down, sir. How dare you, sir? Haynes asked. Do you pay rent for this tower? Twelve quid, Buck Mulligan said. To the Secretary of State for War, Stephen added over his shoulders. They halted while Haynes surveyed the tower and said at last, Rather bleak in winter time, I would say. Martello, you call it? Billy Pitt had them built. Buck Mulligan said, when the French were on the sea. But ours is the Omphalos. What is your idea of Hamlet? Haynes asked Stephen. No, no, Buck Mulligan shouted in pain. I'm not equal to Thomas Aquinas and my fifty-five reasons he has made out to prop it up. Wait till I have a few pints in me first. He turned to Stephen, saying, as he pulled down neatly the peaks of his primrose waistcoat, You couldn't manage it under three pints, Kinch, could you? It has waited so long, Stephen said listlessly. It can wait longer. You pique my curiosity, Haines said amiably. Is it some paradox? Pooh, Buck Mulligan said. We have grown out of wild and paradoxes. It's quite simple. He proves by algebra that Hamlet's grandson is Shakespeare's grandfather, and that he himself is the ghost of his own father. What? Haines said, beginning to point at Stephen. He himself? Buck Mulligan slung his towel stolewise round his neck, and, bending in loose laughter, he said in Stephen's ear, O oh, shade of Kinch the Elder, Japhet in search of a father. We're always tired in the morning, Stephen said to Haynes, and it is rather long to tell. Buck Mulligan, walking forward again, raised his hands. The sacred pint alone can unbind the tongue of Daedalus, he said. I mean to say, Haynes explained to Stephen as they followed, this tower and these cliffs here remind me somehow of Elsinore. That beetles o'er his base into the sea, isn't it? Buck Mulligan turned suddenly for an instant towards Stephen, but he did not speak. In the bright silent instant Stephen saw his own image in cheap dusty morning between the gay attires. It's a wonderful tale, Haynes said, bringing them to a halt again. Eyes, pale as the sea, and the wind had freshened paler, firm and prudent. The sea's ruler, he gazed southward over the bay, empty save for the smoking plume of the mailboat vague on the bright skyline and a sail tacking by the muglins. I read a theological interpretation of it somewhere, he said, bemused. The father and the son idea, the son striving to be atoned with the father. Buck Mulligan at once put on a blithe, broadly smiling face. He looked at them, his well-shaped mouth opened happily, his eyes, from which he had suddenly withdrawn all shrewd sense, blinking with mad gaiety. He moved a doll's head to and fro, the brims of his Panama hat quivering, and began to chant in a quiet, happy, foolish voice.
I'm the queerest young fellow that you've ever heard. My mother's a Jew, my father's a bird. With Joseph the joiner I cannot agree. So here's to disciples and cavalry. He held up a forefinger of warning. If anyone thinks that I ain't divine, he'll get no free drinks when I'm making the wine. But have to drink water and wish it were plain that I make when the wine becomes water again. He tugged swiftly at Stephen's ash plant in farewell, and running forward to a brow of the cliff, fluttered his hands at his sides like fins or wings, of one about to rise in the air and chanted, Good-bye now, good-bye, write down all I said, and tell Tom, Dick, and Harry I rose from the dead. What's bred in the bone cannot fail me to fly, and all of it's breezy, good-bye now, good-bye. He capered before them down towards the forty-foot hole, fluttering his wing-like hands, leaping nimbly. Mercury's hat quivering in the fresh wind that bore back to them his brief bird-sweet cries. Haynes, who had been laughing guardedly, walked on beside Stephen and said, We oughtn't to laugh, I suppose. He's rather blasphemous. I'm not a believer myself, that is to say. Still, his gaiety takes the harm out of it somehow, doesn't it? What did he call it? Joseph the Joiner? The Ballad of Joking Jesus, Stephen answered. Oh, Haynes said, you have heard it before. Three times a day, after meals, Stephen said dryly. "'You're not a believer, are you?' Haynes asked. "'I mean, a believer in the narrow sense of the word. Creation from nothing and miracles and a personal God.' "'There's only one sense of the word, it seems to me,' Stephen said. Haynes stopped to take out a smooth silver case, in which twinkled a green stone. He sprang it open with his thumb and offered it. "'Thank you,' Stephen said, taking a cigarette. Haynes helped himself and snapped the case, too. He put it back in his side pocket and took from his waist pocket a nickel tinder box, sprang it open too, and having lit his cigarette, held the flaming spunk towards Stephen in the shell of his hands. Yes, of course, he said, as they went out again. Either you believe or you don't, isn't it? Personally, I couldn't stomach the idea of a personal God. You don't stand for that, I suppose. You beholden me, Stephen said with grim displeasure, a horrible example of three thought. He walked on, waiting to be spoken to, trailing his ash plant by his side. Its ferule followed lightly on the path, squealing at his heels. My familiar, after me calling, Stephen, a wavering line along the path. They will walk on it tonight, coming here in the dark. He wants that key. It's mine. I paid the rent. Now I ate his salt bread. Give him the key, too, all. He will ask for it. That was in his eyes. After all, Haynes began, Stephen turned and saw the cold gaze which had measured him was not all unkind. After all, I should think you are able to free yourself. You are your own master, it seems to me. I am a servant of two masters, Stephen said, an English and an Italian. Italian? Haynes said. A crazy queen, old and jealous, kneel down before me. And a third, Stephen said, there is, who wants me for odd jobs. Italian? Haynes said again. What do you mean? The Imperial British State, Stephen answered, his color rising in the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. Haynes detached from his underlip some fibers of tobacco before he spoke. I can quite understand that, he said calmly. An Irishman must think like that, I dare say. We feel in England that we have treated you rather unfairly. It seems history is to blame. The proud, potent titles clanged over Stephen's memory, the triumph of their brazen bells. Et unum sanctum catholicum et apostolicum ecclesium. The slow growth and the change of rite and dogma like his own rare thoughts. A chemistry of stars. Symbols of the apostles in the mass for Pope Marcellus. The voices blended, singing alone, loud in affirmation. And behind their chant, the vigilant angel of the church, militant, disarmed, and menaced, heresiarchs. A horde of heresies fleeing with mitres awry, Photius and the brood of mockers of whom Mulligan was one, and Arius, warring his life long upon the consubstantiality of the Son and the Father, and Valentine spurning Christ's serene body, and the subtle African heresiarch Sibelius, who held that the Father was himself his own son. Words Mulligan had spoken a moment since in mockery and to the stranger. Idle mockery, the void awaits, surely, all them that weave the wind, a menace, a disarming and a worsening from those embattled angels of the church, 
Michael's host, who defend forever in the hour of conflict with their lances and their shields. Hear, hear! Prolonged applause. Zoot, nom de Dieu! Of course I'm a Britisher, Haines' voices said, and I feel as one. I don't want to see my country fall into the hands of the German Jews, either. That's our national problem, I'm afraid, just now. Two men stood at the verge of the cliff, watching. Businessmen, boatmen. She's making for Bullock Harbor. The boatman nodded towards the north of the bay with some disdain. There's five fathoms out there, he said. I'd be swept up that way when the tide comes in about one. It's nine days today. The men that was drowned. A sail veering about the blank bay, waiting for a stolen bundle to bob up, roll over to the sun, a puffy face, salt white. Here I am. They followed the winding path down the creek. Buck Mulligan stood on a stone, in shirt sleeves, his unclipped tie rippling over his shoulder. A young man, clinging to a spur of a rock near him, moved slowly, frog-wise, his green legs in the deep jelly of the water. "'Is your brother with you, Malachi?' "'Down in Westmeath, with the Bannons.' "'Still there?' "'I got a card from Bannon. Says he found a sweet young thing down there. Photo girl, he calls her.' Snapshot, eh? Brief exposure. Buck Mulligan sat down to unlace his boots. An elderly man shot up near the spur of rock, a blowing red face. He scrambled up by the stones, water glistening on his pate and on his garland of his gray hair, water reeling over his chest and paunch and spilling jets out of his black sagging loincloth. Buck Mulligan made way for him to scramble past, and glancing at Haynes and Stephen crossed himself piously with his thumbnail at brow and lips and breastbone. Seymour's back in town, the young man said, grasping again his spur of rock. Chucked medicine and going in for the army. Ah, go to God, Buck Mulligan said. Going over next week to stew. You know that red Carlisle girl, Lily? Yes. Spooning with him last night on the pier. The father is wrought with money. Is she up the pole? Better ask Seymour that. "'Seymour, a bleeding officer,' Buck Mulligan said. He nodded to himself as he drew off his trousers and stood up, saying tritely, "'Red-headed woman, buck like goats.' He broke off in alarm, feeling his side under the flapping shirt. "'My twelfth rib is gone,' he cried. "'I am the Ubermensch, toothless kinch, and I, the supermen.' He struggled out of his shirt and flung it behind him to where his clothes lay. "'Are you going in there, Malachi?' Yes, make room in the bed. The young man shoved himself backwards through the water and reached the middle of the creek in two long, clean strokes. Haines sat down on a stone, smoking. Are you not coming in? Buck Mulligan asked. Uh, later on, Haines said. Not on my breakfast. Stephen turned away. I'm going, Mulligan, he said. Give us that key, Kinch, Buck Mulligan said, to keep my chemise flat. Stephen handed him the key. Buck Mulligan laid it across his heaped clothes. "'And two pence,' he said, "'for a pint. Throw it here.' Stephen threw two pennies on the soft heap. Dressing, undressing. Buck Mulligan erect, with joined hands before him, said solemnly, "'He who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord. Thus spake Zarathustra.' His plump body plunged. "'We'll see you again,' Haines said, turning as Stephen walked up the path and smiling at wild Irish." Horn of a bull, hoof of a horse, smile of a Saxon. The ship, Buck Mulligan cried, half twelve. Good, Stephen said. He walked along the upward curving path. Liliata rutilantium turma circumdet, ubiolantium t virginium. The priest's gray nimbus in a niche where he dressed discreetly. I will not sleep here to-night. Home also I cannot go. A voice, sweetened and sustained, called him from the sea. Turning the curve, he waved his hand. It called again. A sleek brown head, a seal's, far out on the water, round. Usurper. End of section 2this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, Part 1, The Telemachade, Episode 2, Nestor. You, Cochrane, what city sent for him? Tarentum, sir. Very good. Well? There was a battle, sir. 
Very good. Where? The boy's blank face asked the blank window. Fabled by the daughters of memory, and yet it was in some way, if not as memory fabled it. A phrase, then, of impatience, thud of Blake's wings of excess. I hear the ruin of all space, shattered glass and toppled masonry, and time one livid final flame. What's left us, then? I forget the place, sir, 279 B.C. Askelum, Stephen said, glancing at the name and date in the Gorse Guard book. Yes, sir. And he said, Another victory like that, and we are done for. That phrase the world had remembered. A dull ease of the mind. From a hill above a corpse-room plain, a general speaking to his officers leaned upon his spear. Any general to any officers. They lend ear. You, Armstrong, Stephen said. What was the end of Pyrrhus? End of Pyrrhus, sir? I know, sir. Ask me, sir, Common said. Wait. You, Armstrong, do you know anything about Pyrrhus? A bag of fig rolls lay snugly in Armstrong's satchel. He curled them between his palms at whiles and swallowed them softly. Crumbs adhered to the tissue of his lips, a sweetened boy's breath. Well-off people, proud that their eldest son was in the navy. Vico Road, Dalkey. Pyrrhus, sir? Pyrrhus. A peer? All laughed. Mirthless, high, malicious laughter. Armstrong looked round at his classmates, silly glee in profile. In a moment they will laugh more loudly, aware of my lack of rule and the fees their papas pay. Tell me now, Stephen said, poking the boy's shoulder with a book, what is a peer? A peer, sir, Armstrong said. A thing out of the water, a kind of a bridge, Kingston Pier, sir. Some laughed again, mirthless but with meaning. Two in the back bench whispered, yes, they knew. Had never learned, nor even been innocent, all. With envy he watched their faces, Edith, Ethel, Gertie, Lily, their likes, their breaths, too, sweetened with tea and jam, their bracelets tittering in the struggle. Kingston Pier, Stephen said, yes. A disappointed bridge. The words troubled their gaze. How, sir, Common asked. A bridge is across a river. For Haynes' chapbook. No one here to hear. Tonight, deftly amid wild drink and talk, to pierce the polished mail of his mind. What then? A jester at the court of his master, indulged and disesteemed, winning a clement master's praise. Why had they chosen all that part, not wholly for the smooth caress? For them, too, history was a tale like any other too often heard, their land a pawn-shop. Had Pyrrhus not fallen by Bedlam's hand in Argos, or Julius Caesar not been knifed to death? They are not to be thought away. Time has branded them and fettered they are lodged in a room of the infinite possibilities they have ousted. But can those have been possible, seeing that they never were? Or was that only possible which came to pass? Weave, weaver of the wind. Tell us a story, sir. Oh, do, sir, a ghost story. Where do you begin in this? Stephen asked, opening another book. Weep no more, Common said. Go on then, Talbot. And the story, sir? After, Stephen said. Go on, Talbot. A swarthy boy opened a book and propped it nimbly under the breastwork of his satchel. He recited jerks of verse with odd glances at the text. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more. For Lycidas your sorrow is not dead, sunk though he be beneath the watery floor. It must be a movement, then, an actuality of the possible as possible. Aristotle's phrase formed itself within the gabbled verses and floated out into the studio silence of the library of St. Genevieve where they read, sheltered from the sin of Paris, night by night. By his elbow a delicate Siamese conned a handbook of strategy, fed and feeding brains about me, under glow-lamps impaled with faintly beating feelers, and in my mind's darkness a sloth of the underworld reluctant shy of brightness, shifting her dragon's scaly folds. Thought is the thought of thought, tranquil brightness. The soul is in a manner all that is. The soul is the form of forms. Tranquility, sudden, vast, candescent, form of forms. Talbot repeated, Through the dear might of him that walked the waves, through the dear might. Turn over, Stephen said quietly. I don't see anything. What, sir? Talbot asked simply, bending forward. His hand turned the page over. He leaned back and went on again, having just remembered, of him that walked the waves. 
Here also over those craven hearts his shadow lies, and on the scoffer's heart and lips, and on mine. It lies upon their eager faces who offered him a coin of the tribute. To Caesar what is Caesar's, to God what is God's. A long look from dark eyes, a riddling sentence to be woven, and woven on the church's looms. Aye. Riddle me, riddle me, Randy Rowe. My father gave me seeds to sow. Talbot slid his closed book into his satchel. Have I heard all? Stephen asked. Yes, sir. Hockey at ten, sir. Half day, sir. Thursday? Who can answer a riddle? Stephen asked. They bundled their books away, pencils clacking, pages rustling. Crowding together, they strapped and buckled their satchels, all gabbling gaily. A riddle, sir? Ask me, sir. Oh, ask me, sir. A hard one, sir. This is the riddle, Stephen said. The cock crew. The sky was blue. The bells in heaven were striking eleven. Tis time for the poor soul to go to heaven. What is that? What, sir? Again, sir, we didn't hear. Their eyes grew bigger as the lines were repeated. After a silence, Cochrane said, What is it, sir? We give up. Stephen, his throat itching, answered, The fox bearing his grandmother under a holly bush. He stood up and gave a shout of nervous laughter, to which their cries echoed dismay. A stick struck the door, and a voice in the corridor called, Hockey! They broke asunder, sidling out of their benches, leaping them. Quickly they were gone, and from the lumber room came the rattle of sticks and clamor of their boots and tongues. Sergeant, who alone had lingered, came forward slowly, showing an open copy-book. His thick hair and scraggy neck gave witness of unreadiness, and through his misty glasses weak eyes looked up pleading. On his cheek, dull and bloodless, a soft stain of ink lay, date-shaped, recent and damp as a snail's bed. He held out his copy-book. The word sums was written on the headline. Beneath were sloping figures, at the foot a crooked signature with blind loops and a blot. Cyril Sargent, his name and seal. Mr. Deasy told me to write them out again, he said, and show them to you, sir. Stephen touched the edge of the book. Futility. Do you understand how to do them now, he asked. Numbers eleven to fifteen, Sergeant answered. Mr. Deasy said I was to copy them off the board, sir. Can you do them yourself? Stephen asked. No, sir. Ugly and futile. Lean neck and thick hair and a stain of ink, a snail's bed. Yet someone had loved him, borne him in her arms and in her heart. But for her the race of the world would have trampled him underfoot, a squashed boneless snail. She had loved his weak watery blood drained from her own. Was that then real? The only true thing in life? His mother's prostate body, the fiery Columbanus in holy zeal bestrode. She was no more. The trembling skeleton of a twig burnt in the fire, an odor of rosewood and wetted ashes. She had saved him from being trampled underfoot and had gone, scarcely having been. A poor soul gone to heaven, and on a heath beneath winking stars a fox, Red reek of rapin in his fur, with merciless bright eyes, scraped in the earth, listened, scraped up the earth, listened, scraped, and scraped. Sitting at his side, Stephen solved out the problem. He proves by algebra that Shakespeare's ghost is Hamlet's grandfather. The sergeant peered askance through his slanted glasses. Hockey sticks rattled in the lumber room. The hollow knock of a ball and calls from the field. Across the page the symbols moved in grave Morris in the mummery of their letters, wearing quaint caps of squares and cubes. Give hands, traverse, bow to partner, so. Imps of fancy of the Moors. Gone too from the world, Averroes and Moses Maimonides, dark men in mien and movement, flashing in their mocking mirrors an obscure soul of the world, a darkness shining in brightness which brightness could not comprehend. Do you understand now? Can you work the second one for yourself? Yes, sir. In long, shaky strokes, Sergeant copied the data. Waiting always for a word of help, his hand moved faithfully in unsteady symbols, a faint hue of shame flickering behind his dull skin. Amor mattress, subjective and objective genitive. With her weak blood and waysour milk, she had fed him and hid him from sight of others, his swaddling bands. Like him was I, these sloping shoulders, this gracelessness, my childhood bends beside me. Too far for me to lay a hand there once or lightly. Mine is far, and his, secret as our eyes. Secrets, 
silent, stony, sit in the dark palaces of both our hearts, secrets weary of their tyranny, tyrants willing to be dethroned. The sum was done. It is very simple, Stephen said as he stood up. Yes, sir. Thanks, Sergeant answered. He dried the page with a sheet of thin blotting paper and carried his copybook back to his bench. You had better get your stick and go out to the others, Stephen said as he followed towards the door of the boy's graceless form. Yes, sir. In the corridor his name was heard, called from the playfield. Sergeant! Run on, Stephen said. Mr. Deasy is calling you. He stood in the porch and watched the laggard hurry towards the scrappy field where sharp voices were in strife. They were sorted in teams, and Mr. Deasy came away, stepping over wisps of grass with gaitered feet. When he had reached the schoolhouse, voices again contending called to him. He turned his angry white moustache. "'What is it now?' he cried continually without listening. "'Cochrane and Halliday are on the same side, sir,' Stephen said. "'Will you wait in my study for a moment,' Mr. Deasy said, "'till I restore order here?' and as he stepped fussily back across the field his old man's voice cried sternly what is the matter what is it now their sharp voices cried about him on all sides their many forms closed round him the garish sunshine bleaching the honey of his ill-dyed head stale smoky air hung in the study with the smell of drab abraded leather of its chairs as on the first day he bargained with me here as it was in the beginning is now on the sideboard the tray of Stuart coins, base treasure of a bog, and ever shall be, and snug in their spoon-case of purple plush faded the twelve apostles having preached to all the Gentiles, world without end, a hasty step over the stone porch and in the corridor. Blowing out his rare moustache, Mr. Deasy halted at the table. First, our little financial settlement, he said. He brought out of his coat a pocket-book bound by a leathery thong. It slapped open, and he took from it two notes, one of joined halves, and laid them carefully on the table. Two, he said, strapping and stowing his pocketbook away. And now his strong room for the gold. Stephen's embarrassed hand moved over the shells heaped in the cold stone mortar, whelks and money cowries and leopard shells, and this, whorled as an emer's turban, and this, the scallop of St. James, an old pilgrim's hoard, dead treasure, hollow shells. A sovereign fell, bright and new, on the soft pile of the tablecloth. Three, Mr. Dreesy said, turning his little savings box about in his hand. These are handy things to have, see? This is for sovereigns, this is for shillings, sixpences and half-crowns. And here are crowns, see? He shot from it two crowns and two shillings. Three twelve, he said. I think you'll find that's right. Thank you, sir, Stephen said, gathering his money together with shy haste and putting it all in his pocket of his trousers. No thanks at all, Mr. Dreesy said. You have earned it. Stephen's hand, free again, went back to the hollow shells. Symbols, too, of beauty and of power. A lump in my pocket. Symbol soiled by greed and misery. Don't carry it like that, Mr. Dreesy said. You'll pull it out somewhere and lose it. You just buy one of these machines. You'll find them very handy. Answer something. Mine would be often empty, Stephen said. The same room, an hour, the same wisdom, and I the same. Three times now. Three nooses round me here. Well, I can break them in this instant if I will. Because you don't save, Mr. Deasy said, pointing his finger. You don't know yet what money is. Money is power. When you have lived as long as I have, I know, I know, if youth but knew. But what does Shakespeare say? Put but money in thy purse. Iago, Stephen murmured. He lifted his gaze from the idle shells to the old man's stare. He knew what money was, Mr. Deasy said. He made money. A poet, yes, but an Englishman, too. Do you know what is the pride of the English? Do you know what is the proudest word you will ever hear from an Englishman's mouth? The sea's ruler. His sea-cold eyes looked on the empty bay. It seems history is to blame. On me and on my words, unhating. That on his empire, Stephen said, the sun never sets. Bah, Mr. Deasy said, that's not English. A French Celt said that. He tapped his saving box against his thumbnail. I will tell you, he said solemnly, what is his proudest boast. I paid my way. Good man. Good man. I paid my way. I never borrowed a shilling in my life. Can you feel that? I owe nothing. Can you? 
Mulligan, nine pounds, three pairs of socks, one pair of brogues, ties. Curran, ten guineas. McCann, one guinea. Fred Ryan, two shillings. Temple, two lunches. Russell, one gilly. Cousins, ten shillings. Bob Reynolds, half a guinea. Kohler, three guineas. Miss McKernan, five weeks' board. The lump I have is useless. For the moment, no, Stephen answered. Mr. Deasy laughed with rich delight, putting back his saving box. I knew you couldn't, he said joyously, but one day you must feel it. We are a generous people, but we must also be just. I fear those big words, Stephen said, which make us so unhappy. Mr. Deasy stared sternly for some moments over the mantelpiece at the shapely bulk of a man in tartan fillybigs. Albert Edward, Prince of Wales. You think me an old fogey and an old Tory, his thoughtful voice said. I saw three generations since O'Connell's time. I remember the famine of forty-six. Do you know what the Orange Lodges agitated for repeal of the Union twenty years before O'Connell did, or before the prelates of your communion denounced him as a demagogue? You Fenians forget some things. Glorious, pious, and immortal memory, the Lodge of Diamond and Armagh, and the splendid be hung with corpses of papishes, horse massed and armed with planter's covenant, the black north and true blue Bible, croppies lie down. Stephen sketched a brief gesture. "'I have rebel blood in me, too,' Mr. Deasy said, "'on the spindle side, but I am descended from Sir John Blackwood, who voted for the Union. We are all Irish, all King's sons.' "'Alas,' Stephen said. "'Pervius rectus,' Mr. Deasy said firmly, was his motto. "'He voted for it, and put on his top-boots to ride to Dublin for Mards of Down to do so. "'La, la, 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 la the rocky road to Dublin.' A gruff squire on horseback with shiny top boots. Soft day, Sir John, soft day, Your Honor. Day, day. Two top boots jog dangling on to Dublin. Lol the ra de ra, lol the ra de ra de. That reminds me, Mr. Deasy said. You can do me a favor, Mr. Dedalus, with some of your literary friends. I have a letter here for the press. Sit down a moment. I have just to copy the end. He went to the desk near the window, pulled on his chair twice, and read off some words from the sheet in the drum of the typewriter. "'Sit down.' "'Excuse me,' he said over his shoulder. "'The dictates of common sense. Just a moment.' He appeared from under the shaggy brows at the manuscript by his elbow, and, muttering, began to prod the stiff buttons of the keyboard slowly, sometimes blowing as he screwed up the drum to erase an error. Stephen seated himself noiselessly before the princely presence. Framed around the walls, images of vanished horses stood in homage, their meek heads poised in air. Lord Hastings repulsed, the Duke of Westminster shot over, the Duke of Beaufort Ceylon, Prix de Paris, 1866, elfin riders sat them, watchful of a sign. He saw their speeds backing King's colors and shouted with the shouts of vanished crowds. Full stop, Mr. Deasy bade his keys, but prompt ventilation of this all-important question. Where Cranley led me to get rich quick, hunting his winners among the mud-splashed breaks, amid the balls of bookies, on their pitches and reek of the canteen, over the motley slush. Fair rebel! Fair rebel! Even money the favorite, ten to one the field. Dicers and thimble-riggers we hurried after the hoofs, the vine caps and jackets, and past the meat-faced women, a butcher's dame nuzzling thirstily her clove of orange. Shouts rang shill from the boy's playfield in a whirring whistle. Again, a goal. I am among them, among their battling bodies in a medley, the joust of life. You mean that knock-kneed mother's darling who seems to be slightly crossick? Jousts. Time shocked rebounds, shock by shock. Jousts, slush and uproar of battles, the frozen death spew of the slain, a shout of spear spikes baited with men's bloody guts. Now then, Mr. Deasy said, rising. He came to the table, pinning together his sheets. Stephen stood up. I have put the matter into a nutshell, Mr. Deasy said. It's about the foot and mouth disease. Just look through it. There can be no two opinions on this matter. May I trespass on your valuable space, that doctrine of laissez-faire which so often in our history, our cattle trade, the way of all our old industries, Liverpool ring with jockey the Galway harbour scheme, European conflagration, grain supplies through the narrow waters of the Channel, the pluter-perfect in perturbability of the Department of Agriculture, pardoned a classical illusion, Cassandra, by a woman who was no better than she should be, to come to the point at issue. 
"'I don't mince words, do I?' Mr. Deasy asked as Stephen read on. "'Foot and mouth disease. Known as Coke's preparation. Serum and virus. Percentage of salted horses. Rinderpest. Emperor's horses at Merzeg, Lower Austria. Veterinary surgeons. Mr. Henry Blackwood Price. Courteous offer a fair trial. Dictates of common sense. All important question. In every sense of the word, take the bull by the horns. Thanking you for the hospitality of your columns. I want that to be printed and read, Mr. Deasy said. You will see at the next outbreak that they will put an embargo on Irish cattle. And it can be cured. It is cured. My cousin Blackwood Price writes to me it is regularly treated and cured in Austria by cattle doctors there. They offer to come over here. I am trying to work up influence with the department. Now I am going to try publicity. I am surrounded by difficulties, by intrigues, by backstairs influence, by... He raised his forefinger and beat the air oddly before his voice spoke. Mark my words, Mr. Dedalus, he said. England is in the hands of the Jews. In all the highest places her finance her press, and they are the signs of a nation's decay. Wherever they gather, they eat up the nation's vital strength. I have seen it coming these years. I am sure, as we are standing here, the Jew merchants are already at their work of destruction. Old England is dying. He stepped swiftly off, and his eyes coming to blue life as they passed a broad sunbeam. He faced about and back again. Dying, he said, if not dead by now. The harlot's cry from street to street shall weave old England's winding sheet. His eyes opened wide, and vision stared sternly across the sunbeam in which he halted. A merchant, Stephen said, is one who buys cheap and sells dear. Jew or Gentile, is he not? They sinned against the light, Mr. Deasy said gravely, and you can see the darkness in their eyes. And that is why there are wanderers on the earth to this day. On the steps of the Paris Stock Exchange, the gold-skinned men, quoting prices on their gemmed fingers, gabble of geese, they swarmed loud, uncouth about the temple, their heads thick plodding under the maladroit silk hats. Not theirs, these clothes, this speech, these gestures. Their full, slow eyes belied the words, the gestures eager and unoffending, but knew the rancors massed about them, and knew their zeal was vain, vain patience to heap and hoard. Time surely would scatter all, a horde heap by the roadside, plundered and passing on. Their eyes knew their years of wandering, and patient knew the dishonors of their flesh. "'Who has not?' Stephen said. "'What do you mean?' Mr. Deasy asked. He came forward a pace and stood by the table. His underjaw fell sideways, open uncertainly. "'Is this old wisdom? He waits to hear from me.' History, Stephen said, is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. From the playfield the boys raised a shout, a whirring whistle, Goal! What if that nightmare gave you a back kick? The ways of the Creator are not our ways, Mr. Deasy said. All human history moves towards the one great goal, the manifestation of God. Stephen jerked his thumb towards the window, saying, That is God. Hooray! I Whee! What? Mr. Deasy asked. A shout in the street, Stephen answered, shrugging his shoulders. Mr. Deasy looked down and held for a while the wings of his nose tweaked between his fingers. Looking up again, he set them free. I am happier than you are, he said. We have committed many errors and many sins. A woman brought sin into the world. For a woman who was no better than she should be, Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus. Ten years the Greeks made war on Troy. A faithless wife first brought the strangers to our shore here. MacMorrow's wife and her leman, O'Rourke, Prince of Brefni. A woman, too, brought Parnell low. Many errors, many failures, but not the one sin. I am a struggler now at the end of my days, but I will fight for the right till the end. For Ulster will fight, and Ulster will be right. Stephen raised the sheets in his hand. Well, sir, he began. I foresee, Mr. Deasy said, that you will not remain here very long at this work. You are not born to be a teacher, I think. Perhaps I am wrong. A learner, rather, Stephen said. And here, what will you learn more? Mr. Deasy shook his head. Who knows, he said. To learn one must be humble, but life is the great teacher. Stephen rustled his sheets again. As regards these, he began. Yes, Mr. Deasy said, you have two copies there. If you can have them published at once. Telegraph, Irish Homestead. 
I will try, Stephen said, and let you know tomorrow. I know two editors slightly. That will do, Mr. Deasy said briskly. I wrote last night to Mr. Field, M.P. There is a meeting of the Cattle Traders Association today at the City Arms Hotel. I asked him to lay my letter before the meeting. You see if it can get you into your two papers. What are they? The evening telegraph? That will do, Mr. Deasy said. There is no time to lose. Now I have to answer that letter from my cousin. Good morning, sir, Stephen said, putting the sheets in his pocket. Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Deasy said, as he searched the papers on the desk. I like to break a lance with you, old as I am. Good morning, sir, Stephen said again, bowing to his bent back. He went out by the open porch and down the gravel path under the trees, hearing the cries of voices and cracks of sticks from the playfield. The lions couchant on their pillars as he passed through the gate. Toothless terrors. Still I will help him in his fight. Mulligan will dub me a new name, the Bullock Befriending Bard. Mr. Dedalus, running after me. No more letters, I hope. Just one moment. Yes, sir, Stephen said, turning back to the gate. Mr. Deasy halted, breathing hard and swallowing his breath. I just wanted to say, he said, Ireland, they say, has the honor of being the only country which never persecuted the Jews. Do you know that? No. And do you know why? He frowned sternly on the bright air. Why, sir, Stephen asked, beginning to smile. Because she's never let them in, Mr. Deasy said solemnly. A cough-ball of laughter leapt from his throat, dragging after it a rattling chain of phlegm. He turned back quickly, coughing, laughing, his lifted arms waving to the air. "'She never let them in!' he cried again through his laughter as he stamped on gaitered feet over the gravel of the path. "'That's why!' On his wise shoulders, through the checkerwork of leaves, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins. End of section 3《Section Four of Ulysses》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Part One The Telemachiad. Episode Three Proteus. Ineluctable modality of the visible. At least that, if no more, thought through my eyes. Signatures of all things I am here to read. Sea-spawn and sea-rack, the nearing tide, that rusty boot, snop-green, blue-silver, rust, coloured signs, limits of the diaphane, but he adds, in bodies. Then he was aware of them bodies before of them coloured. How? By knocking his sconce against them, sure. Go easy. Bold he was, and a millionaire, maestro di color che sanno, limit of the diaphane in, why in, diaphane, a diaphane. If you can put your five fingers through it, it is a gate, if not a door, shut your eyes and see. Stephen closed his eyes to hear his boots crush, crackling rack and shells. You are walking through it, howsomever. I am, astride at a time. A very short space of time, through very short times of space. Five, six, the nach einander. Exactly, and that is the ineluctable modality of the audible. Open your eyes. No, Jesus, if I fell over a cliff that beetles or his base, fell through the neighbour einander ineluctably. I am getting on nicely in the dark. My ash sword hangs at my side. Tap with it. They do. My two feet in his boots are at the ends of his legs. Neighbour einander. Sound solid, made by the mallet of Los Demiurgos. Am I walking into eternity along Sandy Mount Strand? Crush, crack, crick, crick. Wild sea money. Domini Deasy kens them all. Won't you come to Sandy Mount, Madeleine the mare? Rhythm begins, you see. I hear. A cataleptic tetrameter of iams marching. No, a gallop. Deline the mare. Open your eyes now. I will. One moment. Has all vanished since? If I open, and am for ever in the black a diaphane, Buster, I will see if I can see. See now. 
there all the time without you, and ever shall be, world without end. They came down the steps from Lee's terrace prudently, Frauenzimmer, and down the shelving shore flabbily, their splayed feet sinking in the silted sand, like me, like algae, coming down to our mighty mother. Number one swung lordily her midwife's bag, the other's gamp poked in the beach. From the liberties, out for the day, Mrs. Florence McCabe, relict of the late Patrick McCabe, deeply lamented of Bride Street. One of her sisterhood lugged me squealing into life, creation from nothing. What has she in the bag? A misbirth with a trailing navel cord, hushed in ruddy wool. The cords of all link back, strand and twining cable of all flesh. That is why mystic monks. Will you be as gods? Gaze in your omphalos. Hello, Kinch here. Put me on to Edenville. Aleph Alpha, naught naught one. Spouse and helpmate of Adam Cadmon. Hever, naked Eve. She had no navel. Gaze. Belly without blemish, bulging big, a buckler of taut vellum. No, white-heaped corn, orient and immortal, standing from everlasting to everlasting, womb of sin. Wombed in sin darkness I was too, made, not begotten. By them the man with my voice and my eyes, and a ghost woman with ashes on her breath. They clasped and sundered, did the coupler's will. From before the ages he willed me, and now may not will me away, or ever. A Lex Eterna stays about him. Is that then the divine substance wherein father and son are consubstantial? Where is poor dear Arius to try conclusions, warring his life long upon the contrans magnificant du bang tantiality, ill-starred heresiarch? In a Greek water-closet he breathed his last, euthanasia with a beaded mitre, and with crozier, stalled upon his throne, widower of a widowed sea, with up-stiffed omophorion, with clotted hinder parts. Airs romped round him, nipping and eager airs. They are coming, waves. The white-maned sea-horses, champing, bright wind-bridled, the steeds of Mananan. I mustn't forget his letter for the press. And after? The ship, half-twelve. By the way, go easy with that money, like a good young imbecile. Yes, I must. His pace slackened. Here, am I going to Aunt Sarah's or not? My consubstantial father's voice. Did you see anything of your artist brother Stephen lately? No. Sure he's not down in Strasbourg Terrace with his Aunt Sally? Couldn't he fly a bit higher than that, eh? And, 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 and tell us, Stephen, how is Uncle Si? Oh, weeping God, the things I married into. The boys up in the hayloft, the drunken little cost drawer, and his brother, the cornet player, highly respectable gondoliers, and skew eyed Walter, sirring his father no less. Sir, yes, sir, no, sir, Jesus wept, and no wonder by Christ. I pull the wheezy bell of their shuttered cottage and wait. They take me for a dun, peer out from a coin of vantage. It's Stephen, sir. Let him in, let Stephen in. A bolt drawn back, and Walter welcomes me. We thought you were someone else. In his broad bed, Uncle Ritchie, pillowed and blanketed, extends over the hillock of his knees a sturdy forearm. Clean-chested, he has washed the upper moiety. Morrow, nephew! He lays aside the lapboard, whereon he drafts his bills of costs for the eyes of Master Goff and Master Shapland Tandy, Filing consents and common searches, and a writ of duques tecum, a bog oak frame over his bald head, Wilde's requiescat, the drone of his misleading whistle brings Walter back. Yes, sir. Malt for Ritchie and Stephen. Tell mother, where is she? Bathing Chrissy, sir. Papa's little bed pal, lump of love. No, Uncle Ritchie. Call me Ritchie. Damn your lithia water. It lowers. Wooski. Uncle Ritchie, really, sit down, or by the law, Harry, I'll knock you down. Walter squints vainly for a chair. He has nothing to sit down on, sir. He has nowhere to put it, you mug. Bring in our Chippendale chair. Would you like a bite of something? None of your damned lordy door airs here. The rich of a rasher fried with a herring. Sure? So much the better. 
We have nothing in the house but backache pills. Alerta! He drones bars of Ferrando's Aria di Sortita, the grandest number, Stephen, in the whole opera. Listen! His tuneful whistle sounds again, finely shaded with rushes of the air, his fists big drumming on his padded knees. The wind is sweeter. Houses of decay, mine, his, and all. You told the Clongau's gentry you had an uncle a judge, and an uncle a general in the army. Come out of them, Stephen. Beauty is not there, nor in the stagnant bay of Marsh's library, where you read the fading prophecies of Joachim Abbas. For whom? The hundred-headed rabble of the cathedral close. A hater of his kind ran from them to the wood of madness, his mane foaming in the moon, his eyeballs stars. Who in him? Horse nostrilled. The oval equine faces. Temple, Buck Mulligan, Foxy Campbell, Lantern Jaws. Abbas, father, furious dean. What offence laid fire to their brains? Paff! Descende calve, utne amplius de calveris. A garland of grey hair on his comminated head. See him, me, clambering down to the footpace. Descende, clutching a monstrance. Basilisk guide. Get down, bald pole. A choir gives back menace and echo, assisting about the altar's horns, the snorted Latin of jack priests, moving burly in their albs tonsured and oiled and gelded, fat with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And at the same instant, perhaps, a priest round the corner is elevating it. Dring, dring! And two streets off another locking it into a pix. Dring, a dring! And in a lady chapel another taking housel all to his own cheek. Dring, dring! Down, up, forward, back. Dan Ockham thought of that invincible doctor, a misty English morning, the imp hypostasis tickled his brain. Bringing his host down and kneeling, he heard twine with his second bell, the first bell in the transept. He is lifting his, and rising heard, now I am lifting, there are two bells. He is kneeling, twang in diphthong. Cousin Stephen, you will never be a saint, Isle of Saints. You were awfully holy, weren't you? You prayed to the Blessed Virgin that you might not have a red nose. You prayed to the devil in Serpentine Avenue that the fubsy widow in front might lift her clothes still more from the wet street. Oh, si, certo. Sell your soul for that, do. Dyed rags pinned round a squaw. More tell me, more still. Top of the house tram alone, crying to the rain. Naked women, naked women. What about that, eh? What about what? What else were they invented for? Reading two pages apiece of seven books every night, eh? I was young. You bowed to yourself in the mirror, stepping forward to applause earnestly, striking face. Hooray for the goddamned idiot! Hooray! No one saw. Tell no one. Books you were going to write with letters for titles. Have you read his F? Oh, yes, but I prefer Q. Yes, but W is wonderful. Oh, yes, W. Remember your epiphanies written on green oval leaves, deeply deep, copies to be sent if you died to all the great libraries of the world, including Alexandria. Someone was to read them there after a few thousand years, a Mahaman Vantara, Pico della Mirandola like, ay, very like a whale. When one reads these strange pages of one long gone, one feels that one is at one with one who once... The grainy sand had gone from under his feet. His boots trod again a damp, crackling mast, razor shells, squeaking pebbles, that on the unnumbered pebbles beats, wood sieved by the shipworm, lost armada. Unwholesome sand flats waited to suck his treading soles, breathing upward sewage breath, a pocket of seaweed smouldered in sea fire under a midden of man's ashes. He coasted them walking wearily. A porter bottle stood up, stog to its waist in the cakey sand dough, a sentinel, isle of dreadful thirst. Broken hoops on the shore, at the land a maze of dark, cunning nets, farther away chalk scrawled back doors, and on the higher beach a drying line with two crucified shirts, rings end, wigwams of brown steersmen and master mariners. 
human shells. He halted. I have passed the way to Aunt Sarah's. Am I not going there? Seems not. No one about. He turned northeast and crossed the firmer sand towards the pigeon house. Qui vous a mis dans cette fichue position? C'est le pigeon, Joseph. Patrice, home on furlough, lapped warm milk with me in the bar McMahon. Son of the wild goose, Kevin Egan of Paris. My father's a bird, he lapped me the sweet lechot with pink young tongue, plump bunny's face. Lap, lapin. He hopes to win in the gros lot. About the nature of women, he read in Michelet. But he must send me la vie de Jésus by Monsieur Léo Taxil. Lent it to his friend. C'est tordant, vous savez. Moi, je suis socialiste. Je ne crois pas en l'existence de Dieu. Faut pas le dire à mon père. Il croit. Mon père, oui. Schluss. He laps. My Latin quarter hat. God, we simply must dress the character. I want puce gloves. You were a student, weren't you? Of what in the other devil's name? Pesayen. P.C.N., you know. Physique, chimique et naturel. Aha, eating your groats worth of mouen civet, flesh pots of Egypt, elbowed by belching cabmen. Just say in the most natural tone, when I was in Paris, boulmiche, I used to, yes, used to catch punch tickets to prove an alibi if they arrested you for murder somewhere. Justice. On the night of the 17th of February, 1904, the prisoner was seen by two witnesses. Other fellow did it, other me. Hat, tie, overcoat, nose. Louis, c'est moi. You seem to have enjoyed yourself. Proudly walking. Whom are you trying to walk like? Forget, a dispossessed. With mother's money order, eight shillings, the banging door of the post office slammed in your face by the usher. Hunger, toothache. Encore deux minutes. Look, clock, must get. Fermé, hired dog. Shoot him to bloody bits with a bang shotgun. Bits, man, spattered walls, all brass buttons. Bits all clack in place, clack back. Not hurt? Oh, that's all right. Shake hands. See what I meant, see? Oh, that's all right. Shake a shake. Oh, that's all, only all right. You were going to do wonders, what? Missionary to Europe after fiery Columbanus, Fiat and Scotus on their creepy stools in heaven, spilt from their pint pots, loud Latin laughing, Elge, Elge, pretending to speak broken English as you dragged your valise, porter threepence across the slimy pier at Newhaven. Comment? Rich booty you brought back, le tutu, five tattered numbers of pantalon blanc et culotte rouge, a blue French telegram, curiosity to show. Mother dying. Come home, father. The aunt thinks you killed your mother. That's why she won't. Then here's a health to Mulligan's aunt, and I'll tell you the reason why, for she always kept things decent in, the Hannigan family. His feet marched in sudden proud rhythm over the sand furrows, along by the boulders of the south wall. He stared at them proudly, piled stone mammoth skulls, gold light on sea, on sand, on boulders. The sun is there, the slender trees, the lemon houses. Paris rawly waking, crude sunlight on her lemon streets, moist pith of fowls of bread, the frog-green wormwood, her matin incense, caught the air. Belluomo rises from the bed of his wife's lover's wife. The kerchiefed housewife is astir, a saucer of ascetic acid in her hand. In Rodos, Yvonne and Madeleine new make their tumbled beauties, Shattering with gold teeth, chausson of pastry, their mouths yellowed with the pus of flan breton. Faces of Paris men go by, their well pleased pleasers, curled conquistadores. Noon slumbers. Kevin Egan rolls gunpowder cigarettes through fingers smeared with printer's ink, sipping his green fairy as Patrice his white. About us, gobblers fork spiced beans down their gullets. Un demi citier, a jet of coffee, steam from the burnished cauldron. She serves me at his beck. Il est Irlandais. Hollandais? Non, fromage. De Irlandais. Nous, Irlande. Vous savez. Ah, oui. She thought you wanted a cheese, Hollandais. 
your postprandial. Do you know that word, postprandial? There was a fellow I knew once in Barcelona, queer fellow, used to call it his postprandial. Well, schlanter. Around the slabbed tables, the tangle of wind breaths and grumbling gorges. His breath hangs over our sauce-stained plates, the green fairy's fang thrusting between his lips. Of Ireland, the Dalcassians, of hopes, conspiracies, of Arthur Griffith now, A.E., Pimander, good shepherd of men, to yoke me as his yoke fellow, our crimes our common cause, you're your father's son, I know the voice, his fustian shirt, sanguine flowered, trembles its Spanish tassels at his secrets, Monsieur Drummond, famous journalist, Drummond, known what he called Queen Victoria, old hag with the yellow teeth, vieille ogresse with the don jaune, Maud Gaunt, beautiful woman, la patrie, Monsieur Millevoix, Felix Fauré, know how he died? Licentious men, the Frurken, bon à tout faire, who rubs male nakedness in the bath at Uppsala. Moi faire, she said, tous les messieurs. Not this monsieur, I said, most licentious custom. Bath a most private thing. I wouldn't let my brother, not even my own brother, most lascivious thing. Green eyes, I see you, fang, I feel, lascivious people. The blue fuse burns deadly between hands and burns clear. Loose tobacco shreds catch fire. A flame and acrid smoke light our corner. Raw face bones under his peep of day boy's hat. How the head centre got away. Authentic version. Got up as a young bride. Man, veil, orange blossoms. Drove out the road to Malahide. Did faith. Of lost leaders, the betrayed, wild escapes. Disguises clutched at, gone, not here. Spurned lover. I was a strapping young gossoon at that time, I tell you. I'll show you my likeness one day. I was, faith. Lover, for her love he prowled with Colonel Richard Burke, a tannist of his sept, under the walls of Clerkenwell, and crouching, saw a flame of vengeance hurl them upward in the fog. Shattered glass and toppling masonry, Gay Paris he hides, Egan of Paris, unsought by any save by me, making his day's stations, the dingy printing case, his three taverns, the Montmartre lair he sleeps short night in, Rue de la Goutte d'Or, damascened with fly-bone faces of the gone, loveless, landless, wifeless. She is quite nicely comfy without her outcast man, Madame in Rouge y le Coeur, Canary and two buck lodgers, peachy cheeks, a zebra skirt, frisky as a young thing's. Spurned and undespairing. Tell Pat you saw me, won't you? I wanted to get poor Pat a job one time. Mon fils, soldier of France. I taught him to sing, The boys of Kilkenny are stout roaring blades. Know that old lay? I taught Patrice that, old Kilkenny. St. Canis, Strombo's castle on the Nor. Goes like this. Oh, oh, he takes me napper tandy by the hand. Oh, oh, the boys of Kilkenny. Weak, wasting hand on mine. They have forgotten Kevin Egan, not he them. Remembering thee, O oh Sion. He had come nearer the edge of the sea, and wet sand slapped his boots. The new air greeted him, harping in wild nerves, wind of wild air of seeds of brightness. Here I am not walking out to the Kish lightship, am I? He stood suddenly, his feet beginning to sink slowly in the quaking soil. Turn back. Turning, he scanned the shore south, his feet sinking again slowly in new sockets. The cold domed room of the tower waits. Through the barbicans the shafts of light are moving ever, slowly ever as my feet are sinking, creeping duskward over the dial floor. Blue dusk, nightfall, deep blue night. In the darkness of the dome they wait, their pushed-back chairs, my obelisk valise, around a board of abandoned platters. Who to clear it? He has the key. I will not sleep there when this night comes. A shut door of a silent tower, entombing there, blind bodies, the panther sarb and his pointer. Call, no answer. He lifted his feet up from the suck and turned back by the mole of boulders. Take all, keep all. 
my soul walks with me form of forms so in the moon's mid watches i pace the path above the rocks in sable silvered hearing elsinore's tempting flood the flood is following me i can watch it flow past from here get back then by the pool beg road to the strand there he climbed over the sedge and ely oar weeds and sat on a stool of rock resting his ash plant in a grike a bloated carcass of a dog lay lolled on bladder rack before him the gunwale of a boat sunk in sand un coche en sable louis veuillot called gautier's prose these heavy sands a language tide and wind have silted here and these the stone heaps of dead builders a warren of weasel rats hide gold there try it you have some sands and stones heavy of the past sir lout's toys mind you don't get one bang on the ear i'm the bloody well gigant rolls all them bloody well boulders bones for my stepping stones fee for fum i smells the bloods odds an iridsman a point live dog grew into sight running across the sweep of sand lord is he going to attack me respect his liberty you will not be master of others or their slave i have my stick sit tight from farther away walking shoreward across the crested tide figures two the two maries they have tucked it safe among the bulrushes peekaboo i see you no the dog he is running back to them who galleys of the lochlands ran here to beach in quest of prey their blood-beaked prows riding low on a molten pewter surf dane vikings talks of tomahawks of glitter on their breasts when malachi wore the collar of gold a school of turlhide whales stranded in hot noon spouting hobbling in the shallows then from the starving cagework city a horde of jerkin dwarfs my people with flayers knives running scaling hacking in green blubbery whale meat famine plague and slaughters their blood is in me their lusts my waves i moved among them on the frozen liffy that i a changeling among the spluttering resin fires i spoke to no one none to me the dog's bark ran towards him stopped ran back dog of my enemy i just simply stood pale silent bade about terribilia meditans a primrose doublet fortune's knave smiled on my fear for that are you pining the bark of their applause pretenders live their lives the bruce's brother thomas fitzgerald silken knight perkin warbeck york's false scion in breeches of silk of white rose ivory wonder of a day and lambert simnel with a tail of nans and sutlers a scullion crowned all king's sons paradise of pretenders then and now he saved men from drowning and you shake at a cur's yelping but the courtiers who mocked guido in or san michele were in their own house house of we don't want any of your mediaeval abstrusiosities would you do what he did boat would be near a life boy natürlich put there for you would you or would you not the man that was drowned nine days ago off maiden's rock they are waiting for him now for the truth spit it out i would want to i would try i am not a strong swimmer water cold soft when i put my face into it in the basin at clongowes can't see who's behind me out quickly quickly you see the tide flowing quickly in on all sides sheeting the lows of sand quickly shell cocoa coloured if i had land under my feet i wanted his life still to be his mine to be mine a drowning man his eyes screamed to me out of horror of his death i with him together down i could not save her waters bitter death lost a man and a woman i see her skirties pinned up i bet their dog ambled about a bank of dwindling sand trotting sniffing on all sides looking for something lost in a past life suddenly he made off like a bounding hare ears flung back chasing the shadow of a low skimming gull the man's shrieked whistle struck his limp ears he turned bounded back came nearer trotted on twinkling shanks on a field tenny a buck trippant proper unattired 
At the lace fringe of the tide he halted with stiff forehoofs, seaward pointed ears, his snout lifted, barked at the wave noise, herds of sea moors. They serpented towards his feet, curling, unfurling many crests, every ninth, breaking, plashing from far, from farther out, waves and waves. Cocklepickers. They waded a little way in the water, and stooping, soused their bags, and lifting them again, waded out. The dog yelped, running to them, reared up and pawed them, dropping on all fours, again reared up at them with mute, bearish fawning. Unheeded, he kept by them as they came towards the drier sand, a rag of wolf's tongue, red panting from his jaws. His speckled body ambled ahead of them, and then loped off at a calf's gallop. The carcass lay on his path. He stopped, sniffed, stalked round it, brother, nosing closer, went round it, sniffing rapidly like a dog all over the dead dog's bedraggled fell. Dog skull, dog sniff, eyes on the ground, moves to one great goal. Ah, poor dog's body, here lies poor dog's body's body. Tatters, out of that, you mongrel cry brought him skulking back to his master, and a blunt, bootless kick sent him unscathed across a spit of sand, crouched in flight. He slunk back in a curve. Doesn't see me. Along by the edge of the mole he lolloped, dawdled, smelt a rock, and from under a cocked hind leg pissed against it. He trotted forward, and lifting again his hind leg, pissed quick short at an unsmelt rock. The simple pleasures of the poor. His hind paws then scattered the sand, then his forepaws dabbled and delved. Something he buried there, his grandmother. He rooted in the sand, dabbling, delving, and stopped to listen to the air, scraped up the sand again with a fury of his claws, soon ceasing, a pard, a panther, got in spouse breach, vulturing the dead. After he woke me last night, same dream or was it? Open hallway, street of harlocks, Remember, Harun al-Rashid, I am almosting it. That man led me, spoke, I was not afraid. The melon he had held against my face, smiled, cream fruit smell. That was the rule said, in, come, red carpet spread, you will see who. Shouldering their bags, they trudged, the red Egyptians. His blued feet out of the turned-up trousers slapped the clammy sand a dull brick muffler strangling his unshaven neck. With woman's steps she followed, the ruffian and his strolling mort. Spoils slung at her back, loose sand and shell-grit crusted her bare feet. About her wind face hair trailed, behind her lord, his helpmate, being a wasp to Romeville. When night hides her body's flaws, calling under her brown shawl from an archway where dogs have mired, her fancy man is treating two royal Dublins in O'Lochlins of black pits. Buss her, whop in rogue's rumbling go, for, oh my dimber whopping dell, a she-fiend's whiteness under her rancid rags. Fum Bally's lane that night, the tanyard smells. White thy fambles, red thy gan, and thy quarrens dainty is. Couch a hogshead with me then, in the dark man's clip and kiss. Morose delectation, Aquinas Tunbelly calls this, Frate Porco Spino, unfallen Adam rode and not rutted. Call away, let him, thy quarren's dainty is, language no whit worse than his. Monk words, merry beads, jabber on their girdles, rogue words, tough nuggets, patter in their pockets. Passing now, a side eye at my hamlet hat. If I were suddenly naked here as I sit, I am not. Across the sands of all the world, followed by the sun's flaming sword, to the west, trekking to evening lands, she trudges, schleps, trains, drags, trascines her load, a tide westering, moon-drawn in her wake, tides myriad-islanded, within her, blood not mine, oinopoponton, a wine-dark sea, behold the handmaid of the moon, in sleep the wet sign calls her hour, bids her rise. Bride-bed, child-bed, bed of death, ghost-candled. Omnis caro ad te veniet. He comes, pale vampire, through storm his eyes, his bat-sails bloodying the sea, 
mouth to her mouth's kiss. Here, put a pin in that chat, will you? My tablets, mouth to her kiss. No, must be two of them. Glue em well, mouth to her mouth's kiss. His lips, lipped and mouthed, fleshless lips of air, mouth to her moomb, oomb, all wooming tomb. His mouth moulded, issuing breath, unspeeched, ooey ah, roar of cataractic planets, globed, blazing, roaring, way, away, away, away. Paper, the banknotes blast them, old Deasy's letter, here, thanking you for the hospitality, tear the blank end off. Turning his back to the sun, he bent over far to a table of rock and scribbled words. That's twice I forgot to take slips from the library counter. His shadow lay over the rocks as he bent, ending. Why not endless till the farthest star? Darkly they are there behind this light, darkness shining in the brightness, delta of Cassiopeia worlds. Me sits there with his auger's rod of ash, and borrowed sandals, by day beside a livid sea, unbeheld in violet night, walking beneath a rain of uncouth stars. I throw this ended shadow from me, man-shape ineluctable, call it back, endless, would it be mine, form of my form? Who watches me here? Whoever anywhere will read these written words? Signs on a white field, somewhere to someone in your flutiest voice. The good Bishop of Cloyne took the veil of the temple out of his shovel hat. Veil of space with coloured emblems hatched on its field. Hold hard, coloured on a flat. Yes, that's right, flat I see. Then think distance, near, far, flat I see, east, back. Ah, see now, falls back suddenly, frozen in stereoscope. Click does the trick. You'll find my words dark. Darkness is in our souls, do you not think? Flutier. Our souls, shame-wounded by our sins, cling to us yet more, a woman to her lover clinging, the more, the more. She trusts me, her hand gentle, the long-lashed eyes. Now where the blue hell am I bringing her beyond the veil? into the ineluctable modality of the ineluctable visuality. She, she, she. What she? The virgin at Hodges Figgis' window on Monday, looking in for one of the alphabet books you were going to write. Keen glance you gave her, wrist through the braided jess of her sunshade. She lives in Leeson Park with a grief and kickshaws, a lady of letters. Talk that to someone else, Stevie. A pick-me-up. Bet she wears those curse of God stays, suspenders and yellow stockings, darned with lumpy wool. Talk about apple dumplings. Piu tosto. Where are your wits? Touch me, soft eyes. Soft, soft, soft hand. I am lonely here. Oh, touch me soon, now. What is that word known to all men? I am quiet here alone. Sad, too. Touch, touch me. He lay back at full stretch over the sharp rocks, cramming the scribbled note and pencil into a pocket, his hat down on his eyes. That is Kevin Egan's movement I made, nodding for his nap, Sabbath sleep, et vidit Deus, et errant valde bona. Allo, bonjour, welcome as the flowers in May. Under its leaf he watched through peacock twittering lashes the southing sun. I am caught in this burning scene, Pan's hour, the faunal noon, Among gum-heavy serpent plants, Milk-oozing fruits, Where on the tawny waters Leaves lie wide, Pain is far, And no more turn aside and brood. His gaze brooded on his broad-toed boots, A buck's cast-offs, Nabonine under. He counted the creases of rucked leather, Wherein another's foot had nested warm, the foot that beat the ground in tripudium, foot I dislove. But you were delighted when Esther Oswald's shoe went on you, girl on you in Paris. Tiens, quel petit pied, staunch friend, a brother soul, Wilde's love that dare not speak its name. His arm, Cranley's arm, he now will leave me. And the blame? As I am, as I am, all or not at all. In long lassoes from the cock lake the water flowed full, covering green goldenly lagoons of sand, rising, flowing, 
my ash plant will float away i shall wait no they will pass on passing chafing against the low rocks swirling passing better get this job over quick listen a four-worded wave speech see su hrsh rsh oosh vehement breath of waters amid sea snakes rearing horses rocks in cups of rocks it slops flop slop slap bounded in barrels and spent its speech ceases it flows purling widely flowing floating foam pool flower unfurling under the upswelling tide he saw the writhing weeds lift languidly and sway reluctant arms icing up their petticoats in whispering water swaying and upturning coy silver fronds day by day night by night lifted flooded and let fall lord they are weary and whispered to they sigh st ambrose heard it sigh of leaves and waves awaiting awaiting the fullness of their times debus ac noctibus in urias patiens ingemiscit to no end gathered vainly then released forth flowing wending back loom of the moon weary too in sight of lovers lascivious men a naked woman shining in her courts she draws a toil of waters five fathoms out there full fathom five thy father lies at one he said found drowned high water at dublin bar driving before it a loose drift of rubble fan shells of fishes silly shells a corpse rising salt white from the undertow bobbing apace apace a porpoise landward there he is hook it quick pull sunk though he be beneath the watery floor we have him easy now bag of corpse gas sopping in foul brine a quiver of minnows fat of a spongy titbit flash through the slits of his button trouser fly god becomes man becomes fish becomes barnacle goose becomes featherbed mountain dead breaths i living breathe tread dead dust devour a uranus offal from all dead hauled stark over the gunwale he breathes upwards the stench of his green grave his leprous nose-hole snoring to the sun a sea change this brown eyes salt blue sea death mildest of all deaths known to man old father ocean prix de paris beware of imitations just you give it a fair trial we enjoyed ourselves immensely come i thirst clouding over no black clouds anywhere are there thunderstorm all brighty falls proud lightning of the intellect lucifer dico qui nescit ocatum no my cockle hat and staff and his my sandal shoon where to evening lands evening will find itself he took the hilt of his ash plant lunging with it softly dallying still yes evening will find itself in me without me all days make their end by the way next when is it tuesday will be the longest day of all the glad new year mother the rum tum tiddly tum lawn tennyson gentleman poet ja for the old hag with the yellow teeth and monsieur drumont gentleman journalist ja my teeth are very bad why i wonder feel that one is going too shells ought i go to a dentist i wonder with that money that one this toothless kinch the superman why is that i wonder or does it mean something perhaps my handkerchief he threw it i remember did i not take it up his hand groped vainly in his pockets no i didn't better buy one he laid the dry snot picked from his nostril on a ledge of rock carefully for the rest let look who will behind perhaps there is someone he turned his face over a shoulder there regardons moving through the air high spars of a three-master her sails braided up on the cross-trees homing upstream silently moving a silent ship end of section four Section 5 of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, Part 2, The Odyssey, Episode 4, Calypso. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried hencods rows. Most of all he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Jellied light and air were in the kitchen, but out of doors gentle summer morning everywhere made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four. Right. She didn't like her plate full. Right. He turned from the tray, lifted the kettle off the hob, and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there, dull and squat. Its spout stuck out. Cup of tea soon. Good. Mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly round a leg of the table, with tail on high. Meow. Oh, there you are, Mr. Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed in answer, and stalked again stiffly round a leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table. Prrr. Scratch my head. Prrr. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the lithe black form. Clean to see, the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussons, he said. Meow, the cat cried. They call them stupid. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive too. Wonder what I look like to her. Height of a tower? No, she can jump me. Afraid of the chickens she is, he said mockingly. Afraid of the chook chooks. I never saw such a stupid pussons as the pussons. Cruel, her nature. Curious mice never squeal. Seem to like it. Meow, the cat said loudly. She blinked up out of her avid, shame-closing eyes, mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk-white teeth. He watched the dark eye slits narrowing with greed till her eyes were green stones. Then he went to the dresser, took the jug Hanlon's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm bubbled milk on a saucer, and set it slowly on the floor. Rrrr, she cried, running to lap. He watched the bristles shining wirily in the weak light as she tipped three times and licked lightly. Wonder is it true if you clip them they can't mouse after? Why? They shine in the dark, perhaps, the tips, or kind of feelers in the dark, perhaps. He listened to her licking lap. Ham and eggs? No. No good eggs with this drought. Want pure, fresh water. Thursday? Not a good day, either, for a mutton kidney at Buckley's. Fried with butter, a shake of pepper. Better a pork kidney at Lugatchi's. While the kettle is boiling. She lapped slower, then licking the saucer clean. Why are their tongues so rough? To lap better, all porous holes. Nothing she can eat? He glanced round him. No. On quietly creaky boots, he went up the staircase to the hall, paused by the bedroom door. She might like something tasty. Thin bread and butter she likes in the morning. Still, perhaps, once in a way. He said softly in the bare hall, I'm going round the corner. Be back in a minute. And when he had heard his voice say it, he added, You don't want anything for breakfast? A sleepy, soft grunt answered, Mmm. No, she did not want anything. He heard then a warm, heavy sigh, softer, as she turned over and the loose brass quoits of the bedstead jingled. Must get those settled, really. Pity. All the way from Gibraltar. Forgotten any little Spanish she knew. Wonder what her father gave for it. Old style. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Bought it at the governor's auction. Got a short knock. Hard as nails at a bargain, old Tweedy. Yes, sir. At Plevna, that was. 
I rose from the ranks, sir, and I'm proud of it. Still, he had brains enough to make that corner in stamps. Now that was far-seeing. His hand took his hat from the peg over his initialed heavy overcoat, and his lost property office second-hand waterproof. Stamps, sticky-back pictures. Dare say lots of officers are in the swim, too. Of course they do. The sweated legend in the crown of his hat told him mutely, Plasto's high-grade hat. He peeped quickly inside the leather headband. White slip of paper. Quite safe. On the doorstep he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key. Not there. In the trousers I left off. Must get it. Potato I have. Creaky wardrobe. No use disturbing her. She turned over sleepily that time. He pulled the hall door to after him very quietly, more till the foot leaf dropped gently over the threshold, a limp lid. Looked shut. All right till I come back, anyhow. He crossed to the bright side, avoiding the loose cellar flap of number 75. The sun was nearing the steeple of George's church. Be a warm day, I fancy. Especially in these black clothes, feel it more. Black conducts, reflects, refracts, is it? The heat. But I couldn't go in that light suit. Make a picnic of it. His eyelids sank quietly often as he walked in happy warmth. Boland's bread van delivering with trays, our daily. But she prefers yesterday's loaves, turnovers, crisp crowns hot. Makes you feel young. Somewhere in the east, early morning. Set off at dawn, travel round in front of the sun, steal a day's march on him. Keep it up for ever, never grow a day older, technically. Walk along a strand, strange land, come to a city gate, sentry there, old rancor too, old Tweedy's big moustaches, leaning on a long kind of a spear, wander through awned streets, turbaned faces going by, dark caves of carpet shops, big man, Turco the Terrible, seated cross-legged, smoking a coiled pipe, cries of sellers in the streets, drink water scented with fennel, sherbet, wander along all day, might meet a robber or two, well, meet him, getting on to sundown, the shadows of the mosques along the pillars, priest with a scroll rolled up, a shiver of the trees, signal, the evening wind, I pass on, fading gold sky, a mother watches from her doorway, she calls her children home in their dark language. High wall, beyond, strings twanged. Night sky moon, violet, colour of Molly's new garters. Strings, listen. A girl playing one of these instruments. What do you call them? Dulcimers. I pass. Probably not a bit like it, really. Kind of stuff you read. In the track of the sun. Sunburst on the title page. He smiled, pleasing himself. What Arthur Griffith said about the headpiece over the Freeman leader. A home rule sun rising up in the northwest from the laneway behind the Bank of Ireland. He prolonged his pleased smile. Ikey touch that. Home rule sun rising up in the northwest. He approached Larry O'Rourke's. From the cellar grating floated up the flabby gush of porter. Through the open doorway the bar squirted out whiffs of ginger tea dust, biscuit mush. Good house, however, just the end of the city traffic. For instance, Macaulay's down there, NG as position. Of course, if they ran a tram line along the north circular from the cattle market to the quays, value would go up like a shot. Bald head over the blind. Cute old codger. No use canvassing him an ad. Still, he knows his own business best. There he is, sure enough, my bold Larry, leaning against the sugar bin in his shirt sleeves, watching the aproned curate swab up with mop and bucket. Simon Dedalus takes him off to a tea with his eyes screwed up. Do you know what I'm going to tell you? What's that, Mr O'Rourke? Do you know what? The Russians, they'd be only an eight o'clock breakfast for the Japanese. Stop and say a word. About the funeral, perhaps. Sad thing about poor Dignam, Mr O'Rourke. Turning into Dorset Street, he said, freshly in greeting, through the doorway, Good day, Mr O'Rourke. Good day to you. Lovely weather, sir. Tis all that. Where do they get the money? Coming up red-headed curates from the county Leitrim, 
rinsing empties and old man in the cellar. Then, lo and behold, they blossom out as Adam Findlaters or Dan Talons. Then think of the competition, general thirst. Good puzzle would be cross Dublin without passing a pub. Save it they can't. Off the drunks, perhaps. Put down three and carry five. What is that? A bob here and there, dribs and drabs. On the wholesale orders, perhaps. Doing a double shuffle with the town travellers. Square it with the boss, and we'll split the job, see? How much would that top to off the porter in the month? Say ten barrels of stuff. Say he got ten per cent. Oh, more. Ten, fifteen. He passed St. Joseph's, National School, Bratz, Clamour. Windows open. Fresh air helps memory. Or a lilt. R, B, C, D, F, G, Kellermen, W, Q, Rust, U, V, W. Boys, are they? Yes, Inish Turk, Inish Shark, Inish Boffin, at their jogger fry. Mine, Sleeve Bloom. He halted before Dlugach's window, staring at the hanks of sausages, polonies, black and white. Fifty multiplied by... The figures whitened in his mind, unsolved. Displeased, he let them fade. The shiny links, packed with forcemeat, fed his gaze, and he breathed in tranquilly the lukewarm breath of cooked spicy pig's blood. A kidney oozed blood gouts on the willow-patterned dish, the last. He stood by the next-door girl at the counter. Would she buy it too, calling the items from a slip in her hand? Chapped, washing soda, and a pound and a half of Denny's sausages. His eyes rested on her vigorous hips. Woods, his name is. Wonder what he does. Wife is oldish. New blood. No followers allowed. Strong pair of arms. Whacking a carpet on the clothesline. She does whack it, by George. The way her crooked skirt swings at each whack. The ferret-eyed pork butcher folded the sausages he had snipped off with blotchy fingers, sausage pink. Sound meat there like a stall-fed heifer. He took up a page from the pile of cut sheets. The model farm at Kinnereth on the lake shore of Tiberius can become ideal winter sanatorium. Moses Montefiore. I thought he was. Farmhouse, wall round it, blurred cattle cropping. He held the page from him. Interesting. Read it nearer. The blurred cropping cattle. The page rustling. A young white heifer. Those mornings in the cattle market, the beasts lowing in their pens, branded sheep, flop and fall of dung, the breeders in hobnailed boots trudging through the litter, slapping a palm on a ripe meated hindquarter. There's a prime one! Unpeeled switches in their hands. He held the page aslant, patiently, bending his senses and his will, his soft subject gaze at rest. The crooked skirt swinging whack by whack by whack. The pork butcher snapped two sheets from the pile, wrapped up her prime sausages, and made a red grimace. Now, my miss, he said. She tendered a coin, smiling boldly, holding her thick wrist out. Thank you, my miss, and one shilling threepence change. For you, please. Mr. Bloom pointed quickly to catch up and walk behind her if she went slowly, behind her moving hams. Pleasant to see first thing in the morning. Hurry up, damn it! Make hay while the sun shines. She stood outside the shop in sunlight and sauntered lazily to the right. He sighed down his nose. They never understand. Soda-chapped hands, crusted toenails too. Brown scapulars in tatters, defending her both ways. The sting of disregard glowed to weak pleasure within his breast. For another, a constable off duty cuddled her in Eccles Lane. They liked them sizable. Prime sausage. Oh, please, Mr. Policeman, I'm lost in the wood. Threepence, please. His hand accepted the moist, tender gland and slid it into a side pocket. Then it fetched up three coins from his trousers' pocket and laid them on the rubber prickles. They lay, were read quickly, and quickly slid, disc by disc, into the till. Thank you, sir. Another time. A speck of eager fire from Fox Eyes thanked him. He withdrew his gaze after an instant. No, better not. Another time. 
Good morning, he said, moving away. Good morning, sir. No sign. Gone. What matter? He walked back along Dorset Street, reading gravely. Agendath Netaim, Planters Company, to purchase vast sandy tracts from Turkish government and plant with eucalyptus trees. Excellent for shade, fuel and construction. Orange groves and immense melon fields, north of Jaffa. You pay eight marks, and they plant a dunam of land for you with olives, oranges, almonds, or citrons. Olives cheaper, oranges need artificial irrigation. Every year you get a sending of the crop. Your name entered for life as owner in the Book of the Union. Can pay ten down, and the balance in yearly instalments. Bleibtreustrasse, 34, Berlin. W. 15. Nothing doing. Still an idea behind it. He looked at the cattle, blurred in silver heat, silvered, powdered olive trees. Quiet long days, pruning, ripening. Olives are packed in jars, eh? I have a few left from Andrews. Molly spitting them out. Knows the taste of them now. Oranges in tissue paper, packed in crates. Citrons, too. Wonder, is poor Citron still alive in St. Kevin's Parade? And Mastiansky with the old Sither. Pleasant evenings we had then. Molly in Citron's basket chair. Nice to hold. Cool waxen fruit. Hold in the hand. Lift it to the nostrils and smell the perfume. Like that. Heavy, sweet, wild perfume. Always the same, year after year. They fetched high prices too, Moisel told me. Our beauteous place. Pleasant streets, pleasant old times. Must be without a flaw, he said. Coming all that way. Spain, Gibraltar, Mediterranean, the Levant. Crates lined up on the quayside at Jaffa. Chap ticking them off in a book. Navvies handling them in soiled dungarees. There's what you call him out of... How do you? Doesn't see. Chap, you know, just to salute. Bit of a bore. His back is like that Norwegian captain's. Wonder if I'll meet him today, watering cart, to provoke the rain, on earth as it is in heaven. A cloud began to cover the sun, wholly, slowly, wholly, grey, far, no, not like that, a barren land, bare waste, volcanic lake of the Dead Sea, no fish, weedless, sunk deep in the earth, no wind would lift those waves, grey metal, poisonous foggy waters, Brimstone, they call it, raining down, the cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, Edom, all dead names, a dead sea and a dead land, grey and old, old now, it bore the oldest, the first race, a bent hag crossed from Cassidy's, clutching a noggin bottle by the neck, the oldest people, wandered far away over all the earth, captivity to captivity, multiplying, dying, being born everywhere. It lay there now, now it could bear no more, dead, an old woman's, the grey sunken cunt of the world. Desolation. Grey horror seared his flesh. Folding the page into his pocket, he turned into Eccles Street, hurrying homeward. Cold oil slid along his veins, chilling his blood, age crusting him with a salt cloak. Well, I'm here now. Morning mouth, bad images. Got up wrong side of the bed. Must begin again those Sandow's exercises. On the hands, down. Blotchy brown brick houses. Number 80, still unlet. Why is that? Valuation is only 28. Towers, Battersby, North, MacArthur. Parlour windows plastered with bills. Plasters on a sore eye. To smell the gentle smoke of tea, fume of the pan, sizzling butter be near her ample bed-warmed flesh. Yes, yes. Quick warm sunlight came running from Barclay Road, swiftly in slim sandals, along the brightening footpath. Runs, she runs to meet me, a girl with gold hair on the wind. Two letters and a card lay on the whole floor. He stopped and gathered them, Mrs. Marion Bloom. His quick heart slowed at once. Bold hand, Mrs. Marion. Poldy! Entering the bedroom, he half closed his eyes and walked through warm yellow twilight towards her tousled head. Who are the letters for? He looked at them. Mullingar. 
Millie. A letter for me from Millie, he said carefully, and a card to you, and a letter for you. He laid her card and letter on the twill bedspread near the curve of her knees. Do you want the blind up? Letting the blind up by gentle tugs half way, his backward eye saw her glance at the letter and tuck it under her pillow. That do? he asked, turning. She was reading the card, propped on her elbow. She got the things, she said. He waited till she had laid the card aside and curled herself back slowly with a snug sigh. Hurry up with that tea, she said. I'm parched. The kettle is boiling, he said. But he delayed to clear the chair, her striped petticoat, tossed soiled linen, and lifted all in an armful onto the foot of the bed. As he went down the kitchen stairs, she called, Baldy! What? Scald the teapot! On the boil, sure enough, a plume of steam from the spout. He scalded and rinsed out the teapot, and put in four full spoons of tea, tilting the kettle then to let water flow in. Having set it to draw, he took off the kettle, and crushed the pan flat on the live coals, and watched the lump of butter slide and melt. While he unwrapped the kidney, the cat mewed hungrily against him. Give her too much meat, she won't mouse. So they won't eat pork. Kosher. Here, he let the blood-smeared paper fall to her, and dropped the kidney amid the sizzling butter sauce. Pepper. He sprinkled it through his fingers, ringwise from the chipped egg cup. Then he slit open his letter, glancing down the page and over. Thanks. New Tam. Mr. Cochlan. Loch Owl Picnic. Young Student. Blazes Boylan's Seaside Girls. The tea was drawn. He filled his own moustache cup. Sham Crown Derby. Smiling. Silly Millie's birthday gift. Only five she was then. No, wait. Four. I gave her the amberoid necklace she broke, putting pieces of folded brown paper in the letter-box for her. He smiled, pouring. Oh, Millie Bloom, you are my darling, you are my looking-glass from night to morning. I'd rather have you without a farthing than Katie Keogh with her ass and garden. Poor old Professor Goodwin, dreadful old case. Still he was a courteous old chap, old-fashioned way he used to bow Molly off the platform and the little mirror in his silk hat. The night Millie brought it into the parlour. Oh, look what I found in Professor Goodwin's hat. Oh, we laughed. Sex breaking out even then. Pert little piece she was. He prodded a fork into the kidney and slapped it over, then fitted the teapot on the tray. Its hump bumped as he took it up. Everything on it, bread and butter, four, sugar, spoon, a cream, yes. He carried it upstairs, his thumb hooked in the teapot handle. Nudging the door open with his knee, he carried the tray in and set it on the chair by the bedhead. "'What a time you were!' she said. She set the brasses jingling as she raised herself briskly, an elbow on the pillow. He looked calmly down on her bulk and between her large, soft bubs, sloping within her nightdress like a she-goat's udder. The warmth of her couched body rose on the air, mingling with the fragrance of the tea she poured. A strip of torn envelope peeped from under the dimpled pillow. In the act of going, he stayed to straighten the bedspread. Who was the letter from? he asked. Bold hand. Marion. Oh, Boylan, she said. He's bringing the programme. What are you singing? La Cidarem with J. C. Doyle, she said, and Love's Old Sweet Song. Her full lips, drinking, smiled. Rather stale smell that incense leaves next day. Like foul flower water. Would you like the window open a little? She doubled a slice of bread into her mouth, asking, What time is the funeral? Eleven, I think, he answered. I didn't see the paper. He took up a leg of her soiled drawers from the bed. No? Then a twisted grey garter looped round a stocking, Rumpled, shiny soul. No, that book. Other stocking, her petticoat. It must have fell down, she said. He felt here and there. Voglio e non vorrei. Wonder if she pronounces that right, voglio. Not in the bed. Must have slid down. He stooped and lifted the valance. 
the book fallen sprawled against the bulge of the orange keyed chamber pot show here she said i put a mark in it there's a word i wanted to ask you she swallowed a draught of tea from her cup held by the knot handle and having wiped her fingertips smartly on the blanket began to search the text with the hairpin till she reached the word met him what he asked here she said what does that mean he leant downwards and read near her polished thumbnail metempsychosis yes who's he when he's at home metempsychosis he said frowning it's greek from the greek that means the transmigration of souls oh rocks she said tell us in plain words he smiled glancing askance at her mocking eye the same young eyes the first night after the charades dolphin's barn he turned over the smudged pages ruby the pride of the ring hello illustration fierce italian with carriage whip must be ruby pride of thee on the floor naked sheet kindly lent the monster maffei desisted and flung his victim from him with an oath cruelty behind it all doped animals trapeze at henglers had to look the other way mob gaping break your neck and we'll break our sides families of them bone them young so they met em psychosis that we live after death our souls that a man's soul after he dies dignam's soul did you finish it he asked yes she said there's nothing smutty in it is she in love with the first fellow all the time never read it do you want another yes get another of paul de cox nice name he has she poured more tea into her cup watching its flow sideways must get that capel street library book renewed or they'll write to kearney my guarantor reincarnation that's a word some people believe he said that we go on living in another body after death that we lived before they call it reincarnation that we all lived before on the earth thousands of years ago or some other planet they say we've forgotten it some say they remember their past lives the sluggish cream wound curdling spirals through her tea better remind her of the word metempsychosis an example would be better an example the bath of the nymph over the bed given away with the easter number of photo bits splendid masterpiece in art colours tea before you put milk in not unlike her with her hair down slimmer three and six i go for the frame she said it would look nice over the bed naked nymphs grease and for instance all the people that lived then he turned the pages back metempsychosis he said is what the ancient greeks call it they used to believe you could be changed into an animal or a tree for instance what they called nymphs for example her spoon ceased to stir up the sugar she gazed straight before her inhaling through her arched nostrils there's a smell of burn she said did you leave anything on the fire the kidney he cried suddenly he fitted the book roughly into his inner pocket and stubbing his toes against the broken commode hurried out towards the smell stepping hastily down the stairs with a flurried stork's legs pungent smoke shot up in an angry jet from a side of the pan by prodding a prong of the fork under the kidney he detached it and turned it turtle on its back only a little burnt he tossed it off the pan onto a plate and let the scanty brown gravy trickle over it cup of tea now he sat down cut and buttered a slice of the loaf he shore away the burnt flesh and flung it to the cat then he put a forkful into his mouth chewing with discernment the toothsome pliant meat done to a turn a mouthful of tea then he cut away dyes of bread sopped one in the gravy and put it in his mouth what was that about some young student and a picnic he creased out the letter at his side reading it slowly as he chewed sopping another dye of bread in the gravy and raising it to his mouth dearest papley thanks ever so much for the lovely birthday present it suits me splendid everyone says i'm quite the belle in my new tam i got mummy's lovely box of creams and am writing they are lovely i'm getting on swimming in the photo business now mr cochlan took one of me and missus we'll send when developed we did great biz yesterday 
Fair day, and all the beef to the heels were in. We are going to Loch Owl on Monday, with a few friends, to make a scrap picnic. Give my love to Mummy, and to yourself a big kiss and thanks. I hear them at the piano downstairs. There is to be a concert in the Greville Arms on Saturday. There's a young student comes here some evenings, named Bannon. His cousins or something are big swells. He sings Boylan's. I was on the pop of writing Blaze's Boylan's song about those seaside girls. Tell him Silly Milly sends my best respects. Must now close with fondest love. Your fond daughter, Milly. P.S. Excuse bad writing. Am in a hurry. Bye-bye. M. Fifteen yesterday. Curious. Fifteenth of the month, too. Her first birthday away from home. Separation. Remember the summer morning she was born, running to knock up Mrs. Thornton in Denzel Street. Jolly old woman. Lots of babies she must have helped into the world. She knew from the first poor little Rudy wouldn't live. Well, God is good, sir. She knew at once. He would be eleven now if he had lived. His vacant face stared pitying at the postscript. Excuse bad writing. Hurry, piano downstairs. Coming out of her shell. Row with her in the XL cafe about the bracelet. Wouldn't eat her cakes or speak or look. Sauce box. He sopped other dyes of bread in the gravy and ate piece after piece of kidney. Twelve and six a week. Not much. Still she might do worse. Music hall stage. Young student. He drank a draught of cooler tea to wash down his meal. Then he read the letter again, twice. Oh well, she knows how to mind herself. But if not? No, nothing has happened. Of course it might. Wait in any case till it does. A wild piece of goods. Her slim legs running up the staircase. Destiny, ripening now. Bane, very. He smiled with troubled affection at the kitchen window. Day I caught her in the street, pinching her cheeks to make them red. Anemic a little. Was given milk too long. On the Erin's King that day, round the kish. Damned old tub, pitching him about. Not a bit funky. Her pale blue scarf, loose in the wind with her hair. All dimpled cheeks and curls. Your head, it simply swirls. Seaside girls. Torn envelope. Hands stuck in his trousers pockets. Jarvy off for the day, singing. Friend of the family. Swirls, he says. Peer with lamps. Summer evening. Band. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls. Milly too. Young kisses. The first. Far away now, past. Mrs. Marion. Reading, lying back now. Counting the strands of her hair. Smiling, braiding. A soft qualm regret flowed down his backbone, increasing. Will happen, yes. Prevent, useless. Can't move. Girl's sweet light lips. Will happen too. He felt the flowing qualm spread over him. Useless to move now. Lips kissed, kissing, kissed. Full, gluey woman's lips. Better where she is down there. Away. Occupy her. Wanted a dog to pass the time. Might take a trip down there. August bank holiday. Only two and six return. Six weeks off, however. Might work a press pass. Or through McCoy. The cat, having cleaned all her fur, returned to the meat-stained paper, nosed at it, and stalked to the door. She looked back at him, mewing. Wants to go out. Wait before a door. Sometime it will open. Let her wait. Has the fidgets. Electric. Thunder in the air. Was washing at her ear with her back to the fire, too. He felt heavy, full. Then a gentle loosening of his bowels. He stood up, undoing the waistband of his trousers. The cat mewed to him. Meow, he said in answer. Wait till I'm ready. Heaviness, hot day coming. Too much trouble to fag up the stairs to the landing. A paper. He liked to read at stall. Hope no ape comes knocking just as I'm... In the table drawer, he found an old number of titbits. He folded it under his armpit, went to the door and opened it. The cat went up in soft bounds. Ah, wanted to go upstairs, curl up in a ball on the bed. Listening, he heard her voice. Come, come, pussy, come. 
he went out through the back door into the garden, stood to listen towards the next garden. No sound. Perhaps hanging clothes out to dry. The maid was in the garden. Fine morning. He bent down to regard a lean file of spearmint growing by the wall. Make a summer house here. Scarlet runners, Virginia creepers. Want to manure the whole place over. Scabby soil. A coat of liver of sulphur. All soil like that, without dung. Household slops. Lo, what is this that is? The hens in the next garden. Their droppings are very good top dressing. Best of all, though, are the cattle, especially when they are fed on those oil cakes. Mulch of dung. Best thing to clean ladies' kid gloves. Dirty cleans. Ashes, too. Reclaim the whole place. Grow peas in that corner there. Lettuce. Always have fresh greens then. Still, gardens have their drawbacks. That bee or blue bottle here, Whit Monday. He walked on. Where's my hat, by the way? Must have put it back on the peg, or hanging up on the floor. Funny, I don't remember that. All stand too full. Four umbrellas, her rain cloak. Picking up the letters. Drago's shop bell ringing. Queer, I was just thinking that moment. Brown, brilliantined hair over his collar. Just had a wash and brush up. Wonder, have I time for a bath this morning? Tara Street. Chap in the pay box there got away. James Stevens, they say. O'Brien. Deep voice that fellow Glugach has. Agenda, what is it? Now, my miss. Enthusiast. He kicked open the crazy door of the Jakes. Better be careful not to get these trousers dirty for the funeral. He went in, bowing his head under the low lintel, leaving the door ajar amid the stench of mouldy lime wash and stale cobwebs. He undid his braces. Before sitting down, he peered through a chink up at the next door window. The king was in his counting house. Nobody. A squat on the cuck stool, he folded out his paper, turning its pages over on his bared knees. Something new and easy. No great hurry. Keep it a bit. Our prize titbit, Matcham's Masterstroke. Written by Mr. Philip Beaufoy, Playgoers Club, London. Payment at the rate of one guinea a column has been made to the writer. Three and a half, three pounds three, three pounds thirteen and six. Quietly he read, restraining himself, the first column, and, yielding but resisting, began the second. Midway, his last resistance yielding, he allowed his bowels to ease themselves quietly as he read, reading still patiently, that slight constipation of yesterday quite gone. Hope it's not too big. Bring on pars again. No, just right. So, ah! Costive, one tabloid of Cascara Sagrada. Life might be so. It did not move or touch him, but it was something quick and neat. Print anything now. Silly season. He read on, seated calm above his own rising smell. Neat, certainly. Matcham often thinks of the masterstroke by which he won the laughing witch, who now begins and ends morally, hand in hand, smart. He glanced back through what he had read, and while feeling his water flow quietly, he envied kindly Mr. Beaufoy, who had written it, and received payment of three pounds thirteen and six. My manager's sketch, by Mr. and Mrs. L. M. Bloom. Invent a story for some proverb, which, time I used to try jotting down on my cuff what she said dressing, dislike dressing together, nicked myself shaving, biting her nether lip, hooking the placket of her skirt, timing her, 9.15, did Roberts pay you yet? 9.20, what had Greta Conroy on? 9.23, what possessed me to buy this comb? 9.24, I'm swelled after that cabbage, a speck of dust on the patent leather of her boot. Rubbing smartly in turn each welt against her stocking calf. Morning after the bazaar dance, when May's band played Ponchielli's Dance of the Hours. Explain that, morning hours, noon, then evening coming on, then night hours. Washing her teeth, that was the first night. Her head dancing her fan sticks clicking. Is that Boylan well off? He has money. Why? 
I noticed he had a good smell off his breath dancing. No use humming then. Allude to it. Strange kind of music that last night. The mirror was in shadow. She rubbed her hand glass briskly on her woollen vest against her full wagging bub. Peering into it, lines in her eyes. It wouldn't pan out somehow. Evening hours, girls in grey gauze. Night hours, then black with daggers and eye masks. Poetical idea, pink, then golden, then grey, then black, still true to life also, day, then the night. He tore away half the prize story sharply and wiped himself with it. Then he girded up his trousers, braced and buttoned himself. He pulled back the jerky, shaky door of the jakes and came forth from the gloom into the air. In the bright light, lightened and cooled in limb, he eyed carefully his black trousers, the ends, the knees, the hocks of the knees. What time is the funeral? Better find out in the paper. A creak and a dark whirr in the air high up. The bells of George's church. They told the hour, loud, dark, iron. Hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho. Quarter two, there again the overtone following through the air. Third, poor Dignam. End of section five. Section six of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce Part 2 The Odyssey Episode 5 Lotus Eaters By lorries along Sir John Rogerson's quay, Mr. Bloom walked soberly past Windmill Lane, Leesk's the linseed crushers, the postal telegraph office, could have given that address too, and passed the sailors' home. He turned from the morning noises of the quayside and walked through Lime Street. By Brady's cottages a boy for the skins lolled, his bucket of offal linked, smoking a chewed fag-butt. A smaller girl with scars of eczema on her forehead eyed him, listlessly holding her battered cask hoop. Tell him if he smokes he won't grow. Oh, let him! His life isn't such a bed of roses. Waiting outside pubs to bring Da home. Come on to Ma, Da. Slack hour. Won't be many there. He crossed Townsend Street, past the frowning face of Bethel. L, yes, house of Aleph, Beth. And past Nichols, the undertakers. At eleven it is. Time enough. Dare say Corney Kelleher bagged that job for O'Neill's. Singing with his eyes shut, Corney. Met her once in the park, in the dark, what a lark. Police tout. Her name and address she then told, with my turulum turulum tay. Oh, surely he bagged it. Bury him cheap in watch him a call, with my turulum 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 turulum. In Westland Row he halted before the window of the Belfast and Oriental Tea Company, and read the legends of lead-papered packets, choice blend, finest quality, family tea, Rather warm. Tea? Must get some from Tom Kernan. Couldn't ask him at a funeral, though. While his eyes still read blandly, he took off his hat, quietly inhaling his hair oil, and sent his right hand with slow grace over his brow and hair. Very warm morning. Under their dropped lids his eyes found the tiny bow of the leather headband inside his high-grade huff. Just there. His right hand came down into the bowl of his hat. His fingers found quickly a card behind the headband and transferred it to his waistcoat pocket. So warm. His right hand once more, more slowly, went over again. Choice blend, made of the finest Ceylon brands. The Far East, lovely spot it must be. The garden of the world, big lazy leaves to float about on. Cactuses, flowery meads, snaky lianas, they call them. Wonder is it like that? those Singhalese lobbing around in the sun, in dolce far niente. 
not doing a hand's turn all day, sleep six months out of twelve, too hot to quarrel, influence of the climate, lethargy, flowers of idleness, the air feeds most, azotes, hot house in botanic gardens, sensitive plants, water lilies, petals too tired to, sleeping sickness in the air, walk on rose leaves, imagine trying to eat tripe and cow heel. Where was the chap I saw in that picture somewhere? Ah, in the Dead Sea, floating on his back, reading a book with a parasol open. Couldn't sink if you tried, so thick with salt. Cause the weight of the water, no, the weight of the body in the water is equal to the weight of the, or is it the volume is equal of the weight? It's a law or something like that. Vance in high school, cracking his finger joints, teaching, the college curriculum, cracking curriculum. What is weight really when you say the weight? Thirty-two feet per second per second. Law of falling bodies. Per second per second. They all fall to the ground. The earth. It's the force of gravity of the earth is the weight. He turned away and sauntered across the road. How did she walk with her sausages? Like that something. As he walked, he took the folded freeman from his side pocket, unfolded it, rolled it lengthwise in a baton, and tapped it at each sauntering step against his trouser leg. Careless air, just drop in to see. Per second, per second. Per second for every second, it means. From the curbstone he darted a keen glance through the door of the post office. Too late box. Post here. No one. In. He handed the card through the brass grill. Are there any letters for me? he asked. While the postmistress searched a pigeonhole, he gazed at the recruiting poster with soldiers of all arms on parade, and held the tip of his baton against his nostrils, smelling fresh-printed rag paper. No answer, probably. Went too far last time. The postmistress handed him back through the grill his card with a letter. He thanked and glanced rapidly at the typed envelope. Henry Flower, Esquire. Care of Post Office, Western Row, City answered anyhow. He slipped card and letter into his side pocket, reviewing again the soldiers on parade. Where's old Tweedy's regiment? Cast off soldier. There, bearskin cap and hackle plume. No, he's a grenadier, pointed cuffs. There he is, Royal Dublin Fusiliers, red coats, too showy. That must be why the women go after them. Uniform, easier to enlist and drill. More Gon's letter about taking them off O'Connell Street at night. Disgrace to our Irish capital. Griffith's paper is on the same tack now. An army rotten with venereal disease. Overseas or half-seas over empire. Half-baked they look, hypnotised like. Eyes front, mark time. Table, able, bed, ed. The king's own. Never see him dressed up as a fireman or a bobby. A mason, yes. He strolled out of the post office and turned to the right. Talk, as if that would mend matters. His hand went into his pocket, and a forefinger felt its way under the flap of the envelope, ripping it open in jerks. Women will pay a lot of heed, I don't think. His fingers drew forth the letter and crumpled the envelope in his pocket. Something pinned on it. Photo, perhaps? Hair? No. McCoy. Get rid of him quickly. Take me out of my way. Hate company when you... Hello, Bloom. Where are you off to? Hello, McCoy. Nowhere in particular. How's the body? Fine. How are you? Just keeping alive, McCoy said. His eyes on the black tie and clothes, he asked with low respect. Is there any... No trouble, I hope. I see your... Oh, no, Mr. Bloom said. Poor Dignam, you know. The funeral is today. To be sure, poor fellow. So it is. What time? A photo it isn't. A badge, maybe. Er, uh, eleven, Mr. Bloom answered. I must try to get out there, McCoy said. Eleven, is it? I only heard it last night. Who was telling me? Hollihan. You know, Hoppy. I know. Mr. Bloom gazed across the road at the outsider drawn up before the door of the Grosvenor. The porter hoisted the valise up on the well. She stood still, waiting, while the man, husband, brother, like her, searched his pockets for change. Stylish kind of coat with that roll collar, 
warm for a day like this, looks like blanket cloth. Careless stand of her with her hands in those patch pockets, like that haughty creature at the polo match. Women all for caste till you touch the spot. Handsome is and handsome does. Reserved about to yield. The honourable Mrs. and Brutus is an honourable man. Possess her once, take the starch out of her. I was with Bob Doran. He's on one of his periodical bends, and what do you call him? Bantam Lions. Just down there in Conway's we were. Doran, Lions in Conway's. She raised a gloved hand to her hair. In came Hoppy, having a wet. Drawing back his head and gazing far from beneath his veiled eyelids, he saw the bright fawn skin shine in the glare, the braided drums. Clearly I can see today. Moisture about, gives long sight perhaps. Talking of one thing or another, lady's hand. Which side will she get up? And he said, sad thing about our poor friend Paddy. What Paddy, I said. Poor little Paddy Dignam, he said. Off to the country, broadstone probably, high brown boots with laces dangling, well-turned foot. What is he fostering over that change for? Sees me looking. I out for other fellow always. Good fall back, two strings to her bow. Why, I said. What's wrong with him, I said. Proud, rich, silk stockings. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He moved a little to the side of McCoy's talking head getting up in a minute. "'What's wrong with him?' he said. "'He's dead,' he said. "'And faith, he filled up. "'Is it Paddy Dignam?' I said. "'I couldn't believe it when I heard it. "'I was with him no later than Friday last, "'or Thursday, was it, in the arch. "'Yes,' he said. "'He's gone. "'He died on Monday, poor fellow. "'Watch, watch, silk flash, rich stockings, white. "'Watch.' A heavy tramcar honking its gong slewed between. Lost it, curse your noisy pug nose. Feels locked out of it, paradise and the perry. Always happening like that, the very moment. Girl in Eustace Street hallway, Monday was it, settling her garter. Her friend covering the display of esprit de corps. Well, what are you gaping at? Yes, yes, Mr. Bloom said after a dull sigh. Another gone. One of the best, McCoy said. The tram passed. They drove off towards the loop line bridge, her rich gloved hand on the steel grip. Flicker, flicker, the lace flare of her hat in the sun. Flicker, flick. Wife well, I suppose, McCoy's changed voice said. Oh, yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tip top, thanks. He unrolled the newspaper baton idly and read idly. What is home without plum trees potted meat? Incomplete. With it an abode of bliss. My missus has just got an engagement. At least it's not settled yet. Valise tack again. By the way, no harm. I'm off that, thanks. Mr. Bloom turned his large lidded eyes with unhasty friendliness. My wife too, he said. She's going to sing at a swagger affair in the Ulster Hall, Belfast on the 25th. That's so, McCoy said. Glad to hear that, old man. Who's getting it up? Mrs. Marion Bloom. Not up yet. Queen was in her bedroom, eating bread and... No book. Blackened court cards laid along her thigh by sevens. Dark lady and fair man. Cat, furry black ball. Torn strip of envelope. Love's old sweet song. Comes love's old... It's kind of a tour, don't you see? Mr. Bloom said thoughtfully. Sweet song. There's a committee formed, part shares and part profits. McCoy nodded, picking at his moustache stubble. Oh, well, he said, that's good news. He moved to go. Well, glad to see you looking fit, he said. Meet you knocking around. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tell you what, McCoy said, you might put down my name at the funeral, will you? I'd like to go, but I mightn't be able, you see. There's a drowning case at Sandy Cove may turn up, and then the coroner and myself would have to go down if the body is found. You just shove in my name if I'm not there, will you? I'll do that, Mr. Bloom said, moving to get off. That'll be all right. Right, McCoy said brightly. Thanks, old man. I'd go if I possibly could. 
Well, to long. Just C.P. McCoy will do. That will be done, Mr. Bloom answered firmly. Didn't catch me napping that wheeze, the quick touch, soft mark. I'd like my job. Belize I have a particular fancy for. Leather, capped corners, riveted edges, double action lever lock. Bob Cowley lent him his for the Wicklow Regatta concert last year, and never heard tidings of it from that good day to this. Mr. Bloom, strolling towards Brunswick Street, smiled. My missus has just got an reedy freckled soprano, cheese-pairing nose. Nice enough in its way for a little ballad. No guts in it. You and me, don't you know, in the same boat. Soft soaping. Give you the needle, that would. Can't he hear the difference? Think he's that way inclined a bit. It gets my grain somehow. Thought that Belfast would fetch him. I hope that smallpox up there doesn't get worse. Suppose she wouldn't let herself be vaccinated again. Your wife and my wife. Wonder is he pimping after me. Mr. Bloom stood at the corner, his eyes wandering over the multicoloured hoardings. Cantrell's and Cochrane's ginger ale, aromatic. Clear his summer sail. No, he's going on straight. Hello, Leah tonight, Mrs. Bandman Palmer. Like to see her in that again. Hamlet she played last night. Male impersonator. Perhaps he was a woman. Why Ophelia committed suicide. Poor papa. How he used to talk about Kate Bateman in that. Outside the Adelphi in London. Waited all the afternoon to get in. Year before I was born, that was. Sixty-five. And Ristori in Vienna. What is this the right name is? By Mosenthal it is. Rachel, is it? No, the scene he was always talking about, where the old blind Abraham recognises the voice and puts his fingers on his face. Nathan's voice, his son's voice. I hear the voice of Nathan, who left his father to die of grief and misery in my arms, who left the house of his father and left the God of his father. Every word is so deep, Leopold. Poor papa, poor man. I'm glad I didn't go into the room to look at his face. That day, oh dear, oh dear, phew. Well, perhaps it was the best for him. Mr. Bloom went round the corner and passed the drooping nags of the hazard. No use thinking of it any more. Nosebag time. Wish I hadn't met that McCoy fellow. He came nearer and heard a crunching of gilded oats, the gently champing teeth. Their full buck eyes regarded him as he went by, amid the sweet oaten reek of horse-piss. Their El Dorado, poor jugginses. Damn all they know or care about anything with their long noses stuck in nose-bags. Too full for words. Still they get their feed all right, and their dos. Gelded, too. A stump of black gutter percha wagging limp between their haunches. Might be happy all the same that way. Good poor brutes they look. Still their neigh can be very irritating. He drew the letter from his pocket and folded it into the newspaper he carried. Might just walk into her here. The lane is safer. He passed the cabman's shelter. Curious the life of drifting cabbies. All weathers, all places. Time or set down. No will of their own. Volio e non. Like to give them an odd cigarette sociable shout a few flying syllables as they pass he hummed la ci darem la mano la 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 he turned into cumberland street and going on some paces halted in the lee of the station wall no one meets timbiard pile of balks ruins and tenements with careful tread he passed over a hopscotch court with its forgotten picky stone not a sinner Near the timber yard a squatted child at marbles, alone, shooting the tour with a cunny thumb. A wise tabby, a blinking sphinx, watched from her warm sill. Pity to disturb them. Mohammed cut a piece out of his mantle, not to wake her. Open it, and once I played marbles when I went to that old dame's school. She liked mignonette, Mrs. Ellis's, and Mr. He opened the letter within the newspaper. A flower, I think it's a, a yellow flower with flattened petals. Not annoyed then. What does she say? Dear Henry, 
I got your last letter to me, and thank you very much for it. I'm sorry you did not like my last letter. Why did you enclose the stamps? I'm awfully angry with you. I do wish I could punish you for that. I called you naughty boy because I do not like that other word. Please tell me what is the real meaning of that word. Are you not happy in your home, you poor little naughty boy? I do wish I could do something for you. Please tell me what you think of poor me. I often think of the beautiful name you have. Dear Henry, when will we meet? I think of you so often. You have no idea. I have never felt myself so much drawn to a man as you. I feel so bad about. Please write me a long letter and tell me more. Remember, if you do not, I will punish you. So now you know what I will do to you, you naughty boy, if you do not write. Oh, how I long to meet you. Henry, dear, do not deny my request before my patience are exhausted. Then I will tell you all. Goodbye now, naughty darling. I have such a bad headache today, and write by return to your longing, Martha. P.S. Do tell me what kind of perfume does your wife use. I want to know. He tore the flower gravely from its pinhold, smelt its almost no smell, and placed it in his heart pocket, language of flowers. They like it because no one can hear, or a poison bouquet to strike him down. Then, walking slowly forward, he read the letter again, murmuring here and there a word. Angry tulips with you, darling. Manflower, punish your cactus if you don't. Please, poor forget-me-not. How I long, violets, the dear roses, when we soon anemone meet all naughty night-stalk, wife Martha's perfume. Having read it all, he took it from the newspaper and put it back in his side pocket. Weak joy opened his lips changed since the first letter. Wonder, did she write it herself, doing the indignant? A girl of good family like me, respectable character, could meet one Sunday after the rosary. Thank you, not having any. Usual love scrimmage. Then running round corners. Bad as a row with Molly. Cigar has a cooling effect. Narcotic. Go further next time. Naughty boy. Punish. Afraid of words, of course. Brutal, why not? Try it anyhow. A bit at a time. Fingering still the letter in his pocket, he drew the pin out of it. Common pin, eh? He threw it on the road, out of her clothes somewhere, pinned together. Queer the number of pins they always have. No roses without thorns. Flat Dublin voices bawled in his head. Those two sluts that night in the coombe, linked together in the rain. Oh, Mary lost the pin of her drawers. She didn't know what to do to keep it up, to keep it up. It, them. Such a bad headache. As her roses, probably. Or sitting all day typing. Eye focus, bad for stomach nerves. What perfume does your wife use? How could you make out a thing like that? To keep it up. Martha, Mary. I saw that picture somewhere. I forget now. Old master or fate for money. He is sitting in their house, talking. Mysterious. Also, the two sluts in the coombe would listen. To keep it up. Nice kind of evening feeling. No more wandering about. Just loll there. Quiet. Dusk. Let everything rip. Forget. Tell about places you've been. Strange customs. The other one, jar on her head, was getting the supper. Fruit. Olives. Lovely cool water out of the well. Stone cold like the hole in the wall at Ashtown. Must carry a paper goblet next time I go to the trotting matches. She listens with big, dark, soft eyes. Tell her, more and more, all. Then a sigh, silence. Long, long, long rest. Going under the railway arch, she took out the envelope, tore it swiftly in shreds, and scattered them towards the road. The shreds fluttered away, sank in the dank air, a white flutter, then all sank. Henry Flower, you could tear up a cheque for a hundred pounds in the same way. Simple bit of paper. Lord Ivy once cashed a seven-figure cheque for a million in the Bank of Ireland. Shows you the money to be made out of porter. Still the other brother, Lord Ardilorn, has to change his shirt four times a day, they say. Skin breeds lice or vermin. A million pounds. Wait a moment. Tuppence a pint, fourpence a quart. 
eightpence a gallon of porter. No, one and fourpence a gallon of porter. One and four into twenty. Fifteen about, yes, exactly. Fifteen millions of barrels of porter. What am I saying, barrels? Gallons. About a million barrels all the same. An incoming train clanked heavily over his head, coach after coach. Barrels bumped in his head. Dull porter slopped and churned inside. The bunghole sprang open and a huge dull flood leaked out, flowing together, winding through mud flats all over the level land, a lazy, pooling swirl of liquor bearing along wide-leaved flowers of its froth. He had reached the open back door of All Hallows. Stepping into the porch, he doffed his hat, took the card from his pocket, and tucked it again behind the leather headband. Damn it, I might have tried to work McCoy for a pass to Mullingar. Same notice on the door. Sermon by the very Reverend John Conmey, Society of Jesus, on St. Peter Claver and the African Mission. Save China's millions. Wonder how they explain it to the heathen Chinese. Prefer an ounce of opium. Celestials. Rank heresy for them. Prayers for the conversion of Gladstone they had, too, when he was almost unconscious. The Protestants the same. Convert Dr. William J. Walsh, D.D., to the true religion. Buddha, their god, lying on his side in the museum, taking it easy with his hand under his cheek. Jostics burning, not like Eke Homo. Crown of thorns and cross. Clever idea, St. Patrick, the shamrock. Chopsticks, con me. Martin Cunningham knows him, distinguished looking. Sorry I didn't work him about getting Molly into the choir instead of that Father Farley who looked a fool but wasn't. They're taught that. He's not going out in bluey specks with the sweat rolling off him to baptise blacks, is he? The glasses would take their fancy, flashing. Like to see them sitting around in a ring with blub lips, entranced, listening. Still life. Lap it up like milk, I suppose. The cold smell of sacred stone called him. He trod the worn steps, pushed the swing door, and entered softly by the rear. Something going on, some sodality, pity so empty. Nice discreet place to be next some girl. Who is my neighbour? Jammed by the hour to slow music. That woman at midnight mass, seventh heaven. Women knelt in the benches with crimson halters around their necks. Heads bowed. A batch knelt at the altar rails. The priest went along by them, murmuring, holding the thing in his hands. He stopped at each, took out a communion, shook a drop or two, are they in water, off it, and put it neatly into her mouth. Her hat and head sank. Then the next one, a small old woman. The priest bent down to put it into her mouth, murmuring all the time, Latin. The next one, shut your eyes and open your mouth. What? Corpus, body, corpse. Good idea, the Latin. Stupefies them first. Hospice for the dying. They don't seem to chew it, only swallow it down. Rum idea, eating bits of a corpse. Why the cannibals cotton to it? He stood aside, watching their blind masks pass down the aisle, one by one, and seek their places. He approached a bench and seated himself in its corner, nursing his hat and newspaper. These pots we have to wear... We ought to have hats modelled on our heads. They were about him here and there, with heads still bowed in their crimson halters, waiting for it to melt in their stomachs. Something like those matzoth. It's that sort of bread, unleavened showbread. Look at them. Now I bet it makes them feel happy. Lollipop. It does. Yes, bread of angels it's called. There's a big idea behind it. Kind of kingdom of God is within you feel. First communicants, hokey-pokey, penny a lump. Then feel all like one family party, same in the theatre, all in the same swim. They do, I'm sure of that, not so lonely. It's our confraternity. Then came out a big spreesh, let off steam. Thing is, if you really believe in it, Lord's cure, waters of oblivion, and the knock apparition, statues bleeding. Old fellow asleep near that confession box. Hence those snores, blind faith, safe in the arms of kingdom come, lulls all pain, wake this time next year. 
he saw the priest stow the communion cup away, well in, and kneel an instant before it, showing a large grey boot sole from under the lace affair he had on. Suppose he lost the pin of his... He wouldn't know what to do, bald spot behind. Letters on his back, I-N-R-I. -I. No, I-H-S. Molly told me one time I asked her, I have sinned, or no, I have suffered, it is. And the other one, iron nails ran in. Meet one Sunday after the rosary. Do not deny my request. Turn up with a veil and black bag. Dusk and the light behind her. She might be here with a ribbon round her neck and do the other thing all the same on the sly. Their character. That fellow that turned Queen's evidence on the Invincibles, he used to receive the, Carey was his name, the communion every morning. This very church, Peter Carey. No, Peter Claver, I'm thinking of. Dennis Carey. And just imagine that. Wife and six children at home, and plotting that murder all the time. Those craw thumpers. Now that's a good name for them. There's always something shifty looking about them. They're not straight men of business either. Oh no, she's not here. The flower. No, no. By the way, did I tear up that envelope? Yes, under the bridge. The priest was rinsing out the chalice. Then he tossed off the dregs smartly. Wine. Makes it more aristocratic than, for example, if he drank what they are used to, Guinness's porter, or some temperance beverage, Wheatley's Dublin hot bitters, or Cantrell and Cochrane's ginger ale, aromatic. Doesn't give them any of it. Show wine, only the other. Cold comfort. Pious fraud, but quite right. Otherwise they'd have one old boozer worse than another coming along, cadging for a drink. Queer the whole atmosphere of the... Quite right. Perfectly right, that is. Mr. Bloom looked back towards the choir. Not going to be any music. Pity. Who has the organ here, I wonder? Old Glynn. He knew how to make that instrument talk. The vibrato. Fifty pounds a year, they say he had in Gardner Street. Molly was in fine voice that day. The Stabat Mater of Rossini. Father Bernard Vaughan's sermon first. Christ or Pilate? Christ. But don't keep us all night over it. Music they wanted. Foot drill stopped. Could hear a pin drop. I told her to pitch her voice against that corner. I could feel the thrill in the air, the full, the people looking up. Quis est homo? Some of that old sacred music is splendid. Mercadante. Seven last words. Mozart's twelfth mass. The Gloria in that. Those old popes were keen on music, on art and statues and pictures of all kinds. Palestrina, for example. They had a gay old time while it lasted. Healthy, too. Chanting, regular hours. Then brew liqueurs. Benedictine, green chartreuse. Still, having eunuchs in their choir, that was coming it a bit thick. What kind of voice is it? Must be curious to hear after their own strong basses. Connoisseurs. Suppose they wouldn't feel anything after. Kind of placid. No worry. Fall into flesh, don't they? Gluttons. Tall. Long legs. Who knows? Eunuch. One way out of it. He saw the priest bend down and kiss the altar, and then face about and bless all the people. All crossed themselves and stood up. Mr. Bloom glanced about him and then stood up, looking over the risen hats. Stand up at the gospel, of course. Then all settled down on their knees again, and he sat back quietly in his bench. The priest came down from the altar, holding the thing out from him, and he and the mass-boy answered each other in Latin. Then the priest knelt down and began to read off a card. O oh God, our refuge and our strength! Mr. Bloom put his face forward to catch the words. English, throw them the bone. I remember slightly. How long since your last mass? Gloria and Immaculate Virgin, Joseph, her spouse, Peter and Paul. More interesting if you understood what it was all about. Wonderful organisation, certainly. Goes like clockwork. Confession. Everyone wants to. Then I will tell you all. Penance. Punish me, please. Great weapon in their hands. More than doctor or solicitor. Woman dying, too. And I. Shh, shh. And did you... Cha-cha-cha-cha. And why did you? 
looked down at her ring to find an excuse. Whispering gallery, walls have ears. Husband learned to his surprise, God's little joke. Then out she comes, repentant skin deep, lovely shame, pray at an altar. Hail Mary and Holy Mary, flowers, incense, candles melting, hide her blushes. Salvation Army, blatant imitation, reformed prostitute will address the meeting. How I found the Lord! Square-headed chaps those must be in Rome, they work the whole show. And don't they rake in the money too? Bequests also to the PP for the time being in his absolute discretion. Masses for the repose of my soul to be said publicly with open doors. Monasteries and convents. The priest in the firm manner will case in the witness box. No browbeating him. He had his answer pat for everything. Liberty and exaltation of our holy mother, the church. The doctors of the church. They mapped out the whole theology of it. The priest prayed. Blessed Michael, Archangel, defend us in the hour of conflict. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God restrain him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust Satan down to hell, and with him those other wicked spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. The priest and the mass boy stood up and walked off. All over, the women remained behind. Thanksgiving. Better be shoving along, brother Buzz. Come around with the plate, perhaps. Pay your Easter duty. He stood up. Hello. Were those two buttons of my waistcoat open all the time? Women enjoy it. Annoyed if you don't. Why didn't you tell me before? Never tell you. But we... Excuse, miss, there's a woo, just a woo, fluff, or their skirt behind, placket unhooked, glimpses of the moon. Still like you, better untidy. Good job it wasn't further south. He passed, discreetly buttoning, down the aisle and out through the main door into the light. He stood a moment unseeing by the cold black marble bowl, while before him and behind two worshippers dipped furtive hands, in the low tide of holy water. Trams, a car of Prescott's dye-works, a widow in her weeds. Notice, because I'm in mourning myself, he covered himself. How goes the time? Quarter past. Time enough yet. Better get that lotion made up. Where is this? Ah, yes, the last time. Sweeney's in Lincoln Place. Chemists rarely move. They're green and gold beacon jars, too heavy to stir. Hamilton Longs, founded in the year of the flood. Huguenot Churchyard near there. Visit some day. He walked southward along Westland Row. But the recipe is in the other trousers. Oh, and I forgot that latchkey too. Bore this funeral affair. Oh, well, poor fellow, it's not his fault. When was it I got it made up last? Wait, I changed a sovereign, I remember. First of the month it must have been, or the second. Oh, he can look it up in the prescriptions book. The chemist turned back, page after page. Sandy, shriveled smell he seems to have. Shrunken skull, and old. Quest for the philosopher's stone. The alchemists. Drugs aid you after mental excitement. Lethargy then. Why? Reaction. A lifetime in a night. Gradually changes your character. Living all the day among herbs, ointments, disinfectants, all his alabaster lily pots, mortar and pestle, ac, dist, fol, lor, te, virid, smell almost cure you like the dentist's doorbell. Doctor Whack, he ought to physic himself a bit. Electuary or emulsion. The first fellow that picked a herb to cure himself had a bit of pluck. Simples. Want to be careful. Enough stuff here to chloroform you. Test. Turns blue litmus paper red. Chloroform. Overdose of laudanum. Sleeping draughts. Love filters. Paragoric. Poppy syrup. Bad for cough. Clogs the pore or the phlegm. Poisons. The only cures. Remedy where you least expect it. Clever of nature. About a fortnight ago, sir? Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He waited by the counter, inhaling the keen reek of drugs, the dusty dry smell of sponges and loofers, 
but of time taken up telling your aches and pains. Sweet almond oil and tincture of benzoin, Mr. Bloom said, and then orange flower water. It certainly did make her skin so delicate, white like wax. And white wax also, he said, brings out the darkness of her eyes, looking at me, the sheet up to her eyes, Spanish, smelling herself, when I was fixing the links in my cuffs. Those homely recipes are often the best. Strawberries for the teeth, nettles and rain water, oatmeal, they say, steeped in buttermilk, skin food. One of the old queen's sons, Duke of Albany, was it, had only one skin. Leopold, yes. Three we have, warts, bunions, and pimples to make it worse. But you want a perfume, too. What perfume does your peau d'Espagne, that orange flower, pure curd soap, water is so fresh, nice smell these soaps have. Time to get a bath round the corner, hammam, Turkish, massage, dirt gets rolled up in your navel. Nicer if a nice girl did it. Also, I think I, yes, I, do it in the bath. Curious longing, I, water to water, combine business with pleasure. Pity no time for massage. Feel fresh then, all day. Funeral be rather glum. Yes, sir, the chemist said. That was two and nine. Have you brought a bottle? No, Mr. Bloom said. Make it up, please. I'll call later in the day, and I'll take one of those soaps. How much are they? Fourpence, sir. Mr. Bloom raised a cake to his nostrils. Sweet lemony wax. I'll take this one, he said. That makes three and a penny. Yes, sir, the chemist said. You can pay altogether, sir, when you come back. Good, Mr. Bloom said. He strolled out of the shop, the newspaper baton under his armpit, the cool, rapid soap in his left hand. At his armpit, Bantam Lyon's voice and hand said, Hello, Bloom. What's the best news? Is that today's? Show us a minute. Shaved off his moustache again by Jove. Long, cold upper lip. To look younger. He does look balmy. Younger than I am. Bantam Lyons's yellow, black-nailed fingers unrolled the baton. Wants a wash, too. Take off the rough dirt. Good morning. Have you used Pear's soap? Dandruff on his shoulders. Scalp wants oiling. I want to see about that French horse that's running today, Bantam Lyons said. Where the bugger is it? He rustled the pleated pages, jerking his chin on his high collar. Barber's itch. Tight collar, he'll lose his hair. Better leave him the paper and get shut of him. You can keep it, Mr. Bloom said. Ascot, gold cup. Wait, Bantam Lyons muttered. Half a mo, maximum the second. I was just going to throw it away, Mr. Bloom said. Bantam Lyons raised his eyes suddenly and leered weakly. "'What's that?' his sharp voice said. "'I say, you can keep it,' Mr. Bloom answered. "'I was going to throw it away that moment.' Bantam Lyons doubted an instant, leering, then thrust the outspread sheets back on Mr. Bloom's arms. "'I'll risk it,' he said. "'Here, thanks.' He sped off towards Conway's corner. "'God speed, scut!' Mr. Bloom folded the sheets again to a neat square and lodged the soap in it, smiling. Silly lips of that chap. Betting. Regular hotbed of it lately. Messenger boys stealing to put on sixpence. Raffle for large tender turkey. Your Christmas dinner for threepence. Jack Fleming embezzling to gamble, then smuggled off to America. Keeps a hotel now. They never come back. Flesh pots of Egypt. He walked cheerfully towards the mosque of the baths. Remind you of a mosque? Red-baked bricks, the minarets. College sports today, I see. He eyed the horseshoe poster over the gate of College Park. Cyclists doubled up like a cod in a pot. Damn bad ad. Now, if they had made it round like a wheel, then the spokes. Sports, sports, sports. And the hub, big, college. Something to catch the eye. There's Hornblower standing at the porter's lodge. Keep him on hands. Might take a turn in there on the nod. How do you do, Mr. Hornblower? How do you do, sir? Heavenly weather, really. If life was always like that. Cricket weather. Sit around under sunshades. Over after over. Out! They can't play it here. 
duck for six wickets. Still, Captain Buller broke a window in the Kildare Street Club with a slog to square leg. Donny brought fair more in their line. And the skulls we were a-cracking when McCarthy took the floor. Heat wave won't last. Always passing the stream of life, which in the stream of life we trace is dearer than them all. Enjoy a bath now, clean trough of water, cool enamel, the gentle tepid stream. This is my body. He foresaw his pale body reclined in it at full, naked, in a womb of warmth, oiled by scented melting soap, softly laved. He saw his drunken limbs rip-rippled over and sustained, buoyed lightly upward, lemon-yellow, his navel bud of flesh, and saw the dark tangled curls of his bush floating, floating hair of the stream round the limp father of thousands, a languid floating flower. End of section 6「Section 7 of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Part 2. The Odyssey. Episode 6. Hades. Part 1. Martin Cunningham first poked his silk-hatted head into the creaking carriage and, entering deftly, seated himself. Mr. Power stepped in after him, curving his height with care. "'Come on, Simon!' "'After you,' Mr. Bloom said. Mr. Dedalus covered himself quickly and got in, saying, "'Yes, yes.' "'Are we all here now?' Martin Cunningham asked. "'Come along, Bloom.' Mr. Bloom entered and sat in the vacant place. He pulled the door to after him and slammed it tight till it shut tight. He passed an arm through the arm strap and looked seriously from the open carriage window at the lowered blinds of the avenue. One dragged aside, an old woman peeping, nose white flattened against the pane. Thanking her stars, she was passed over. Extraordinary the interest they take in a corpse. Glad to see us go, we give them such trouble coming. Job seems to suit them, hug a mugger in corners, slop about in slipper-slappers for fear he'd wake, then getting it ready, laying it out, Molly and Mrs. Fleming making the bed, put it more to your side, our winding-sheet, never know who will touch you dead, wash and shampoo, I believe they clip the nails and the hair, keep a bit in an envelope grow all the same after. Unclean job. All waited. Nothing was said. Stowing in the wreaths, probably. I'm sitting on something hard. Ah, that soap in my hip pocket. Better shift it out of that. Wait for an opportunity. All waited. Then wheels were heard from in front, turning, then nearer, then horses' hoofs. A jolt. Their carriage began to move, creaking and swaying, other hoofs and creaking wheels started behind. The blinds of the avenue passed, and number nine, with its crape knocker, door ajar, at walking pace. They waited still, their knees jogging, till they had turned and were passing along the tram tracks. Tritonville Road, quicker. The wheels rattled, rolling over the cobbled causeway, and the crazy glasses shook, rattling in the door frames. "'What way is he taking us?' Mr. Power asked through both windows. "'Irish Town,' Martin Cunningham said. "'Rings End, Brunswick Street.' Mr. Dedalus nodded, looking out. "'That's a fine old custom,' he said. "'I'm glad to see it has not died out.' All watched a while through their windows, caps and hats lifted by passers. Respect. The carriage swerved from the tram-track to the smoother road past Watery Lane, Mr. Bloom, at gaze, saw a lithe young man, clad in mourning, a wide hat. "'There's a friend of yours gone by, Dedalus,' he said. "'Who is that? Your son and heir. Where is he?' Mr. Dedalus said, stretching over across. 
the carriage passing the open drains and mounds of ripped-up roadway before the tenement houses lurched round the corner and swerving back to the tram-track rolled on noisily with chattering wheels mr dedalus fell back saying was that mulligan cad with him his fidus arcates no mr bloom said he was alone down with his aunt sally i suppose mr dedalus said the golding faction the drunken little cost drawer and chrissy papa's little lump of dung the wise child that knows her own father mr bloom smiled joylessly on rings end road wallace bross the bottle works dodder bridge richie golding and the legal bag golding collis and ward he calls the firm his jokes are getting a bit damp great card he was waltzing in stamer street with ignatius gallagher on a sunday morning the landlady's two hats pinned on his head out on the rampage all night beginning to tell on him now that backache of his i fear wife ironing his back thinks he'll cure it with pills all breadcrumbs they are about six hundred per cent profit he's in with a low-down crowd mr dedalus snarled that mulligan is a contaminated bloody double-dyed ruffian by all accounts his name stinks all over dublin but with the help of god and his blessed mother i'll make it my business to write a letter one of those days to his mother or his aunt or whatever she is that will open her eye as wide as a gate i'll tickle his catastrophe believe you me he cried above the clatter of the wheels i won't have a bastard of a nephew ruin my son the counter jumper's son selling tapes in my cousin peter paul mcswiney's not likely he ceased mr bloom glanced from his angry moustache to mr power's mild face and martin cunningham's eyes and beard gravely shaking noisy self-willed man full of his son he is right something to hand on if little rudy had lived see him grow up hear his voice in the house walking beside molly in an eton suit my son me in his eyes strange feeling it would be from me just a chance must have been that morning in raymond terrace she was at the window watching the two dogs at it by the wall of the cease to do evil and the sergeant grinning up she had that cream gown on with the rip she never stitched give us a touch poldy god i'm dying for it how life begins got big then had to refuse the greystones concert my son inside her i could have helped him on in life i could make him independent learn german too are we late mr power asked ten minutes martin cunningham said looking at his watch molly milly same thing watered down her tomboy oaths oh jumping jupiter ye gods and little fishes still she's a dear girl soon be a woman mullingar dearest papley young student yes yes a woman too life life the carriage heeled over and back their four trunks swaying corney might have given us a more commodious yoke mr power said he might mr dedalus said if he hadn't that squint troubling him do you follow me he closed his left eye martin cunningham began to brush away crust crumbs from under his thighs what is this he said in the name of god crumbs someone seems to have been making a picnic party here lately mr power said all raised their thighs eyed with disfavour the mildewed buttonless leather of the seats mr dedalus twisting his nose frowned downward and said unless i'm greatly mistaken what do you think martin it struck me too martin cunningham said mr bloom set his thigh down glad i took that bath feel my feet quite clean but i wish mrs fleming had darned these socks better mr dedalus sighed resignedly after all he said it's the most natural thing in the world did tom kernan turn up martin cunningham asked twirling the peak of his beard gently yes mr bloom answered he's behind with ned lambert and hines and corney kelleher himself mr power asked at the cemetery martin cunningham said i met mccoy this morning mr bloom said he said he'd try to come the carriage halted short what's wrong we're stopped where are we 
Mr. Bloom put his head out of the window. The Grand Canal, he said. Gasworks. Hooping cough, they say it cures. Good job Millie never got it. Poor children. Doubles them up, black and blue in convulsions. Shame, really. Got off lightly with illness compared. Only measles. Flaxseed tea. Scarlatina. Influenza epidemics. Canvassing for death. Don't miss this chance. Dog's home over there. Poor old Athos. Be good to Athos, Leopold. Is my last wish. Thy will be done. We obey them in the grave. A dying scrawl. He took it to heart, pined away. Quiet brute. Old men's dogs usually are. A raindrop spat on his hat. He drew back and saw an instant of shower-spray dots over the grey flags. A part. Curious like through a calendar. I thought it would. My boots were creaking. I remember now. The weather is changing, he said quietly. A pity it did not keep up fine, Martin Cunningham said. Wanted for the country, Mr. Power said. There's the sun again coming out. Mr. Dedalus, peering through his glasses towards the veiled sun, hurled a mute curse at the sky. It's as uncertain as a child's bottom, he said. We're off again. The carriage turned again its stiff wheels, and their trunks swayed gently. Martin Cunningham twirled more quickly the peak of his beard. Tom Kernan was immense last night, he said, and Paddy Leonard taking him off to his face. Oh, draw him out, Martin, Mr. Power said eagerly. Wait till you hear him, Simon, on Ben Dollard singing of the croppy boy. Immense, Martin Cunningham said pompously. His singing of that simple ballad, Martin, is the most trenchant rendering I ever heard in the whole course of my experience. Trenchant, Mr. Power said, laughing. He's dead nuts on that. And the retrospective arrangement. Did you read Dan Dawson's speech? Martin Cunningham asked. I did not then, Mr. Dedalus said. Where is it? In the paper this morning. Mr. Bloom took the paper from his inside pocket. That book I must change for her. No, no, Mr. Dedalus said quickly. Later on, please. Mr. Bloom's glance travelled down the edge of the paper, scanning the deaths. Callan, Coleman, Dignam, Fawcett, Lowry, Nauman, Peak. What peak is that? Is it the chap was in Crosby and Alleyne's? No. Sexton, Erbright. Inked characters fast fading on the frayed, breaking paper. Thanks to the little flower, sadly missed, to the inexpressible grief of his, aged eighty-eight after a long and tedious illness. Months, mind. Quinlan, on whose soul sweet Jesus have mercy. It is now a month since dear Henry fled to his home up above in the sky, while his family weeps and mourns his loss, hoping some day to meet him on high. I tore up the envelope. Yes. Where did I put her letter after I read it in the bath? He patted his waistcoat pocket. There, all right. Dear Henry fled, before my patients are exhausted. National School, Meads Yard. The Hazard. Only two there now. Nodding. Full as a tick. Too much bone in their skulls. The other trotting round with a fare. An hour ago I was passing there. The Jarvis raised their hats. A pointsman's back straightened itself upright suddenly against a tramway standard by Mr. Bloom's window. Couldn't they invent something automatic so that the wheel itself, much handier? Well, but that fellow would lose his job then. Well, but then another fellow would get a job making the new invention. Ancient concert rooms. Nothing on there. A man in a buff suit with a crepe armlet. Not much grief there. Quarter morning. People in law, perhaps. They went past the bleak pulpit of St. Mark's, under the railway bridge, past the Queen's Theatre, in silence. Hoardings. Eugene Stratton. Mrs. Bandman Palmer. Could I go to see Leah tonight, I wonder? I said I. Or the Lily of Killarney. Elster Grimes, Opera Company. Big, powerful change. Wet, bright bills for next week. Fun on the Bristol. Martin Cunningham could work a pass for the gaiety. Have to stand a drink or two. As broad as it's long. 
He's coming in the afternoon. Her songs. Plastos. Sir Philip Crampton's Memorial Fountain Bust. Who was he? How do you do, Martin Cunningham said, raising his palm to his brow in salute. He doesn't see us, Mr. Power said. Yes, he does. How do you do? Who? Mr. Deedless asked. Blazes Boylan, Mr. Power said. There he is, airing his quiff. Just that moment I was thinking, Mr. Deedless bent across to salute. From the door of the red bank the white disc of a straw hat flashed reply, passed. Mr. Bloom reviewed the nails of his left hand, then those of his right hand. The nails, yes. Is there anything more in him that they, she sees? Fascination. Worst man in Dublin. That keeps him alive. They sometimes feel what a person is. Instinct. But a type like that. My nails. I'm just looking at them. Well paired. And after, thinking alone. Body getting a bit softy. I would notice that from remembering. What causes that? I suppose the skin can't contract quickly enough when the flesh falls off. But the shape is there. The shape is there still. Shoulders, hips, plump. Night of the dance, dressing. Shift stuck between the cheeks behind. He clasped his hands between his knees and, satisfied, sent his vacant glance over their faces. Mr. Power asked, How is the concert tour getting on, Bloom? Oh, very well, Mr. Bloom said. I hear great accounts of it. It's a good idea, you see. Are you going yourself? Well, no, Mr. Bloom said. In point of fact, I have to go down to the County Clare on some private business. You see, the idea is to tour the chief towns. What you lose on one, you can make up on the other. Quite so, Martin Cunningham said. Mary Anderson is up there now. Have you good artists? Lewis Werner is touring her, Mr. Bloom said. Oh yes, we'll have all the top nobbers. J.C. Doyle and John McCormack, I hope, and the best, in fact. And Madame, Mr. Power said, smiling, last but not least. Mr. Bloom unclasped his hands in a gesture of soft politeness and clasped them. Smith O'Brien. Someone has laid a bunch of flowers there. Woman, must be his death day. For many happy returns. The carriage, wheeling by Farrell's statue, united noiselessly their unresisting knees. Oot! A dull-garbed old man from the curbstone tendered his wares, his mouth open. Oot! Four bootlaces for a penny. Wonder why he was struck off the rolls. Had his office in Hume Street, same house as Molly's namesake, Tweedy, Crown Solicitor for Waterford. Has that silk hat ever since? Relics of old decency. Morning, too. Terrible come down, poor wretch. Kicked about like snuff at a wake. O'Callaghan on his last legs. And Madame? Twenty past eleven. Up. Mrs. Fleming is in to clean. Doing her hair. Humming. Voglio e non vorrei. No. Vorrei e non. Looking at the tips of her hairs to see if they are split. Mi trema un poco il beautiful on that tre her voice is weeping tone a thrust a throstle there is a word throstle that expressed that his eyes passed lightly over mr power's good-looking face grayish over the ears madame smiling i smiled back smile goes a long way only politeness perhaps nice fellow who knows is that true about the woman he keeps not pleasant for the wife Yet they say, who was it told me, there is no carnal. You would imagine that would get played out pretty quick. Yes, it was Crofton met him one evening, bringing her a pound of rump steak. What is this she was? Barmaid in juries. Or the Moira, was it? They passed under the huge cloaked liberator's form. Martin Cunningham nudged Mr. Power. Of the tribe of Reuben, he said. A tall, black-bearded figure bent on a stick, stumping round the corner of Elvery's elephant house, showed them a curved hand open on his spine. In all his pristine beauty, Mr. Power said. Mr. Dedalus looked after the stumping figure and said mildly, The devil break the hasp of your back. Mr. Power, collapsing in laughter, shaded his face from the window as the carriage passed Gray's statue. 
"'We've all been there,' Martin Cunningham said broadly. His eyes met Mr. Bloom's eyes. He caressed his beard, adding, "'Well, nearly all of us.' Mr. Bloom began to speak with a sudden eagerness to his companions' faces. "'That's an awfully good one that's going the rounds about Reuben J and the Sun. "'About the boatman?' Mr. Power asked. "'Yes, isn't it awfully good?' "'What is that?' Mr. Deedless asked. "'I didn't hear it.' "'There was a girl in the case,' Mr. Bloom began, "'and he determined to send him to the Isle of Man out of harm's way, "'but when they were both—' "'What?' Mr. Deedless asked. "'That confirmed bloody hobbledy hoy, is it?' "'Yes,' Mr. Bloom said. "'They were both on the way to the boat, "'and he tried to drown—' "'Drown Barabbas!' Mr. Deedless cried. "'I wish to Christ he did!' Mr. Power sent a long laugh down his shaded nostrils. No, Mr. Bloom said, the son himself. Martin Cunningham thwarted his speech rudely. Reuben J and the son were piking it down the quay next the river on their way to the Isle of Man boat, and the young chiseller suddenly got loose and over the wall with him into the liffey. For God's sake, Mr. Deedless exclaimed in fright, is he dead? Dead? Martin Cunningham cried. Not he. The boatman got a pole and fished him out by the slack of the breeches, and he was landed up to the father on the quay. More dead than alive. Half the town was there. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, but the funny part is, and Reuben J, Martin Cunningham said, gave the boatman a florin for saving his son's life. A stifled sigh came from under Mr. Power's hand. Oh, he did, Martin Cunningham affirmed, like a hero, a silver florin. Isn't it awfully good? Mr. Bloom said eagerly. One and eightpence too much, Mr. Deedless said dryly. Mr. Powers' choked laugh burst quietly in the carriage. Nelson's pillar. Eight plums a penny! Eight for a penny! We had better look a little serious, Martin Cunningham said. Mr. Deedless sighed. And then indeed he said, poor little Paddy wouldn't grudge us a laugh. Many a good one, he told himself. The Lord forgive me, Mr. Power said, wiping his wet eyes with his fingers. Poor Paddy. I little thought a week ago when I saw him last, and he was in his usual health, that I'd be driving after him like this. He's gone from us. As decent a little man as ever wore a hat, Mr. Deedless said. He went very suddenly. Breakdown, Martin Cunningham said. Heart. He tapped his chest sadly. Blazing face. Red hot. Too much John Barleycorn. Cure for a red nose. Drink like the devil till it turns adelite. A lot of money he spent colouring it. Mr. Power gazed at the passing houses with rueful apprehension. He had a sudden death, poor fellow, he said. The best death, Mr. Bloom said. Their wide open eyes looked at him. No suffering, he said. A moment and all is over, like dying in sleep. No one spoke. Dead side of the street, this. Dull business by day. Land agents. Temperance Hotel. Falconer's Railway Guide. Civil Service College. Gills. Catholic Club. The Industrious Blind. Why? Some reason. Sun or wind. At night, too. Chummies and slavies. Under the patronage of the late Father Matthew. Foundation stone for Parnell. Breakdown. Heart. White horses with white front-lit plumes came round the rotunda corner, galloping. A tiny coffin flashed by, in a hurry to bury. A mourning coach, unmarried, black for the married, piebald for bachelors, done for a nun. Sad, Martin Cunningham said, a child. A dwarf's face, mauve and wrinkled like little Rudy's was. Dwarf's body, weak as putty, in a white-lined deal box. Burial friendly society pays penny a week for a sod of turf. Hour, little, beggar, baby. Meant nothing, mistake of nature. If it's healthy, it's from the mother. If not, the man. Better luck next time. Poor little thing, Mr. Deedless said. It's well out of it. The carriage climbed more slowly the hill of Rutland Square. Rattle his bones over the stones. Only a pauper nobody owns. In the midst of life, Martin Cunningham said, but the worst of all, Mr. Power said, is the man who takes his own life. Martin Cunningham drew out his watch briskly, coughed, and put it back. 
the greatest disgrace to have in the family mr power added temporary insanity of course martin cunningham said decisively we must take a charitable view of it they say a man who does it is a coward mr dedalus said it is not for us to judge martin cunningham said mr bloom about to speak closed his lips again martin cunningham's large eyes looking away now sympathetic human man he is intelligent like shakespeare's face always a good word to say they have no mercy on that here or infanticide refuse christian burial they used to drive a stake of wood through his heart in the grave as if it wasn't broken already yet sometimes they repent too late found in the river bed clutching rushes he looked at me and that awful drunkard of a wife of his setting up house for her time after time and then pawning the furniture on him every saturday almost leading him the life of the damned wear the heart out of a stone that monday morning start afresh shoulder to the wheel lord she must have looked a sight that night deedless told me he was in there drunk about the place and capering with martin's umbrella and they call me the jewel of asia of asia the geisha he looked away from me he knows rattle his bones that afternoon of the inquest the red labelled bottle on the table the room in the hotel with hunting pictures stuffy it was sunlight through the slats of the venetian blinds the coroner's ears big and hairy boots giving evidence thought he was asleep first then saw like yellow streaks on his face had slipped down to the foot of the bed verdict overdose death by misadventure the letter for my son leopold no more pain wait no more nobody owns the carriage rattled swiftly along blessington street over the stones we are going the pace i think martin cunningham said god grant he doesn't upset us on the road mr power said well, i hope not martin cunningham said that will be a great race tomorrow in germany the gordon bennett yes by jove mr dedalus said that will be worth seeing faith as they turned into berkeley street a street organ near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking rattling song of the halls has anybody here seen kelly k e double l y dead march from saul he's as bad as old antonio left me on my ownio pirouette the mater misericordiae eccles street my house down there big place ward for incurables there very encouraging our lady's hospice for the dying dead house handy underneath where old mrs riordan died they looked terrible the women her feeding cup and rubbing her mouth with the spoon then the screen round her bed for her to die nice young student that was dressed that bite the bee gave me he's gone over to the lying in hospital they told me from one extreme to the other the carriage galloped round the corner stopped what's wrong now a divided drove of branded cattle passed the windows lowing slouching by on padded hoofs whisking their tails slowly on their clotted bony croups outside them and through them ran rattled sheep bleating their fear emigrants mr power said ah the drover's voice cried his switch sounding on their flanks ah out of that thursday of course tomorrow is killing day springers cuff sold them about twenty seven quid each for liverpool probably roast beef for old england they buy up all the juicy ones and then the fifth quarter is lost all that raw stuff hide hair horns comes to a big things in a year dead meat trade by products of the slaughter-house for tanneries soap margarine wonder if that dodge works now getting dicky meat off the train at clonsilla the carriage moved on through the drove i can't make out why the corporation doesn't run a tram line from the park gate to the quays mr bloom said all those animals could be taken in trucks down to the boats instead of blocking up the thoroughfare martin cunningham said quite right they ought to yes mr bloom said and another thing i often thought is to have municipal funeral trams like they have in milan you know run the line out to the cemetery gates and have special trams hearse and carriage and all don't you see what i mean oh that be damn for a story mr dedalus said pullman car and saloon dining room 
A poor lookout for Corney, Mr. Power added. Why, Mr. Bloom asked, turning to Mr. Dedalus, wouldn't it be more decent than galloping two abreast? Well, there's something in that, Mr. Dedalus granted. And, Martin Cunningham said, we wouldn't have scenes like that when the hearse capsized round Dumphy's and upset the coffin onto the road. That was terrible, Mr. Power's shocked face said, and the corpse fell about the road. Terrible. First round Dumphy's, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding. Gordon Bennett Cup. Praises be to God, Martin Cunningham said piously. Boom, upset. A coffin bumped out onto the road, burst open. Paddy Dignam shot out and rolling over, stiff in the dust, in a brown habit too large for him. Red face, grey now. Mouth fallen open, asking, what's up now? Quite right to close it. Looks horrid open. Then the insides decompose quickly. Much better to close up all the orifices. Yes, also, with wax. The sphincter loose. Seal up all. Dumphy's, Mr. Power announced as the carriage turned right. Dumphy's corner. Morning coaches drawn up, drowning their grief. A pause by the wayside. Tip-top position for a pub. Expect we'll pull up here on the way back to drink his health. Pass round the consolation. Elixir of life. But suppose now it did happen. Would he bleed if a nail, say, cut him in the knocking about? He would, and he wouldn't, I suppose. Depends on where. The circulation stops. Still, some might ooze out of an artery. It would be better to bury them in red, a dark red. In silence they drove along Fibsborough Road. An empty hearse trotted by, coming from the cemetery. Looks relieved. Cross Guns Bridge, the Royal Canal. Water rushed, roaring through the sluices. A man stood on his dropping barge between clamps of turf. On the towpath by the lock, a slag-tethered horse, aboard of the bugaboo. Their eyes watched him. On the slow, weedy waterway, he had floated on his raft coastward over Ireland, drawn by a haulage rope past beds of reeds, over slime, mud-choked bottles, carrion dogs. Athlone, Mullingar, Moy Valley. I could make a walking tour to see Millie by the canal, or cycle down. Hire oh, some old crock. Safety. Wren had one the other day at the auction for the ladies. Developing waterways. James McCann's hobby to row me o'er the ferry. Cheaper transit. By easy stages. Houseboats. Camping out. Also hearses. To heaven by water. Perhaps I will without writing. Come as a surprise. Link slip. Clonsilla. Dropping down lock by lock to Dublin. With turf from the Midland bogs. Salute. He lifted his brown straw hat. Saluting Paddy Dignam. They drove on past Brian Boru's house. Near it now. I wonder how is our friend Fogarty getting on, Mr. Power said. Better ask Tom Kernan, Mr. Dedalus said. How is that? Martin Cunningham said. Left him weeping, I suppose. Though lost to sight, Mr. Dedalus said. To memory, dear. The carriage steered left for Finglass Road. The stonecutter's yard on the right. Last lap. Crowded on the spit of land, silent shapes appeared, white, sorrowful, holding out calm hands, knelt in grief, pointing, fragments of shapes, hewn, in white silence, appealing, the best obtainable. Thomas H. Denany, monumental builder and sculptor. Past. On the curbstone before Jimmy Geary, the sextons, an old tramp sat, grumbling, emptying the dirt and stones out of his huge, dust-brown, yawning boot, after a life's journey. Gloomy gardens then went by, one by one, gloomy houses. Mr. Power pointed. That is where Chards was murdered, he said. The last house. So it is, Mr. Dedalus said. A gruesome case. Seymour Bush got him off. Murdered his brother, or so they said. The Crown had no evidence, Mr. Power said. Only circumstantial, Martin Cunningham said. That's the maxim of the law. Better for ninety-nine guilty to escape than for one innocent person to be wrongfully condemned. They looked. Murderer's ground. It passed darkly. Shattered, tenantless, unweeded garden. Whole place gone to hell. Wrongfully condemned. Murder. The murderer's image in the eye of the murdered. 
I love reading about it. Man's head found in a garden. Her clothing consisted of how she met her death, recent outrage, the weapon used, murderer is still at large, clues, a shoelace, the body to be exhumed, murder will out. Cramped in this carriage. She mightn't like me to come that way without letting her know. Must be careful about women. Catch them once with their pants down. Never forgive you after. Fifteen. The high railings of prospects rippled past their gaze. Dark poplars, rare white forms, forms more frequent, white shapes thronged amid the trees, white forms and fragments streaming by mutely, sustaining vain gestures on the air. The felly harshed against the curbstone, stopped. Martin Cunningham put out his arm and, wrenching back the handle, shoved the door open with his knee. He stepped out. Mr. Power and Mr. Deedless followed. Change that soap now. Mr. Bloom's hand unbuttoned his hip pocket swiftly and transferred the paper-stuck soap to his inner handkerchief pocket. He stepped out of the carriage, replacing the newspaper his other hand still held. Paltry funeral, coach and three carriages. It's all the same. Pallbearers, gold reins, requiem mass, firing a volley, pomp of death. Behind the hind carriage a hawker stood by his barrow of cakes and fruit. Simnel cakes, those are, stuck together, cakes for the dead. Dog biscuits. Who ate them? Mourners coming out. He followed his companions. Mr. Kernan and Ned Lambert followed. Hines walking after them. Corney Kelleher stood by the opened hearse and took out the two wreaths. He handed one to the boy. Where is that child's funeral disappeared to? The team of horses passed from Finglass with toiling, plodding tread, dragging through the funereal silence a creaking wagon on which lay a granite block. The wagoner marching at their head saluted. Coffin now. Got here before us. Dead as he is. Horse looking round at it with his plume skew-ways. Dull eye. Collar tight on his neck. Pressing on a blood vessel or something. Do they know what they cart out here every day? Must be twenty or thirty funerals every day. Then Mount Jerome for the Protestants. Funerals all over the world, everywhere, every minute. Shoveling them under by the cartload, double quick. Thousands every hour. Too many in the world. End of section seven. Section 8 of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Part 2 The Odyssey. Episode 6 Hades. Part 2. Mourners came out through the gates. Woman and a girl. Lean-jawed harpy, hard woman at a bargain, her bonnet awry, girl's face stained with dirt and tears, holding the woman's arm, looking up at her for a sign to cry, fish's face, bloodless and livid. The mutes shouldered the coffin and bore it in through the gates, so much dead weight. Felt heavier myself stepping out of that bath, first the stiff, then the friends of the stiff. Corny Kelleher and the boy followed with their wreaths, who is that beside them? Ah, the brother-in-law. All walked after. Martin Cunningham whispered, I was in mortal agony with you talking of suicide before Bloom. What? Mr. Power whispered. How so? His father poisoned himself, Martin Cunningham whispered. Had the Queen's Hotel in Ennis. You heard him say he was going to Clare. Anniversary. Oh, God, Mr. Power whispered. First I heard of it poisoned himself he glanced behind him to where a face with dark thinking eyes followed towards the cardinal's mausoleum speaking what's he insured mr bloom asked i believe so mr kernan answered but the policy was heavily mortgaged martin is trying to get the youngster into artain how many children did he leave five ned lambert says he'll try to get one of the girls into todd's a sad case Mr. Bloom said gently. 
five young children. A great blow to the poor wife, Mr. Kernan added. Indeed, yes, Mr. Bloom agreed. Has the laugh at him now. He looked down at the boots he had blacked and polished. She had outlived him, lost her husband. More dead for her than for me. One must outlive the other. Wise men say, there are more women than men in the world. Condole with her. Your terrible loss. I hope you'll soon follow him. For Hindu widows only. She would marry another. Him? No. Yet who knows after? Widowhood not the thing since the old queen died. Drawn on a gun carriage. Victoria and Albert. Frogmore Memorial Morning. But in the end she put a few violets in her bonnet. Vain in her heart of hearts. All for a shadow. Consort not even a king. Her son was the substance. Something new to hope for. Not like the past she wanted back. Waiting. It never comes. One must go first, alone under the ground, and lie no more in her warm bed. How are you, Simon? Ned Lambert said softly, clasping hands. Haven't seen you for a month of Sundays. Never better. How are all in Cork's own town? I was down there for the Cork Park races on Easter Monday, Ned Lambert said. Same old six and eightpence. Stopped with Dick Tyvey. And how is Dick, the solid man? Nothing between himself and heaven, Ned Lambert answered. By the holy Paul, Mr. Deedless said in subdued wonder. Dick Tyvey, bald. Martin is going to get a whip up for the youngsters, Ned Lambert said, pointing ahead. A few bob a skull, just to keep them going till the insurance is cleared up. Yes, yes, Mr. Deedless said dubiously. Is that the eldest boy in front? Yes, Ned Lambert said, with the wife's brother. John Henry Menton is behind. He put down his name for a quid. I'll engage he did, Mr. Deedless said. I often told poor Paddy he ought to mind that job. John Henry is not the worst in the world. How did he lose it? Ned Lambert asked. Liquor? What? Many a good man's fault, Mr. Deedless said with a sigh. They halted about the door of the mortuary chapel. Mr. Bloom stood behind the boy with the wreath, looking down at his sleek combed hair and the slender furrowed neck inside its brand new collar. Poor boy! Was he there when the father, both unconscious, lighten up at the last moment and recognise for the last time all he might have done? I owe three shillings to O'Grady. Would he understand? The mutes bore the coffin into the chapel. Which end is his head? After a moment he followed the others in, blinking in the screened light. The coffin lay on its bier before the chancel, four tall yellow candles at its corners, always in front of us. Corny Kelleher, laying a wreath at each four-corner, beckoned to the boy to kneel. The mourners knelt here and there, in praying desks. Mr. Bloom stood behind near the font, and, when all had knelt, dropped carefully his unfolded newspaper from his pocket, and knelt his right knee upon it. He fitted his black hat gently on his left knee, and, holding its brim, bent over piously. A server, bearing a brass bucket with something in it, came out through a door. The white-smocked priest came after him, tidying his stole with one hand, balancing with the other a little book against his toad's belly. "'Who'll read the book?' "'I,' said the rook. They halted by the beer, and the priest began to read out of his book with a fluent croak. Father Coffey. I knew his name was like Coffin. Domine Namine. Bully about the muzzle he looks. Bosses the show. Muscular Christian. Woe betide any one that looks crooked at him. Priest. Thou art Peter. Burst sideways like a sheep in clover, Dedalus says he will. With a belly on him like a poisoned pup. Most amusing expressions that man finds. Hm. <laughs> Burst sideways. Non in tres in judicium cum servo tuo, Domine. Makes them feel more important to be prayed over in Latin. Requiem mass, crepe weepers, black-edged note-paper, your name on the altar list. Chilly place, this. Want to feed well, sitting in there all the morning in the gloom, kicking his heels, waiting for the next, please. Eyes of a toad, too. What swells him up that way? Molly gets swelled after cabbage. Air of the place, maybe. Looks full of bad gas. Must be an infernal lot of bad gas round the place. 
butchers, for instance. They get like raw beefsteaks. Who was telling me? Mervyn Brown. Down in the vaults of St. Werburgh's, lovely old organ, 150, they have to bore a hole in the coffin sometimes to let out the bad gas and burn it. Out it rushes. Blue. One whiff of that and you're a goner. My kneecap is hurting me. Ow! That's better. The priest took a stick with a knob at the end of it, out of the boy's bucket, and shook it over the coffin. Then he walked to the other end and shook it again. Then he came back and put it in the bucket. As you were before you rested. It's all written down. He has to do it. Et ne nos inducas in tentationem. The server piped the answers in the treble. I often thought it would be better to have boy servants, up to fifteen or so. After that, of course. Holy water that was, I expect, shaking the sleep out of it. He must be fed up with that job, shaking that thing over all the corpses they trot up. What harm if he could see what he was shaking it over? Every mortal day a fresh batch. Middle-aged men, old women, children, women dead in childbirth, men with beards, bald-headed businessmen, consumptive girls with little sparrows' breasts. All the year round he prayed the same thing over them all, and shook water on top of them. Sleep. On dignum now. In paradisum. Said he was going to paradise, or is in paradise. Says that over everybody. Tarsome kind of a job. But he has to say something. The priest closed his book and went off, followed by the server. Corny Kelleher opened the side doors, and the gravediggers came in, hoisted the coffin again, carried it out, and shoved it on their cart. Corny Kelleher gave one wreath to the boy, and one to the brother-in-law. All followed them out of the side doors, into the mild grey air. Mr. Bloom came last, folding his paper again into his pocket. He gazed gravely at the ground, till the coffin cart wheeled off to the left. The metal wheels ground the gravel with a sharp, grating cry, and the pack of blunt boots followed the barrow along a lane of sepulchres. The re, the ra, the re, the ra, the roo. Lord, I mustn't lilt here. The O'Connell Circle, Mr. Deedless said about him. Mr. Power's soft eyes went up to the apex of the lofty cone. He's at rest, he said, in the middle of his people, old Dano but his heart is buried in Rome. How many broken hearts are buried here, Simon? Her grave is over there, Jack, Mr. Dealers said. I'll soon be stretched beside her. Let him take me whenever he likes. Breaking down, he began to weep to himself quietly, stumbling a little in his walk. Mr. Power took his arm. She's better where she is, he said kindly. I suppose so, Mr. Dealers said with a weak gasp. I suppose she is in heaven if there is a heaven. Corny Kelleher stepped aside from his rank and allowed the mourners to plod by. Sad occasions, Mr. Kernan began politely. Mr. Bloom closed his eyes and sadly twice bowed his head. The others are putting on their hats, Mr. Kernan said. I suppose we can do so too. We are the last. This cemetery is a treacherous place. They covered their heads. The reverend gentleman read the service too quickly, don't you think? Mr. Kernan said, with reproof. Mr. Bloom nodded bravely, looking in the quick bloodshot eyes. Secret eyes, secret searching eyes. Mason, I think. Not sure. Beside him again, we are the last. In the same boat. Hope he'll say something else. Mr. Kernan added, the service of the Irish church, used in Mount Jerome, is simpler, more impressive, I must say. Mr. Bloom gave prudent assent. The language, of course, was another thing. Mr. Kernan said with solemnity, I am the resurrection and the life. That touches a man's inmost heart. It does, Mr. Bloom said. Your heart, perhaps, but what price the fellow in the six feet by two with his toes to the daisies? No touching that. Seat of the affections, broken heart. A pump, after all, pumping thousands of gallons of blood every day. One fine day it gets bunged up, and there you are. Lots of them lying around here, lungs, hearts, livers. Old rusty pumps, damn the thing else. The resurrection and the life. Once you were dead, you were dead. 
that last day idea knocking them all up out of their graves come forth lazarus and he came fifth and lost the job get up last day then every fellow mousing around for his liver and his lights and the rest of his traps find damn all of himself that morning pennyweight of powder in a skull twelve grams one pennyweight troy measure corny kelleher fell into step at their side everything went off a one he said what he looked on them from his drawling eye policeman's shoulders with your turalum turalum as it should be mr kernan said what eh corny kelleher said mr kernan assured him who is that chap behind with tom kernan john henry menton asked i know his face ned lambert glanced back bloom he said madame marion tweedy that was is i mean the soprano she's his wife oh to be sure john henry menton said i haven't seen her for some time she was a fine-looking woman i danced with her wait fifteen seventeen golden years ago at mac dillon's in round town and a good armful she was he looked behind through the others what is he he asked what does he do wasn't he in the stationary line i fell foul of him one evening i remember at bowls ned lambert smiled yes he was he said in wisdom healy's a traveller for blotting paper in god's name john henry menton said what did she marry a coon like that for she had plenty of game in her then as still ned lambert said he does some canvassing for ads john henry menton's large eyes stared ahead the barrow turned into a side lane a portly man ambushed among the grasses raised his head in homage the gravediggers touched their caps john o'connell mr power said pleased he never forgets a friend mr o'connell shook all their hands in silence mr dedalus said i'm come to pay you another visit my dear simon the caretaker answered in a low voice i don't want your custom at all saluting ned lambert and john henry menton he walked on at martin cunningham's side puzzling two keys at his back did you hear that one he asked them about mulcahy from coombe i did not martin cunningham said they bent their silk hats in concert and hines inclined his ear the caretaker hung his thumbs in the loops of his gold watch-chain and spoke in a discreet tone to their vacant smiles they tell the story he said that two drunks came out here one foggy evening to look for the grave of a friend of theirs they asked for mulcahy from the coombe and were told where he was buried after traipsing about in the fog they found the grave sure enough one of the drunks spelt out the name terence mulcahy the other drunk was blinking up at a statue of our saviour the widow had got put up the caretaker blinked up at one of the sepulchres they passed he resumed and after blinking up at the sacred figure not a bloody bit like the man says he that's not mulcahy says he whoever done it rewarded by smiles he fell back and spoke with corny kelleher accepting the dockets given him turning them over and scanning them as he walked that's all done with a purpose martin cunningham explained to hines i know hines said i know that to cheer a fellow up martin cunningham said it's pure good-heartedness damn the thing else mr bloom admired the caretaker's prosperous bulk all want to be on good terms with him decent fellow john o'connell real good sort keys like keys add no fears of anyone getting out no pass-out checks habeat corpus i must see about that ad after the funeral did i write ballsbridge on the envelope i took to cover when she disturbed me writing to martha hope it's not chucked in the dead letter office be better of a shave grey sprouting beard that's the first sign when the hairs come out grey and temper getting cross silver threads among the grey fancy being his wife wonder how he had the gumption to propose to any girl come out and live in the graveyard dangle that before her it might thrill her first courting death shades of night hovering here with all the dead stretched about the shadows of the tombs when churchyards yawn and daniel o'connell must be a descendant i suppose 
who is this used to say he was queer breedy man great catholic all the same like a big giant in the dark will o the wisp gas of graves want to keep her mind off it to conceive at all women especially are so touchy tell her a ghost story in bed to make her sleep have you ever seen a ghost well i have it was a pitch dark night the clock was on the stroke of twelve still they'd kiss all right if properly keyed up whores in turkish graveyards learn anything if taken young you might pick up a young widow here men like that love among the tombstones romeo spice of pleasure in the midst of death we are in life both ends meet tantalizing for the poor dead smell of grilled beefsteaks to the starving gnawing their vitals desire to grig people molly wanting to do it at the window eight children he has anyway he has seen a fair share go under in his time lying around him field after field holy fields more room if they buried them standing up sitting or kneeling you couldn't standing his head might come up some day above ground in a landslip with his hand pointing all honeycomb the ground must be oblong cells and very neat he keeps it too trim grass and edgings his garden major gamble calls mount jerome well so it is ought to be flowers of sleep chinese cemeteries with giant poppies growing produce the best opium mastiansky told me the botanic gardens are just over there it's the blood sinking in the earth gives new life same idea those jews they said killed the christian boy every man has his price well preserved fat corpse gentleman epicure invaluable for a fruit garden a bargain by carcass of william wilkinson auditor and accountant lately deceased three pounds thirteen and six with thanks i dare say the soil would be quite fat with corpse manure bones flesh nails charnel houses dreadful turning green and pink decomposing rock quick in damp earth the lean old ones tougher then a kind of tallowy kind of a cheesy then begin to get black treacle oozing out of them then dried up death moths of course the cells or whatever they are go on living changing about live forever practically nothing to feed on feed on themselves but they must breed a devil of a lot of maggots soil must be simply swirling with them your head it simply swirls those pretty little seaside girls he looks cheerful enough over it give him a sense of power seeing all the others go under first wonder how he looks at life cracking his jokes too warms the cockles of his heart the one about the bulletin spurgeon went to heaven four a m this morning eleven p m closing time not arrived yet peter the dead themselves the men anyhow would like to hear an odd joke or the women to know what's in fashion a juicy pear or lady's punch hot strong and sweet keep out the damp you must laugh sometimes so better do it that way grave diggers in hamlet shows the profound knowledge of the human heart daren't joke about the dead for two years at least de mortuis nil nisi prius go out of mourning first hard to imagine his funeral seems a sort of a joke read your own obituary notice they say you live longer gives you second wind new lease of life how many have you for tomorrow the caretaker asked two corny keller said half ten and eleven the caretaker put the papers in his pocket the barrow had ceased to trundle the mourners split and moved to each side of the hole stepping with care round the graves the grave diggers bore the coffin and set its nose on the brink looping the bands round it burying him we come to bury caesar his eyes of march or june he doesn't know who is here nor care now who is that lanky looking galoot over there in the mackintosh now who is he i'd like to know now i'd give a trifle to know who he is always someone turns up you never dreamt of a fellow could live on his lonesome all his life yes he could still he'd have to get someone to sod him after he died though he could dig his own grave we all do only man buries no ants too first thing strikes anybody bury the dead 
Say Robinson Crusoe was true to life. Well then, Friday buried him. Every Friday buries a Thursday, if you come to look at it. Oh, poor Robinson Crusoe, how could you possibly do so? Poor Dignam, his last lie on earth in his box. When you think of them all, it does seem a waste of wood, all gnawed through. They could invent a handsome beer with a kind of panel sliding, let it down that way. Aye, but they might object to be buried out of another fellow's. They're so particular. Lay me in my native earth, bit of clay from the holy land. Only a mother and a dead-born child ever buried in the one coffin. I see what it means, I see, to protect him as long as possible, even in the earth. The Irishman's house is his coffin. Embalming in catacombs, mummies, the same idea. Mr. Bloom stood far back, his hat in his hand, counting the bared heads. Twelve. I'm thirteen. No, the chap in the Macintosh is thirteen. Death's number. Where the deuce did he pop out of? He wasn't in the chapel, that I'll swear. Silly superstition, that, about thirteen. Nice soft tweed Ned Lambert has in that suit. Tinge of purple. I had one like that when we lived in Lombard Street West. Dressy fellow he was once. Used to change three suits in the day. Must get that grey suit of mine turned by Messias. Hello, it's died. His wife, I forgot, he's not married, or his landlady ought to have picked out those threads for him. The coffin died out of sight, eased down by the men straddled on the grave trestles. They struggled up and out, and all uncovered. Twenty. Pause. If we were all suddenly somebody else, far away a donkey brayed. Rain. No such ass. Never see a dead one, they say. Shame of death. They hide. Also, poor papa went away. Gentle sweet air blew round the bared heads in a whisper. Whisper. The boy by the grave head held his wreath with both hands, staring quietly in the black open space. Mr. Bloom moved behind the portly, kindly caretaker. Well cut frock coat. Weighing them up, perhaps, to see which will go next. Well, it is a long rest. Feel no more. It's the moment you feel. Must be damned unpleasant. Can't believe it at first. Mistake must be. Someone else. Try the house opposite. Wait, I wanted to. I haven't yet. Then the darkened death chamber. Light they want. Whispering around you. Would you like to see a priest? Then rambling and wandering. Delirium all you hid all your life. The death struggle. His sleep is not natural. Press the lower eyelid. Watching, is his nose pointed? Is his jaw sinking? Are the soles of his feet yellow? Pull the pillow away and finish it off on the floor, since he's doomed. Devil in that picture of sinner's death, showing him a woman, dying to embrace her in his shirt. Last act of Lucia. Shall I never more behold thee? Bam! Expires. Gone at last. People talk about you a bit forget you. Don't forget to pray for him. Remember him in your prayers. Even Parnell. Ivy Day dying out. Then they follow, dropping into a hole one after the other. We are praying now for the repose of his soul. Hoping you're well and not in hell. Nice change of air. Out of the frying pan of life into the fire of purgatory. Does he ever think of the hole waiting for himself? They say you do when you shiver in the sun. Someone walking over it. Call boy's warning. Near you. Mine over there towards Finglass. The plot I bought. Mamma, poor mamma, and little Rudy. The grave diggers took up their spades and flung heavy clods of clay in on the coffin. Mr. Bloom turned his face. And if he was alive all the time. Phew, by jingo, that would be awful. No, no, he is dead, of course. Of course he is dead. Monday he died. They ought to have some law to pierce the heart and make sure, or an electric clock or a telephone in the coffin, and some kind of canvas air hole. Flag of distress. Three days. Rather long to keep them in summer. Just as well to get shut of them as soon as you are sure there's no... The clay fell softer. Begin to be forgotten. Out of sight, out of mind. The caretaker moved away a few paces and put on his hat. Had enough of it. 
the mourners took heart of grace, one by one, covering themselves without show. Mr. Bloom put on his hat, and saw the portly figure make its way deftly through the maze of graves. Quietly, sure of his ground, he traversed the dismal fields. Hines jotting down something in his notebook. Ah, the names! But he knows them all. No, coming to me. I'm just taking the names, Hines said, below his breath. What is your Christian name? I'm not sure. L, Mr. Bloom said, Leopold. And you might put down McCoy's name, too. He asked me to. Charlie, Hines said, writing. I know. He was on the Freeman once. So he was, before he got his job in the morgue under Louis Byrne. Good idea, a post-mortem for doctors. Find out what they imagine they know. He died of a Tuesday. Got the run. Levanted with the cash of a few ads. Charlie, you're my darling. That was why he asked me to. Oh, well, does no harm. I saw to that, McCoy. Thanks, old chap. Much obliged. Leave him under an obligation. Costs nothing. And tell us, Hines said, do you know that fellow in the... fellow was over there in the... He looked round. Mackintosh? Yes, I saw him, Mr. Bloom said. Where is he now? Mackintosh, Hines said, scribbling. I don't know who he is. Is that his name? He moved away, looking about him. No, Mr. Bloom began, turning round. I say, Hines! Didn't hear. What? Where has he disappeared to? Not a sign. Well, of all the... Has anybody here seen K E double L become invisible? Good Lord, what became of him? A seventh grave digger came beside Mr. Bloom to take up an idle spade. Oh, excuse me. He stepped aside nimbly. Clay, brown, damp, began to be seen in the hole. It rose. Nearly over, a mound of damp clods rose more, rose, and the grave diggers rested their spades all uncovered again for a few instants. The boy propped his wreath against a corner, the brother-in-law his on a lump. The grave-diggers put on their caps and carried their earthy spades towards the barrow. They knocked the blades lightly on the turf, clean. One bent to pluck from the haft a long tuft of grass. One, leaving his mates, walked slowly on with shouldered weapon, its blade blue-glancing. Silently, at the gravehead, another coiled the coffin band, his navel cord. The brother-in-law, turning away, placed something in his free hand. Thanks in silence. Sorry, sir. Trouble. Head shake. I know that. For yourselves, just. The mourners moved away slowly, without aim, by devious paths, staying a while to read a name on a tomb. Let us go round by the chief's grave, Hines said. We have time. Let us, Mr. Power said. They turned to the right, following their slow thoughts. With awe, Mr. Power's blank voice spoke. Some say he's not in that grave at all, that the coffin was filled with stones, that one day he will come again. Hines shook his head. Parnell will never come again, he said. He's there, all that was mortal of him. Peace to his ashes. Mr. Bloom walked unheeded along his grove, by saddened angels, crosses, broken pillars, family vaults, stone hopes, praying with upcast eyes, old Ireland's hearts and hands. More sensible to spend the money on some charity for the living. Pray for the repose of the soul of... Does anybody, really? Plant him and have done with him, light down a coal chute, then lump them together to save time, all souls' day. Twenty-seventh, I'll be at his grave. Ten shillings for the gardener. He keeps it free of weeds. Old man himself, bent down double with his shears, clipping, near death's door. Who passed away, who departed this life, as if they did it of their own accord, got the shove, all of them. Who kicked the bucket, more interesting if they told you what they were, so-and-so, wheelwright. I travelled for court lino. I paid five shillings in the pound, or a woman's with her saucepan. I cooked good Irish stew. Eulogy in a country churchyard it ought to be. That poem of, whose is it, Wordsworth or Thomas Campbell? Entered into rest, the Protestants put it, old Dr. Murrins. The great physician called him home. Well, it's God's acre for them. 
nice country residence, newly plastered and painted, ideal spot to have a quiet smoke and read the church times. Marriage ads they never try to beautify, rusty wreaths hung on knobs, garlands of bronze foil, better value that for the money. Still, the flowers are more poetical, the other gets rather tiresome, never withering, expresses nothing, immortel. A bird sat tamely perched on a poplar branch, light stuffed, like the wedding present Alderman Hooper gave us. <laughs> Not a budge out of him. Knows there are no catapults to let fly at him. Dead animal even sadder. Silly Milly burying the little dead bird in the kitchen matchbox, a daisy chain and bits of broken chainies on the grave. The sacred heart, that is, showing it, heart on his sleeve. Ought to be sideways and red it should be, painted like a real heart. Ireland was dedicated to it, or whatever, that. Seems anything but pleased. Why, this infliction. Would birds come then and peck, like the boy with a basket of fruit? But he said no, because they ought to have been afraid of the boy. Apollo, that was. How many! All these here once walked round Dublin, faithful departed. As you are now, so once were we. Besides, how could you remember everybody? Eyes, walk, voice. Well, a voice, yes. Gramophone. Have a gramophone in every grave, or keep it in the house. After dinner on a Sunday, put on poor old great-grandfather. Hello, hello, hello. I'm awfully glad. Awfully glad to see her again. Hello, hello. I'm off. Remind you of the voice, like the photograph reminds you of the face. Otherwise you couldn't remember the face after fifteen years, say. For instance, who? For instance, some fellow that died when I was in Wisdom Healy's. A rattle of pebbles. Wait, stop. He looked down intently into a stone crypt. Some animal. Wait, there he goes. An obese grey rat toddled along the side of the crypt, moving the pebbles. An old stager. Great-grandfather. He knows the ropes. The grey alive crushed itself in under the plinth, wriggled itself in under it. Good hiding place for treasure. Who lives there? I laid the remains of Robert Emery. Robert Emmett was buried here by torchlight, wasn't he? Making his rounds. Tail gone now. One of those chaps would make short work of a fellow. Pick the bones clean, no matter who it was. Ordinary meat for them. A corpse's meat gone bad. Well, and what's cheese? Corpse of milk. I read in that Voyages in China that the Chinese say a white man smells like a corpse. Cremation better. Priests dead against it. Devilling for the other firm. Wholesale burners and Dutch oven dealers. Time of the plague. Quicklime fever pits to eat them. Lethal chamber. Ashes to ashes. Or bury at sea. Where is that Parsi Tower of Silence? Eaten by birds. Earth, fire, water. Drowning, they say, is the pleasantest. See your whole life in a flash. But being brought back to life, no. Can't bury in the air, however. Out of a flying machine. Wonder, does the news go about whenever a fresh one is let down? Underground communication. We learnt that from them. Wouldn't be surprised. Regular square feed for them. Flies come before he's well dead. Got wind of Dignam. They wouldn't care about the smell of it. Salt white crumbling mush of corpse. Smell, taste like raw white turnips. The gates glimmered in front. Still open. Back to the world again. Enough of this place. Brings you a bit nearer every time. Last time I was here was Mrs. Sinico's funeral. Poor Papa too. The love that kills and even scraping up the earth at night with a lantern like that case I read of, to get at fresh buried females, or even putrefied with running grave sores. Give you the creeps after a bit. I will appear to you after death. You will see my ghost after death. My ghost will haunt you after death. There is another world after death named Hell. I do not like that other world, she wrote. No more do I. Plenty to see and hear and feel yet. Feel live warm beings near you. Let them sleep in their maggoty beds. They're not going to get me this innings. Warm beds. 
warm, full-blooded life. Martin Cunningham emerged from a side path, talking gravely. Solicitor, I think. I know his face. Menton, John Henry, solicitor, commissioner for oaths and affidavits. Dignam used to be in his office. Matt Dillon's long ago. Jolly Matt, convivial evenings. Cold fowl, cigars, the tantalus glasses. Heart of gold, really. Yes, Menton. Got his rag out that evening on the bowling green because I sailed inside him. Pure fluke of mine, the bias. Why he took such a rooted dislike to me. Hate at first sight. Molly and Flowey Dillon linked under the lilac tree, laughing. Fellow always like that, mortified if women are by. Got a dinge in the side of his hat. Carriage, probably. Excuse me, sir, Mr. Bloom said beside them. They stopped. Your hat is a little crushed, Mr. Bloom said, pointing. John Henry Menton stared at him for an instant without moving. There, Martin Cunningham helped, pointing also. John Henry Menton took off his hat, bulged out the dinge, and smoothed the nap with care on his coat sleeve. He clapped the hat on his head again. It's all right now, Martin Cunningham said. John Henry Menton jerked his head down in acknowledgement. Thank you, he said shortly. They walked on towards the gates. Mr. Bloom, chapfallen, drew behind a few paces so as not to overhear. Martin laying down the law. Martin could wind a sappy head like that round his little finger without his seeing it. Oyster eyes. Never mind. Be sorry after, perhaps, when it dawns on him. Get the pull over him that way. Thank you. How grand we are this morning. End of section 8Section 9 of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Part 2. The Odyssey. Episode 7. Eulus. Part 1 in the heart of the Hibernian metropolis. Before Nelson's pillar, tram slowed, shunted, changed trolley, started for Black Rock, Kingstown and Dalkey, Clonskia, Rathgar and Terenure, Palmerston Park and Upper Rathmines, Sandymount Green, Rathmines, Ringsend and Sandymount Tower, Harold's Cross. The horse Dublin United Tramway Company's timekeeper bawled them off, Rathgar and Terenure. Come on, Sandy Mount Green. Right and left, parallel, clanging, ringing, a double decker and a single decker moved from their railheads, swerved to the down line, glided parallel. Start, Palmerston Park. The Wearer of the Crown. Under the porch of the General Post Office, shoe blacks called and polished parked in North Prince's Street His Majesty's Vermilion Mail Cars, bearing on their sides the royal initials E.R., received loudly flung sacks of letters, postcards, letter cards, parcels, insured and paid for local, provincial, British and overseas delivery. Gentlemen of the Press Gross-booted draymen rolled barrels dull-thudding out of Prince's stores, and bumped them up on the brewery float. On the brewery float bumped dull-thudding barrels, rolled by gross-booted draymen out of Prince's stores. There it is, Red Murray said, Alexander Keys. Just cut it out, will you, Mr. Bloom said, and I'll take it round to the telegraph office. The door of Rutledge's office creaked again. Davy Stevens, minute in a large cape coat, a small felt hat crowning his ringlets, passed out with a roll of papers under his cape, a king's courier. Red Murray's long shears sliced out the advertisement from the newspaper in four clean strokes, scissors and paste. I'll go through the printing works, Mr. Bloom said, taking the cut square. 
"'Of course, if he wants a pa,' Red Murray said, earnestly, a pen behind his ear, "'we can do him one.' "'Right,' Mr. Bloom said, with a nod. "'I'll rub that in.' "'We.' Oui. "'William Braden, Esquire, of Oakland's Sandy Mount. Red Murray touched Mr. Bloom's arm with the shears, and whispered, "'Braden.' Mr. Bloom turned and saw the liveried porter raise his lettered cap as a stately figure entered between the newsboards of the weekly Freeman and National Press, and the Freeman's Journal and National Press. Dull thudding Guinness's barrels. It passed stately up the staircase, steered by an umbrella, a solemn beard-framed face. The broadcloth back ascended each step, back. All his brains are in the nape of his neck, Simon Dedalus says. Welts of flesh behind on him. Fat folds of neck, fat, neck, fat, neck. Don't you think his face is like our saviour? Red Murray whispered. The door of Rutledge's office whispered, Eh, eh. They always build one door opposite another for the wind too. Way in, way out. Our saviour. Beard-framed oval face. Talking in the dusk, Mary, Martha, steered by an umbrella sword to the footlights, Mario the tenor. Or like Mario, Mr. Bloom said. Yes, Red Murray agreed, but Mario was said to be the picture of our saviour. Jesus Mario with rougey cheeks, doublet and spindle legs, hand on his heart, in Martha. Come, thou lost one, come, thou dear one. The Crozier and the Pen. His Grace phoned down twice this morning, Red Murray said gravely. They watched the knees, legs, boots, vanish. Neck. A telegram boy stepped in nimbly, threw an envelope on the counter, and stepped off post-haste with a word. Freeman! Mr. Bloom said slowly. Well, he is one of our saviours also. A meek smile accompanied him as he lifted the counter flap as he passed in through the side door and along the warm dark stairs and passage along the now reverberating boards but will he save the circulation thumping thumping he pushed in the glass swing door and entered stepping over strewn packing paper through a lane of clanking drums he made his way towards nanetti's reading closet with unfeigned regret it is, we announce the dissolution of a most respected Dublin Burgess. Hines here too. Account of the funeral, probably. Thumping, thump. This morning the remains of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam. Machines. Smash a man to atoms if they got him caught. Rule the world today. His machineries are pegging away too. Like these, got out of hand. Fermenting. Working away, tearing away and that old grey rat tearing to get in. How a great daily organ is turned out. Mr. Bloom halted behind the foreman's spare body, admiring a glossy crown. Strange he never saw his real country. Ireland, my country. Member for College Green. He boomed that workaday work attack for all it was worth. It's the ads and side features sell a weekly, not the stale news in the official gazette. Queen Anne is dead, published by authority in the year 1000 and... Demean, situate in the townland of Rosanalis, barony of Tinna Chinch. To all whom it may concern, schedule pursuant to statute, showing return of number of mules and jennets exported from Balina. Nature notes, cartoons... Phil Blake's weekly Pat and Bull story, Uncle Toby's page for tiny tots, Country Bumpkin's queries, Dear Mr. Editor, what is a good cure for flatulence? I'd like that part. Learn a lot teaching others. The personal note, M.A.P., mainly all pictures. Shapely bathers on Golden Strand, World's Biggest Balloon, Double Marriage of Sisters Celebrated, Two bridegrooms laughing heartily at each other. Cuprani, too, printer. More Irish than the Irish. The machines clanked in three-four time. Thump, thump, thump. Now, if he got paralysed there, and no one knew how to stop them, 
they'd clank on and on the same printed over and over and up and back monkey doodle the whole thing want a cool head well get it to the evening edition councillor hines said soon be calling him my lord mayor long john is backing him they say the foreman without answering scribbled press on a corner of the sheet and made a sign to a typesetter he handed the sheet silently over the dirty glass screen right thanks hines said moving off mr bloom stood in his way if you want to draw the cashier is just going to lunch he said pointing backward with his thumb did you hines asked mm, mr bloom said look sharp and you'll catch him thanks old man hines said i'll tap him too he hurried on eagerly towards the freeman's journal three bob i lent him in meagres three weeks third hint we see the canvasser at work mr bloom laid his cutting on mr nanetti's desk excuse me councillor he said this ad you see keys you remember mr nanetti considered the cutting a while and nodded he wants it in for july mr bloom said he doesn't hear it nanan iron nerves the foreman moved his pencil towards it but wait mr bloom said he wants it changed keys you see he wants two keys at the top hell of a racket they make maybe he understands what i the foreman turned round to hear patiently and lifting an elbow began to scratch slowly in the armpit of his alpaca jacket like that mr bloom said crossing his forefingers at the top let him take that in first mr bloom glancing sideways up from the cross he had made saw the foreman's sallow face think he has a touch of jaundice and beyond the obedient reels feeding in huge webs of paper clank it clank it miles of it unreeled what becomes of it after oh wrap up meat parcels various uses thousand and one things slipping his words deftly into the pauses of the clanking he drew swiftly on the scarred woodwork house of keys like that see two crossed keys here a circle then here the name alexander keys tea wine and spirit merchant so on better not teach him his own business you know yourself councillor just what he wants then round the top in leaded the house of keys you see do you think that's a good idea the foreman moved his scratching hand to his lower ribs and scratched there quietly the idea mr bloom said is the house of keys you know councillor the manx parliament innuendo of home rule tourists you know from the isle of man catches the eye you see can you do that i could ask him perhaps about how to pronounce that volio but then if he didn't know only make it awkward for him better not we can do that the foreman said have you the design i can get it mr bloom said it was in a kilkenny paper he has a house there too i'll just run out and ask him well you can do that and just a little pa calling attention you know the usual high class licensed premises long felt want so on the foreman thought for an instant we can do that he said let him give us a three months renewal the typesetter brought him a limp galley page he began to check it silently mr bloom stood by hearing the loud throbs of cranks watching the silent typesetters at their cases want to be sure of his spelling proof fever martin cunningham forgot to give us his spelling bee conundrum this morning it is amusing to view the unpar one r allowed in barra two r's is it double s munt of a harassed peddler while gauging a u the symmetry of a peeled pear under a cemetery wall silly isn't it cemetery put in of course on account of the symmetry i could have said when he clapped on his topper thank you i ought to have said something about an old hat or something no i could have said looks as good as new now see his fizz then St! the nethermost deck of the first machine jogged forwards in its flyboard with st the first batch of choir folded papers st almost human the way it st to call attention doing its level best to speak 
that door too st creaking asking to be shut everything speaks in its own way st noted churchman an occasional contributor the foreman handed back the galley page suddenly saying wait where's the archbishop's letter it's to be repeated in the telegraph where's what's his name he looked about him round his loud unanswering machines monks sir a voice asked from the casting box ay where's monks monks mr bloom took up his cutting time to get out then i'll get the design mr nanetti he said and you'll give it a good place i know monks yes sir three months renewal want to get some wind off my chest first try it anyhow rub in august good idea horse show month ballsbridge tourists over for the show a day father he walked on through the case room passing an old man bowed spectacled aproned old monks the day father queer lot of stuff he must have put through his hands in his time obituary notices pubs ads speeches divorce suits found drowned nearing the end of his tether now sober serious man with a bit in the savings bank i'd say wife a good cook and washer daughter working the machine in the parlour plain jane no damn nonsense and it was the feast of the passover he stayed in his walk to watch a typesetter neatly distributing type reads it backwards first quickly he does it must require some practice that mangid katsirtap poor papa with his haggadah book reading backwards with his finger to me pesach next year in jerusalem dear old dear all that long business about that brought us out of the land of egypt and into the house of bondage alleluia shema israel idonai elohenu no that's the other then the twelve brothers jacob's sons and then the lamb and the cat and the dog and the stick and the water and the butcher and then the angel of death kills the butcher and he kills the ox and the dog kills the cat sounds a bit silly till you come to look into it well justice it means but it's everybody eating everyone else that's what life is after all how quickly he does that job practice makes perfect seems to see with his fingers mr bloom passed on out of the clanking noises through the gallery on to the landing now am i going to tram it out all the way and then catch him out perhaps better phone him up first number same as citron's house twenty eight twenty eight double four only once more that soap he went down the house staircase who the deuce scrawled all over these walls with matches looks as if they did it for a bet heavy greasy smell there always is in those works lukewarm glue in tom's next door when i was there he took out his handkerchief to dab his nose citron lemon ah the soap i put there lose it out of that pocket putting back his handkerchief he took out the soap and stowed it away buttoned into the hip pocket of his trousers what perfume does your wife use i could go home still tram something i forgot just to see before dressing no here no a sudden screech of laughter came from the evening telegraph office know who that is what's up pop in a minute to phone ned lambert it is he entered softly erin green gem of the silver sea the ghost walks professor mchugh murmured softly biscuitfully to the dusty window-pane mr dedalus staring from the empty fireplace at ned lambert's quizzing face asked of it sourly agonizing christ wouldn't it give you a heartburn on your arse ned lambert seated on the table read on or again note the meanderings of some purling rill as it babbles on its way fanned by gentlest zephyrs though quarrelling with the stony obstacles to the tumbling waters of neptune's blue domain mid mossy banks played on by the glorious sunlight or neath the shadows cast o'er its pensive bosom by the overarching leafage of the giants of the forest what about that simon he asked over the fringe of his newspaper how's that for high changing his drink 
Mr. Dealers said. Ned Lambert, laughing, struck the newspaper on his knees, repeating, The pensive bosom and the overarsing leafage. Oh, boys, oh, boys. And Xenophon looked upon Marathon, Mr. Deedless said, looking again on the fireplace and to the window, and Marathon looked on the sea. That will do, Professor McHugh cried from the window. I don't want to hear any more of the stuff. He ate off the crescent of water biscuit he had been nibbling, and, hungered, made ready to nibble the biscuit in his other hand. Highfalutin stuff, bladder bags. Ned Lambert is taking a day off, I see. Rather upsets a man's day, a funeral does. He has influence, they say. Old Chatterton, the vice-chancellor, is his grand-uncle, or his great-grand-uncle. Close on ninety, they say. Sub-leader for his death, written this long time, perhaps. Living to spite them. Might go first himself. Johnny, make way for your uncle. The right honourable hedges heir Chatterton. Dare say he writes him an odd shaky check or two on gale days. Windfall when he kicks out. Alleluia. Just another spasm, Ned Lambert said. What is it? Mr. Bloom asked. A recently discovered fragment of Cicero's, Professor McHugh answered with pomp of tone, our lovely land. Short, but to the point. Whose land? Mr. Bloom said simply. Most pertinent question, the Professor said between his chews, with an accent on the whose. Dan Dawson's land, Mr. Deedless said. Is it his speech last night? Mr. Bloom asked. Ned Lambert nodded. But listen to this, he said. The doorknob hit Mr. Bloom in the small of the back as the door was pushed in. Excuse me, J. J. O'Malloy said, entering. Mr. Bloom moved nimbly aside. I beg yours, he said. Good day, Jack. Come in, come in. Good day. How are you, Deedless? Well, and yourself? J. J. O'Malloy shook his head. Sad. Cleverest fellow at the junior bar he used to be. Decline, poor chap. That hectic flush spells finis for a man. Touch and go with him. What's in the wind, I wonder? Money worry. Or again, if we but climb the serried mountain peaks. You're looking extra. Is the editor to be seen? J. J. O'Malloy asked, looking towards the inner door. Very much so, Professor McHugh said. To be seen and heard. He's in his sanctum with Lenehan. J. J. O'Malloy strolled to the sloping desk and began to turn back the pink pages of the file. Practice dwindling. A might have been. Losing heart. Gambling. Debts of honour. Reaping the whirlwind. Used to get good retainers from D. and T. Fitzgerald. Their wigs to show their grey matter. Brains on their sleeve like the statue in Glasnevin. I believe he does some literary work for the Express with Gabriel Conroy. Well read, fellow. Miles Crawford began on the Independent. Funny the way those newspaper men veer about when they get wind of a new opening. Weathercocks, hot and cold in the same breath. Wouldn't know which to believe. One story good till you hear the next. Go for one another, bald-headed in the papers, and then all blows over. Hail fellow, well met the next moment. Ah, oh, listen to this, for God's sake, Ned Lambert pleaded. Or again, if we but climb the serried mountain peaks. Bombast, the professor broke in testily. Enough of the inflated windbag. Peaks, Ned Lambert went on, towering high on high, to bathe our souls, as it were. Bathe his lips, Mr. Deedless said. Blessed and eternal God. Yes, is he taking anything for it? As twere in the peerless panorama of Ireland's portfolio, unmatched, despite their well-praised prototypes in other vaunted prize regions, for very beauty of bosky grove and undulating plain, and luscious pasture-land of vernal green, steeped in the transcendent, translucent glow of our mild, mysterious Irish twilight. His native Doric the moon, Professor McHugh said, he forgot Hamlet, that mantles the vista far and wide, and wait till the glowing orb of the moon shines forth to irradiate her silver effulgence. Oh, Mr. Deedless cried, giving vent to a hopeless groan, shite and onions, 
That'll do, Ned. Life is too short. He took off his silk hat, and blowing out impatiently his bushy moustache, Welsh combed his hair with raking fingers. Ned Lambert tossed the newspaper aside, chuckling with delight. An instant after, a hoarse bark of laughter burst over Professor McHugh's unshaven, black-spectacled face. Doughy door, he cried. What weather up said. All very fine to jeer at it now in cold print, but it goes down like hot cake, that stuff. He was in the bakery line, too, wasn't he? Why they called him Doughy door Feathered his nest well, anyhow. Daughter engaged to that chap in the Inland Revenue Office with the motor. Hooked that nicely. Entertainment's open house. Big blowout. Weather up always said that. Get a grip of them by the stomach. The inner door was opened violently, and a scarlet-beaked face, crested by a comb of feathery hair, thrust itself in. The bold blue eyes stared about them, and the harsh voice asked, "'What is it?' "'And here comes the sham squire himself,' Professor McHugh said grandly. "'Get out of that, you bloody old pedagogue,' the editor said in recognition. "'Come, Ned,' Mr. Deedler said, putting on his hat. "'I must get a drink after that.' "'Drink?' the editor cried. "'No drink served before mass.' "'Quite right, too,' Mr. Deedler said, going out. "'Come on, Ned.' Ned Lambert sidled down from the table. The editor's blue eyes roved towards Mr. Bloom's face, shadowed by a smile. "'Will you join us, Miles?' Ned Lambert asked. Memorable Battles Recalled "'North Cork Militia!' the editor cried, striding to the mantelpiece. "'We won every time! North Cork and Spanish officers!' "'Where was that, Miles?' Ned Lambert asked, with a reflective glance at his toe-caps. "'In Ohio!' the editor shouted. So it was, begad, Ned Lambert agreed. Passing out, he whispered to J. J. O'Molloy, incipient jigs, sad case. Ohio, the editor crowed in high treble from his uplifted scarlet face. My Ohio. A perfect critic, the professor said, long, short and long. O harp Aeolian. He took a reel of dental floss from his waistcoat pocket and, breaking off a piece, twanged it smartly between two and two of his resonant, unwashed teeth. Bing, bang, bang, bang. Mr. Bloom, seeing the coast clear, made for the inner door. Just a moment, Mr. Crawford, he said. I just want to phone about an ad. He went in. What about that leader this evening? Professor McHugh asked, coming to the editor and laying a firm hand on his shoulder. "'That'll be all right,' Miles Crawford said more calmly. "'Never you fret. "'Hello, Jack. "'That's all right.' "'Good day, Miles,' J. J. O'Molloy said, "'letting the pages he held slip limply back on the file. "'Is that Canada Swindle case on today?' "'The telephone whirred inside. Twenty-eight. "'No, twenty. "'Double four. "'Yes.' "'Spot the winner.' Lenehan came out of the inner office with sports tissues. "'Who wants a dead cert for the gold cup?' he asked. "'Scepter, with O. Madden up.' He tossed the tissues onto the table. Screams of newsboys, barefoot in the hall, rushed near, and the door was flung open. "'Hush!' Lenehan said. "'I hear feet stoops.' Professor McHugh strode across the room and seized the cringing urchin by the collar as the others scampered out of the hall and down the steps. The tissues rustled up in the draught, floated softly in the air, blew scrawls, and under the table came to earth. "'It wasn't me, sir. It was the big fellow shoved me, sir. "'Throw him out and shut the door,' the editor said. "'There's a hurricane blowing.' Lenehan began to pour the tissues up from the floor, grunting as he stooped twice. "'Waiting for the racing special, sir,' the newsboy said. "'It was Pat Farrell shoved me, sir.' He pointed to two faces, peering in round the door-frame. "'Him, sir!' "'Out of this with you,' Professor McHugh said gruffly. He hustled the boy out and banged the door, too. J. J. O'Molloy turned the files crackingly over, murmuring, seeking. "'Continued on page six, column four. "'Yes, Evening Telegraph here,' Mr. Bloom phoned from the inner office. "'Is the boss?' "'Yes, Telegraph. 
to where aha which auction rooms aha i see right i'll catch him a collision ensues the bell whirred again as he rang off he came in quickly and bumped against lenehan who was struggling up with the second tissue pardon monsieur lenehan said clutching him for an instant and making a grimace my fault mr bloom said suffering his grip are you hurt i'm in a hurry knee lenehan said he made a comic face and whined rubbing his knee the accumulation of the anno domini sorry mr bloom said he went to the door and holding it ajar paused j j o'molloy slapped the heavy pages over the noise of two shrill voices a mouth organ echoed in the bare hallway from the newsboys squatted on the doorsteps we are the boys of wexford who fought with heart and hand exit bloom i'm just running round to bachelor's walk mr bloom said about this ad of keyes's want to fix it up they tell me he's round there in dillon's he looked indecisively for a moment at their faces the editor who leaning against the mantel-shelf had propped his head on his hand suddenly stretched forth an arm amply be gone he said the world is before you back in no time mr bloom said hurrying out j j o'molloy took the tissues from lenehan's hand and read them blowing them apart gently without comment he'll get that advertisement the professor said staring through his black-rimmed spectacles over the cross-blind look at the young scamps after him show where lenehan cried running to the window End of section 9section 10 of ulysses this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org ulysses by james joyce part 2 the odyssey episode 7 aeolus part 2 a street cortege both smiled over the cross-blind at the file of capering newsboys in Mr. Bloom's wake, the last zigzagging white on the breeze a mocking kite, a tail of white bow-knots. "'Look at the young gutter snipe behind him, hue and cry,' Lenehan said, "'and you'll kick. Oh, my rib risible!' Taking off his flat spogs and a walk, small nines, steal upon larks, he began to mazurka in swift caricature, across the floor on sliding feet, past the fireplace to J. J. O'Malloy, who placed the tissues in his receiving hands. "'What's that?' Miles Crawford said with a start. "'Where are the other two gone?' "'Who?' the professor said, turning. "'They're gone round the oval for a drink. Paddy Hooper is there with Jack Hall. Came over last night.' "'Come on, then,' Miles Crawford said. "'Where's my hat?' He walked jerkily into the office behind, parting the vent of his jacket, jingling his keys in his back pocket. They jingled then in the air and against the wood as he locked his desk drawer. "'He's pretty well on,' Professor McHugh said in a low voice. "'Seems to be,' J.J. J. O'Malloy said, taking out a cigarette case in murmuring meditation. "'But it is not always as it seems. Who has the most matches?' the calumet of peace he offered a cigarette to the professor and took one himself lenehan promptly struck a match for them and lit their cigarettes in turn j j o'malloy opened his case again and offered it thank you vous lenehan said helping himself the editor came from the inner office a straw hat awry on his brow he declaimed in song pointing sternly at professor McHugh. "'Twas rank and fame that tempted thee, "'twas empire charmed thy heart.' "'The professor grinned, locking his long lips. "'Eh, ye bloody old Roman Empire,' Miles Crawford said. "'He took a cigarette from the open case. "'Lenehan, lighting it for him with quick grace, said, "'Silence for my brand-new riddle.' "'Imperium Romanum,' J.J. O'Malloy said gently. 
It sounds nobler than British or Brixton. The word reminds one somehow of fat in the fire. Miles Crawford blew his first puff violently towards the ceiling. That's it, he said. We are the fat. You and I are the fat in the fire. We haven't got a chance of a snowball in hell. The grandeur that was Rome. Wait a moment, Professor McHugh said, raising two quiet claws. We mustn't be led away by words, by sounds of words. We think of Rome imperial imperious imperative he extended elocutionary arms from frayed stained shirt cuffs pausing what was their civilization vast i allow but vile cloaque sewers the jews in the wilderness and on the mountain top said it is meet to be here let us build an altar to jehovah the Roman, like the Englishman who follows in his footsteps, brought to every new shore on which he set his foot. On our shore he never set it. Only his cloacal obsession. He gazed about him in his toga and he said, It is meet to be here. Let us construct a water closet. Which they accordingly did do, Lenehan said. Our old ancient ancestors, as we read in the first chapter of Guinnesses, were partial to the running stream. They were nature's gentlemen, J.J. O'Malloy murmured, but we also have Roman law. And Pontius Pilate is his prophet, Professor McHugh responded. Do you know that story about Chief Baron Pales? J.J. O'Malloy asked. It was at the Royal University dinner. Everything was going swimmingly. First my riddle, Lenehan said. Are you ready? Mr. O'Madden Burke, tall, in copious grey of Donegal tweed, came in from the hallway. Stephen Dedalus, behind him, uncovered as he entered. Entrez, mes enfants, Lenehan cried. I escort a supplicant, Mr. O'Madden Burke said melodiously. Youth led by experience visits notoriety. How do you do, the editor said, holding out a hand. Come in. Your governor is just gone. Lenehan said to all, Silence! What opera resembles a railway line? Reflect, ponder, excogitate, reply. Stephen handed over the typed sheets, pointing to the title and signature. Who? the editor asked. Bit torn off. Mr. Garrett Deasy, Stephen said. That old pelters, the editor said. Who tore it? Was he short taken? On a swift sail flaming, from storm and south he comes, pale vampire, mouth to my mouth. Good day, Stephen, the professor said, coming to peer over their shoulders. Foot and mouth, are you turned? Bullock befriending bard. Shindy in well-known restaurant. Good day, sir, Stephen answered. The letter is not mine. Mr. Garrett Deasy asked me to... Oh, I know him, Miles Crawford said, and I knew his wife too. The bloodiest old tartar God ever made. By Jesus, she had the foot and mouth disease and no mistake. The night she threw the soup in the waiter's face and the star and garter. Ho oh, ho! Oh. A woman brought sin into the world. For Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus, ten years the Greeks. O'Rourke, prince of Brefni. Is he a widower? Stephen asked. Aye, a grass one, Miles Crawford said, his eyes running down the tripe script. Emperor's horses. Habsburg, an Irishman saved his life on the ramparts of Vienna. Don't you forget? Maximilian Carl O'Donnell, Graf von Tirconnell in Ireland, sent his heir over to make the king an Austrian field marshal now. Going to be trouble there one day. Wild geese. Oh yes, every time. Don't you forget that? The moot point is, did he forget it? J.J. M.L.I. said quietly, turning a horseshoe paperweight. Saving princes is a thank you job. Professor McHugh turned on him. And if not, he said. I'll tell you how it was, Miles Crawford began. A Hungarian it was one day. Lost causes, noble Marquess mentioned. We were always loyal to lost causes, the professor said. Success for us is the death of the intellect and of the imagination. We were never loyal to the successful. We serve them. I teach the blatant Latin language. 
I speak the tongue of a race, the acme of whose mentality is the maxim, time is money. Material domination? Dominus? Lord, where is the spirituality? Lord Jesus? Lord Salisbury? A sofa in a West End club? But the Greek? Kairi Eleison. A smile of light brightened his dark-rimmed eyes, lengthened his long lips. The Greek, he said again, Kyrios, shining word, the vowels, the Semite and the Saxon know not. Kyri, the radiance of the intellect, I ought to profess Greek, the language of the mind. Kyri eleison, the closet maker and the cloak maker will never be lords of our spirit. We are liege subjects of the Catholic chivalry of Europe that founded at Trafalgar and of the empire of the spirit, not an imperium that went under with the Athenian fleets at Aegospotami. Yes, yes, they went under. Phyrrhus, misled by an oracle, made a last attempt to retrieve the fortunes of Greece, loyal to a lost cause. He strode away from them towards the window. They went forth to battle, Mr. Maddenbrook said grayly, but they always fell. Boo-hoo, Lenehan wept with little noise, owing to a brick received in the latter half of the matinee. Poor, poor, poor Pyrrhus. He whispered then near Stephen's ear. Lenehan's Limerick. There's a ponderous pundit McHugh, who wears goggles of ebony hue, and he mostly sees double... To wear them, why trouble? I can't see the Joe Miller, can you? In mourning for solace, Mulligan says, whose mother is beastly dead. Miles Crawford crammed the sheets into a side pocket. That'll be all right, he said. I'll read the rest later. That'll be all right. Lenehan extended his hands in protest. But my riddle, he said, what opera is like a railway line? Opera, Mr. O'Madden Burke's sphinx face re-riddled. Lenehan announced gladly, The Rose of Castile! See the wheeze! Rose of Cast Steel! Gee! He poked Mr. O'Madden Burke mildly in the spleen. Mr. O'Madden Burke fell back with a grace on his umbrella, feigning a gasp. Help! he sighed. I feel a strong weakness. Lenehan, rising to tiptoe, fanned his face rapidly with the rustling tissues. The professor, returning by way of the files, swept his hand across Stephen's and Mr. O'Madden Burke's loose ties. Paris, past and present, he said, you look like communards. Like fellows who had blown up the Bastille, J.J. O'Malloy said in quiet mockery. Or was it you shot the Lord Lieutenant of Finland between you? You look as though you had done the deed. General Bobrikov. Omnium gatherum. We were only thinking about it, Stephen said. All the talents, Miles Crawford said. Law, the classics, the turf, Lenehan put in. Literature, the press. If Bloom were here, the professor said, the gentle art of advertisement. And Madame Bloom, Mr. O'Madden Burke added, the vocal muse. Dublin's prime favourite? Lenehan gave a loud cough. Ahem, uh-huh, he said very softly. Oh, for a fresh of breath air. I caught a cold in the park. The gate was open. You can do it. The editor laid a nervous hand on Stephen's shoulder. I want you to write something for me, he said. Something with a bite in it. You can do it. I see it in your face. In the lexicon of youth. See it in your face? See it in your eye, lazy idle little schemer. Foot and mouth disease, the editor cried in scornful invective. Great nationalist meeting in Boris and Ossery. All balls, bulldozing the public. Give them something with a bite in it. Put us all into it, damn it so. Father, Son and Holy Ghost and Jakes McCarty. We can all supply a mental pabulum, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. Stephen raised his eyes at a bold, unheeding stare. He wants you for the press gang, J.J. O'Malley said. The great Gallagher. You can do it, Miles Crawford repeated, clenching his hand in emphasis. 
Wait a minute. We'll paralyse Europe, as Ignatius Gallagher used to say when he was on the show run, doing billiard making in the Clarence. Gallagher, that was a press man for you. That was a pen. You know how he made his mark? I'll tell you. That was the smartest piece of journalism ever known. That was in 81, 6 to May, time of the Invincibles. Murder in the Phoenix Park. Before you were born, I suppose. I'll show you. He pushed past them to the files. Look at here, he said, turning. The New York World cabled for a special. Remember that time? Professor McHugh nodded. New York World, the editor said excitedly, pushing back his straw hat. Where it took place? Tim Kelly, or Kavanaugh, I mean, Joe Brady and the rest of them, where Skin the Goat drove the car. Whole route, see? Skin the Goat, Mr. O'Madden Brooks said. Fitzharris. He has that cabman's shelter, they say, down there at Butt Bridge. Hollihan told me. You know Hollihan? Hop and carry one, is it? Miles Crawford said. And poor Gumley is down there too, so he told me, minding stones for the corporation. A night watchman. Stephen turned in surprise. Gumley, he said. You don't say so. A friend of my father's is it? Never mind Gumley, Miles Crawford cried angrily. Let Gumley mind the stones. See, they don't run away. Look at here. What did Ignatius Gallagher do? I'll tell you. Inspiration of genius. Cabled right away. Have you weekly Freeman of 17th March? Right, have you got that? He flung back pages of the files and stuck his finger on a point. Take page four. Advertisement for Bransom's coffee, let us say. Have you got that? Right. The telephone word. A distant voice. I'll answer it, the professor said, going. B is park gate. Good. His finger leaped and struck point after point, vibrating. T is Viceregal Lodge. C is where murder took place. K is Knock Maroon Gate. The loose flesh of his neck shook like a cock swattles. An ill-starched dicky jutted up, and with a rude gesture he thrust it back into his waistcoat. Hello? Evening telegraph here. Hello? Who's there? Yes? 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 F to P is a route skin the goat drove the car for an alibi. In Shakur, Round Town, Windy Arbor, Palmerston Park, Renala, F-A-B-P, got that? X is Davies Public House in Upper Leeson Street. The professor came to the inner door. Bloom is at the telephone, he said. Tell him go to hell, the editor said promptly. X is Davies Public House, C. Clever, very... Clever, Lenehan said. Very. Give it to them on hot plate, Miles Crawford said. The whole bloody history. Nightmare from which you will never awake. I saw it, the editor said proudly. I was present. Dick Adams, the best-hearted bloody corkman the Lord ever put the breath of life in, and myself. Lenehan bowed to a shape of air, announcing, Madam, I'm Adam, and Abel was ere I saw Elba. History! Miles Crawford cried. The old woman of Princess Street was there first. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth over that, out of an advertisement. Gregor Gray made the design for it. That gave him the leg up. Then Paddy Hooper worked to Tay Pay, who took him on to the star. Now he's got in with the Blumenfeld. That's press. That's talent. Pyatt. He was all their daddies. The father of scarce journalism, Lenehan confirmed and the brother-in-law of Chris Callanan. Hello, are you there? Yes, he's here still. Come across yourself. Where do you find a pressman like that now, eh? The editor cried. He flung the pages down. The father of scare journalism, Lenehan confirmed, and the brother-in-law of Chris Callanan. Hello, are you there? Yes, he's still here. Come across yourself. Where do you find a pressman like that now, eh? The editor cried. He flung the pages down. Damn clever, Lenin said to Mr. O'Maddenburg. Very smart, Mr. O'Maddenburg said. Professor McHugh came from the outer office. Talking about the Invincibles, he said. Did you see that some hawkers were up before the recorder? Oh, yes, J.J. O'Malloy said eagerly. Lady Dudley was walking home through the park to see all the trees that were blown down by that cyclone last year, and thought she'd buy a view of Dublin and it turned out to be a commemoration postcard of Joe Brady, or Number One, or Skin the Goat, right outside the Vice Regal Lodge, imagine. They're only in the hook-and-eye department, Miles Crawford said. Pshaw, 
press and the bar? Where have you a man now at the bar like those fellows, like Whiteside, like Isaac Butt, like the silver-tongued O'Hagan, eh? Ah, bloody nonsense. Pshaw, only in the halfpenny place. His mouth continued to twitch, unspeaking in nervous curls of disdain. Would anyone wish that mouth for her kiss? How do you know? Why did you write it then? Rhymes and reasons. Mouth, south. Is the mouth south some way, or is the south a mouth? Must be the same. South, pout, out, shout, drought. Rhymes. Two men dressed the same, looking the same, two by two. La tua pace, che parlar ti piace, mentrece il vento con pa siltace. He saw them three by three, approaching girls in green, in rose, in russet, entwining. Parler perso, in mauve, in purple, quella pacifica oriflamma, gold of oriflamma. Di remirar fe pieu ardenti, but I, old men, penitent, leaden footed, under darkneath the night, mount, south, tomb, womb. Speak up for yourself, Mr. O'Maddenburg said. Sufficient for the day. J. J. O'Malloy, smiling palely, took up the cage. My dear Miles, he said. Flinging his cigarette aside, you put a false construction on my words. I hold no brief, but at present advised, for the third profession, qua profession. But your cork regs are running away with you. Why not bring in Henry Grattan and Flood and Demosthenes and Edmund Burke? Ignatius Gallagher we all know, and his chapel is at boss, Hamsworth of the Farthing Press, and his American cousin of the Bowery Gutter Sheet not to mention Paddy Kelly's budget. Pew's occurrences and our watchful friend, the Skibbereen Eagle. Why bring in a master of forensic eloquence like Whiteside? Sufficient for the day is the newspaper thereof. Links with bygone days of yore. Grattan and Flood wrote for this very paper, the editor cried in his face. Irish volunteers, where are you now? Established 1763. Dr. Lucas. Who have you now like John Pilpot Corrin? Psha. Well, J.J. O'Malloy said. Bush, K.C., for example. Bush, the editor said. Well, yes, Bush, yes. He has a strain of it in his blood. Kendall Bush, or I mean Seymour Bush. He would have been on the bench long ago, the professor said, only for... But no matter. J.J. O'Malloy turned to Stephen and said, quietly and slowly, One of the most polished periods I think I ever listened to in my life fell from the lips of Seymour Bush. It was in that case of fratricide, the child's murder case. Bush defended him, and in the porches of mine ear did pour. By the way, how did he find that out? He died in his sleep. Or the other story, beast with two backs. What was that? the professor asked. Italia Magistra Artium. He spoke on the law of evidence, J. J. O'Malloy said, of Roman justice as contrasted with the earlier Mosaic Code, the Lex Talionis, and he cited the Moses of Michelangelo in the Vatican. <laughs> A few well-chosen words, Lenehan prefaced. Silence. Pause. J. J. O'Malloy took out his cigarette case. False lull. Something quite ordinary. Messenger took out his matchbox thoughtfully and lit his cigar. I have often thought, since, on looking back over that strange time, that it was that small act, trivial in itself, that striking of that match, that determined the whole aftercourse of both our lives. A polished period. J.J. O'Malley resumed, moulding his words. He said of it, that stony effigy and frozen music, horned and terrible, of the human form divine, that eternal symbol of wisdom and of prophecy which, if aught that the imagination or the hand of sculptor has wrought in marble, of soul transfigured and of soul transfiguring deserves to live, 
deserves to live. His slim hand with a wave graced echo and fall. Fine, Miles Crawford said at once. The divine afflatus, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. You like it? J.J. O'Malloy asked Stephen. Stephen, his blood wooed by grace of language and gesture, blushed. He took a cigarette from the case. J.J. O'Malloy offered his case to Miles Crawford. Lenehan lit their cigarettes as before and took his trophy, saying, Muchibus tankibus. A man of high morale. Professor McGinnis was speaking to me about you, J.J. O'Malloy said to Stephen. What do you think really of that hermetic crowd, the opal hush poets, A.E. the master mystic? That Blavatsky woman started it. She was a nice old bag of tricks. A.E. has been telling some Yankee interviewer that you came to him in the small hours of the morning to ask him about planes of consciousness. McGinnis thinks you must have been pulling A.E.'s leg. He's a man of the very highest morale, McGinnis. Speaking about me? What did he say? What did he say? What did he say about me? Don't ask. No, nope, thanks, Professor McHugh said, waving the cigarette case aside. Wait a moment. Let me say one thing. The finest display of oratory I ever heard was a speech made by John F. Taylor at the College Historical Society. Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon, the present Lord Justice of Appeal, had spoken and the paper under debate was an essay, new for those days, advocating the revival of the Irish tongue. He turned towards Miles Crawford and said, You know Gerald Fitzgibbon, then you can imagine the style of his discourse. He is sitting with Tim Healy, J.J. O'Malloy said, rumour has it, on the Trinity College Estates Commission. He is sitting with a sweet thing, Miles Crawford said, in a child's frock. Go on, well... It was the speech, mark you, the professor said, of a finished orator, full of courteous haughtiness and pouring in chastened diction, I will not say the vials of his wrath, but pouring the proud man's contumely upon the new movement. It was then a new movement. We were weak, therefore worthless. He closed his long, thin lips an instant, but, but eager to be on, raised an outspanned hand to his spectacles, and with trembling thumb and ring finger touching lightly the black rims, steadied them to a new focus. Impromptu. In a ferial tone he addressed J. J. O'Malloy. Taylor had come there, you must know, from a sick bed. That he had prepared his speech, I do not believe, for there was not even one shorthand writer in the hall. His dark, lean face had a growth of shaggy beard round it. He wore a loose white silk neckcloth, and altogether he looked, though he was not, a dying man. His gaze turned at once, but slowly, from J. J. O'Malloy's towards Stephen's face and then bent at once to the ground, seeking. His unglazed linen collar appeared behind his bent head, soiled by his withering hair. Still seeking, he said. When Fitzgibbon's speech had ended, John F. Taylor rose to reply. Briefly, as well as I can bring them to mind, his words were these. He raised his head firmly. His eyes bethought themselves once more. Witless, shellfish, swam in the gross lenses to and fro, seeking outlet. He began. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, great was my admiration in listening to the remarks addressed to the youth of Ireland a moment since by my learned friend. It seemed to me that I had been transported into a country far away from this country, into an age remote from this age, that I stood in ancient Egypt and that I was listening to the speech of some high priest of that land addressed to the youthful Moses. His listeners held their cigarettes poised to hear their smokes ascending in frail stalks that flowered with his speech, and let our crooked smokes, noble words coming, look out. Could you try your hand at it yourself? And it seemed to me that I heard the voice of that Egyptian high priest raised in a tone of like haughtiness and like pride. I heard his words, and their meaning was revealed to me. From the Fathers 
it was revealed to me that those things are good which yet are corrupted which neither if they were supremely good nor unless they were good could be corrupted ah curse you that's saint augustine why will you jews not accept our culture our religion and our language you are a tribe of nomad herdsmen we are a mighty people you have no cities nor no wealth our cities are hives of humanity and our galleys tirem and quadrium laden with all manner merchandise furrow the waters of the known globe you have but emerged from primitive conditions we have a literature a priesthood an age-long history and a polity nile child man effigy by the nile bank the babe marie's keel cradle of bulrushes a man supple in combat stone-horned stone-bearded heart of stone you pray to a local and obscure idol our temples majestic and mysterious are the abodes of isis and osiris of horus and amon ra yours serfdom awe and humbleness ours thunder and the seas israel is weak and few are her children egypt is an host and terrible are her arms vagrants and day laborers are you called the world trembles at our name a dumb belch of hunger cleft his speech he lifted his voice above it boldly but ladies and gentlemen had the youthful moses listened to and accepted that view of life had he bowed his head and bowed his will and bowed his spirit before that arrogant admonition he would never have brought the chosen people out of their house of bondage nor followed the pillar of the cloud by day he would never have spoken with the eternal amid lightnings on sinai's mountain top nor ever have come down with the light of inspiration shining in his countenance and bearing in his arms the table of the law graven in the language of the outlaw he ceased and looked at them enjoying a silence omnibus for him j j o'malloy said not without regret and yet he died without having entered the land of promise a sudden at the moment though from lingering illness often previously expectorated demise lenehan added and with a great future behind him the troop of bare feet was heard rushing along the hallway and pattering up the staircase that is oratory the professor said uncontradicted gone with the wind hosts at mulla mass and tara of the kings miles of ears of porches the tribune's words howled and scattered to the four winds a people sheltered within his voice dead noise a cassock records of all that ever anywhere wherever was love and laud him me no more i have money gentlemen stephen said as the next motion on the agenda paper may i suggest that the house do now adjourn you take my breath away is it not perchance a french compliment mr maddenberg asked tis the hour methinks when the wine jug metaphorically speaking is most grateful in ye ancient hostelry that it be and thereby is resolutely resolved all that are in favour say i then had announced the contrary no i declare it carried to which particular boozing shed my casting vote is mooney's he led the way admonishing we will sternly refuse to partake of strong waters will we not yes we will not by no manner of means mr o'maddenburg following close said with an ally's lunge of his umbrella leon macduff chip off the old block the editor cried clapping stephen on the shoulder let us go where are those blasted keys he fumbled in his pocket pulling out the crushed type sheets foot and mouth i know that'll be all right that'll go in where are they that's all right he thrust the sheets back and went into the inner office. Let us hope. J. J. O'Malloy, about to follow him in, said quietly to Stephen, 
I hope you will live to see it published. Miles, one moment. He went into the inner office, closing the door behind him. Come along, Stephen, the professor said. That's fine, isn't it? It has the prophetic vision. Fruit ilium, the sack of windy Troy, kingdoms of this world. The masters of the Mediterranean are fellaheen today. The first newsboy came pattering down the stairs at their heels and rushed out into the street, yelling, Racing special! Dublin, I have much, much to learn. They turned to the left along Abbey Street. I have a vision too, Stephen said. Yes, the professor said, skipping to get into step. Crawford will follow. Another newsboy shot past him, yelling as he ran, Racing special! Dear Dirty Dublin. Dubliners. Two Dublin Vestals, Stephen said, elderly and pious, have lived fifty and fifty-three years in Fumbley's Lane. Where is that? the professor asked. Off Black Pits, Stephen said. Damp night reeking of hungry dough against the wall. Face glistering tallow under her fustane shawl. Frantic hearts. Akasic records. Quicker. Darlint. On now, dare it. Let there be life. They want to see the views of Dublin from the top of Nelson's pillar. They save up three and tenpence in a red tin letter box money box. They shake out three penny bits and sixpences and coax out the pennies with the blade of a knife. Two and three in silver and one and seven in coppers. They put on their bonnets and best clothes and take their umbrellas for fear it may come to rain. Wise virgins, Professor McHugh said. Life on the raw. They buy one and fourpence worth of brawn and four slices of pan loaf at the North City dining rooms in Marlborough Street from Miss Kate Collins, proprietress. They purchase four and twenty ripe plums from a girl at the foot of Nelson's Pillar to take off the thirst of the brawn. They give two threepenny bits to the gentleman at the turnstile and begin to waddle slowly up the winding staircase, grunting, encouraging each other, afraid of the dark, panting, one asking the other, have you the brawn? Praising God and the Blessed Virgin, threatening to come down, peeping at the air slits. Glory be to God, they had no idea it was that high. Their names are Anne Cairns and Florence McCabe. Anne Cairns has the lumbago for which she rubs on Lourdes water, given her by a lady who got a bottle full from a passionist father. Florence McCabe takes a crew bean and a bottle of double X for supper every Saturday. Antithesis, the professor said, nodding twice. Vestal virgins, I can see them. What's keeping our friend? He turned. A bevy of scampering newsboys rushed down the steps, scattering in all directions, yelling, their white papers fluttering. Hard after them, Miles Crawford appeared on the steps, his hat aureoling his scarlet face, talking with J.J. O'Malloy. Come along, the professor cried, waving his arm. He set off again to walk by Stephen's side. Return of Bloom Yes, he said, I see them. Mr. Bloom, breathless, caught in a whirl of wild newsboys near the offices of the Irish Catholic and Dublin Penny Journal, called, Mr. Crawford, a moment. Telegraph, racing special. What is it? Miles Crawford said, falling back a pace. A newsboy cried in Mr. Bloom's face. Terrible tragedy in rat mines. A child hit by a bellows. Interview with the editor. Just this ad, Mr. Bloom said, pushing through towards the steps, puffing and taking the cutting from his pocket. I spoke with Mr. Keyes just now. He'll give a renewal for two months, he says. After he'll see. But he wants a part to call attention in a telegraph, too, the Saturday Pink. And he wants it copied if it's not too late. I told Councillor Nanetti from the Kilkenny people. I can have access to it in the National Library. House of Keys, don't you see? His name is Keys. It's a play on the name. But he practically promised he'd give the renewal. But he wants just a little puff. What will I tell him, Mr. Crawford? K.M.A.
"'Will you tell him he can kiss my arse?' Miles Crawford said, throwing out his arm for emphasis. "'Tell him that straight from the stable.' "'A bit nervy. "'Look out for squalls. "'All off for a drink, arm in arm. "'Then ends yachting cap on the cadge beyond. "'Usual blarney. "'Wonder is that young Dedalus the moving spirit. "'Has a good pair of boots on him today. "'Last time I saw him he had his heels on view. "'Been walking in muck somewhere. "'Careless chap. "'What was he doing in Irish town?' "'Well,' Mr. Bloom said, his eyes returning. "'If I can get the design, I suppose it's worth a short par. "'He'll give the ad, I think. "'I'll tell him. "'K-M-R-I-A. "'He can kiss my royal Irish arse. "'Miles Crawford cried loudly over his shoulder. "'Any time he likes, tell him.' "'While Mr. Bloom stood, weighing the point, "'and about to smile, he strode on jerkily. "'Raising the wind.' Nulla bona, Jack, he said, raising his hand to his chin. I'm up to here. I've been through the hoop myself. I was looking for a fellow to back a bill for me, no later than last week. Sorry, Jack, you must take the will for the deed. With a heart and a half if I could raise the wind anyhow. J. J. O'Malloy pulled a long face and walked on silently. They caught up on the others and walked abreast. When they have eaten the brawn and the bread, and wiped their twenty fingers in the paper the bread was wrapped in, they go nearer to the railings. Something for you, the professor explained to Miles Crawford. Two old women on the top of Nelson's pillar. Some column, that's what Wadler one said. That's new, Miles Crawford said. That's copy. Out for the waxies dargo. Two old trickies, what? But they are afraid the pillar will fall, Stephen went on. They see the roofs and argue about where the different churches are. Ratmine's Blue Dome, Adam and Eve's, St. Lawrence O'Toole's. But it makes them giddy to look, so they pull up their skirts. Those slightly rambunctious females. Easy all, Miles Crawford said. No poetic license. We're in the archdiocese here. And settle down on their striped petticoats, peering up at the statue of the one-handled adulterer. One-handled adulterer, the professor cried. I like that. I see the idea. I see what you mean. Dames donate Dublin's sits, speed pills, velocitus, aerolits, belief. It gives them a crick in their necks, Stephen said, and they are too tired to look up or down or to speak. They put the bag of plums between them and eat the plums out of it, one after another, wiping off with their handkerchiefs the plum juice that dribbles out of their mouths and spitting the plum stones slowly out between the railings. He gave a sudden loud laugh as it closed. Lenehan and Mr. Maddenburg, hearing, turned, beckoned, and led on towards Mooney's. Finished? Miles Crawford said. As long as you do no worse. Sophist, wallops, haughty Helen, square on proboscis. Spartans, Nash Mullers, Ithacan's vow, pen is champ. You remind me of Antisthenes, the professor said, a disciple of Georgius the Sophist. It is said of him that none could tell if he were bitterer against others or against himself. He was the son of a noble and a bondwoman, and he wrote a book in which he took away the palm of beauty from Argive Helen and gave it to poor Penelope. Poor Penelope. Penelope Rich. They made ready to cross O'Connell Street. Hello there, Central. At various points along the eight lines, tram cars with motionless trolleys stood in their tracks, bound for or from Rathmines, Rathfarnham, Black Rock, Kingstown and Dockey, Sandymount Green, Ringsend and Sandymount Tower, Donnybrook, Palmerston Park, and Upper Rathmines, all still becalmed in short circuit. Hackney cars, cabs, delivery wagons, mail vans, private broughams, aerated mineral water floats with rattling crates of bottles, rattled, rolled, horse-drawn, rapidly. What, and likewise, where? But what do you call it? Miles Crawford asked. Where did they get the plums? Virgilian, says pedagogue. Sophomore plumps for old man Moses. Call it, wait, the professor said, opening his long lips wide to reflect. Call it, 
Let me see. Call it Deus nobis haec otia fecit. No, Stephen said. I call it a pisca site of Palestine or the parable of the plums. I see, the professor said. He laughed richly. I see, he said again, with new pleasure. Moses and the promised land. We gave him that idea, he added to J.J. O'Malley. Horatio is Sinosure this fair June day. J.J. O'Malloy sent a weary, sidelong glance towards the statue and held his peace. I see, the professor said. He halted on Sir John Gray's pavement island and peered aloft at Nelson through the meshes of his wry smile. Diminished digits prove too titillating for frisky frumps. Anne Wimbles, Flo Wangles, yet can you blame them? When handled adulterer, he said, smiling grimly, that tickles me, I must say. Tickled the old ones, too, Miles Crawford said, if the God Almighty's truth was known. End of section 10section 11 of ulysses this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by nathan jordan ulysses by james joyce part 2 the odyssey episode 8 the strigonians part 1 pineapple rock lemon plat butterscotch a sugar-sticky girl shoveling scoopfuls of creams for a Christian brother. Some school treat, bad for their tummies. Lozenge and comfit manufacturer to his majesty the king, God save our. Sitting on his throne sucking red jujubes white. A somber YMCA young man, watchful among the warm sweet fumes of graham lemons. Placed a throwaway in a hand of Mr. Bloom. Heart to heart talks. Blue? Me? No. Blood of the Lamb. His slow feet walked him riverward, reading, Are you saved? All are washed in the blood of the Lamb. God wants blood victim, birth, hymen, martyr, war, foundation of a building, sacrifice, kidney burnt offering, druid's altars, Elijah is coming. Dr. John Alexander Dowie, restorer of the church in Zion, is coming. Is coming! Is coming! Is coming! All heartily welcome, paying game. Tory and Alexander last year. Polygamy. His wife will put the stopper on that. Where was that ad, some Birmingham firm? The luminous crucifix, our savior. Wake up in the dead of night, and see him on the wall, hanging. Pepper's ghost idea, iron nails ran in. Phosphorus, it must be done with. If you leave a bit of codfish, for instance, I could see the bluey silver over it. Night, I went down to the pantry in the kitchen. Don't like all the smells in it waiting to rush out. What was it she wanted? The Malaga raisins, thinking of Spain, before Rudy was born. The phosphorescence, that bluey, greeny, very good for the brain. From Butler's Monument House Corner, he glanced along Bachelor's Walk. The Dallas's daughter, there still outside Dylan's auction rooms. Must be selling off some old furniture. Knew her eyes at once from the father. Lobbing about, waiting for him. Home always breaks up when the mother goes. Fifteen children he had, birth every year almost. That's in their theology, where the priest won't give the poor woman the confession, the absolution. Increase and multiply. Did you ever hear such an idea? Eat you out of house and home. No families themselves to feed. Living on the fat of the land. Their butteries and larders. I'd like to see them do the black fast Yom Kippur, cross buns, one meal and a collation for fear he'd collapse on the altar. 
a housekeeper of one of those fellows, if you could pick it out of her. Never pick it out of her. Like getting LSD out of him. Does himself well. No guess. All for number one. Watching his water. Bring your own bread and butter. His reverence mums the word. Good lord. That poor child's dress is in flitters. Underfed she looks too. Potatoes and marge, marge and potatoes, it's after they feel it, proof of the pudding, undermines the constitution. As he set foot on O'Connell Bridge, a puffball of smoke plumed up from the parapet. Brewery barge with export stout, England, sea air sours it, I heard. Be interesting some day, get a pass through Hancock to see the brewery, regular world in itself. Bats of porter wonderful, rats get in too, drink themselves bloated as big as a collie floating, dead drunk on the porter, drink till they puke again like Christians. Imagine drinking that, rats, that's, well, of course, if we knew all the things. Looking down, he saw flapping strongly, wheeling between the gaunt quay walls, gulls, Rough weather outside. If I threw myself down? Reuben J.'s son must have swallowed a good bellyful of that sewage. One and eight pence too much. Hmm. It's the droll way he comes out with the things. Knows how to tell a story, too. They wheeled lower, looking for grub. Wait. He threw down among them a crumpled paper ball. Elijah, thirty-two feet per sec is calm, not a bit. The ball bobbed unheeded on the wake of swells, floated under by the bridge piers, not such damn fools. Also, the day I threw that stale cake out of the Aaron Kings, picked it up in the wake fifty yards astern, lived by their wits, they wheeled, flapping. The hungry famished gull flaps o'er the waters dull. That is how poets write, the similar sounds. But then Shakespeare has no rhymes, blank verse. The flow of the language it is, the thoughts, solemn. Hamlet, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain time to walk the earth. Two apples a penny, two for a penny, his gaze passed over the glazed apples serried on her stand. Australians they must be this time of year. Shiny peels. Polish them up with a rag or a handkerchief. Wait, those poor birds. He halted again and bought from the old applewoman two Banbury cakes for a penny and broke the brittle paste and threw its fragments down into the liffy. See that? The gulls swooped silently, too, then all from their heights, pouncing on prey, gone, every morsel. Aware of their greed and cunning, he shook the powdery crumb from his hands. They never expected that, manna. Live on fish, fishy flesh they have, all seabirds, gulls, sea goose. Swans from Anna Liffey swim down here sometimes to preen themselves no accounting for tastes. Wonder what kind is swan meat? Robinson Crusoe had to live on them. They wheeled, flapping weakly. I'm not going to throw any more. Penny quite enough. Lot of thanks I get. Not even a caw. They spread foot and mouth disease too. If you cram a turkey, say, on chestnut meal, it tastes like that. Eat pig like pig. But then, why is it that saltwater fish are not salty? How is that? His eyes sought answer from the river, and saw a rowboat rock at anchor, on the treacly swells lazily its plastered board. Kino's eleven. Trousers. Good idea, that. Wonder if he pays rent to the corporation. How can you own water, really? It's always flowing in a stream, never the same, which in the stream of life we trace, because life is a stream. 
all kinds of places are good for ads. That quack doctor for the clap used to be stuck up in all the greenhouses. Never see it now, strictly confidential. Dr. High Franks. Didn't cost him a red like Magini, the dancing master self-advertisement. Got fellows to stick them up or stick them up himself, for that matter, on the QT, running in to loosen a button. Fly by night. Just the place, too. Post snow bills, post one ten pills. Some chap with the dose burning him. If he... Oh. Eh? No. 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 No, I don't believe it. He wouldn't, surely. No. No. Mr. Bloom moved forward, raising his troubled eyes. Think no more about that. After one. Time ball on the ballast office is down. Dunsink time. Fascinating little book that is of Sir Robert Ball's. Parallax. I never exactly understood. There's a priest. Could ask him. Par. It's Greek. Parallel. Parallax. Met him pike hoses, she called it, till I told her about the transmigration. Oh, rocks! Mr. Bloom smiled, oh, rocks, at two windows of the ballast office. She's right, after all. Only big words for ordinary things on account of the sound. She's not exactly witty. Can be rude, too. Blurt out what I was thinking. Still, I don't know. She used to say Ben Dollard had a bass barrel tone voice. He has legs like barrels, and you'd think he was singing in to a barrel. Now isn't that wit? They used to call him Big Ben, not half as witty as calling him bass barrel tone. Appetite like an albatross. Get outside of a baron of beef. Powerful man he was at stowing away number one bass. Barrel of bass? See? It all works out. A procession of white-smocked sandwichmen marched slowly towards him along the gutter, scarlet sashes across their boards. Bargains, like that priest they are this morning. We have sinned, we have suffered. He read the scarlet letters on their five tall white hats. H-E-L-Y-S. Wisdom Healy's. Y, lagging behind, drew a chunk of bread from under his foreboard, crammed it into his mouth, and munched as he walked. Our staple food, three bob a day. Walking along the gutters, street after street, just keep skin and bone together, bread and skilly. They are not boil. No imgladesman doesn't bring in any business either. I suggested to him about a transparent show-cart, with two smart girls sitting inside writing letters, copy-books, envelopes, blotting-paper. I bet that would have caught on. Smart girls, writing something catch the eye at once. Everyone dying to know what she's writing. Get twenty of them round you if you stare at nothing. Have a finger in the pie. Women, too. Curiosity. Pillar of salt. Wouldn't have it, of course, because he didn't think of it himself first. Or the ink bottle I suggested with a false stain of black celluloid. His ideas for ads like plum trees potted under the obituaries. Cold meat department. You can't lick em. What? Our envelopes. Hello. Jones, where are you going? Can't stop, Robinson. I am hastening to purchase the only reliable ink eraser cancel, sold by Healy's Limited, 85 Dame Street. Well, out of that ruck I am. Devil of a job it was collecting accounts of those convents. Tranquila convent. That was a nice nun there. Really sweet face. Wimple suited her small head. Sister? Sister? I am sure she was crossed in love by her eyes. Very hard to bargain with that sort of a woman. I disturbed her at her devotions that morning, but glad to communicate with the outside world. Our great day, she said. Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Sweet name, too, Caramel. She knew I. I think she knew by the way she... 
If she had married, she would have changed. I suppose they really were short of money, fried everything in the best butter all the same, no lard for them. My heart's broke eating dripping. They like buttering themselves in and out, Molly tasting it, her veil up. Sister? Pat Clafey, the pawnbroker's daughter. It was a nun, they say, invented barbed wire. He crossed Westmoreland Street when apostrophe S had plotted by. Rover Cycle Shop. Those races are on today. How long ago is that? Your Phil Gilligan died. We were in Lombard Street West. Wait, was in Tom's. Got the job in Wisdom Healy's year we married. Six years. Ten years ago. Ninety-four he died. Yes, that's right. The big fire at Arnott's. Val Dillon was Lord Mayor. The Glen Cree dinner. Alderman Robert O'Reilly emptying the port into his soup before the flag fell. Bob Bob lapping it for the inner alderman. Couldn't hear what the band played. For what we have already received, may the Lord make us. Millie was a kitty then. Molly had that elephant-gray dress with the braided frogs, man-tailored with self-covered buttons. She didn't like it because I sprained my ankle first day. She wore choir picnic at the sugar loaf, as if that. Old Goodwin's tall hat done up with some sticky stuff. Flies picnic, too. Never put a dress on her back like it. Fitted her like a glove, shoulders and hips, just beginning to plump it out well. Rabbit pie we had that day, people looking after her. Happy, happier then. Snug little room that was with the red wallpaper, dockerels, one and ninepence a dozen, Millie's tubbing night, American soap I bought, elderflower, cozy smell of her bathwater, funny she looked soaked all over, shapely too. Now photography. Poor Papa's daguerreotype atelier, he told me of hereditary taste. He walked along the curbstone, stream of life. What was the name of that priestly-looking chap was always squinting in when he passed? Weak eyes, woman. Stopped in Citroen St. Kevin's parade, pen something. Pendennis? My memory is getting... pen? Of course, it's years ago. Noise of the trams, probably. Well, if he couldn't remember the day-father's name that he sees every day. Bartold de Arcy was the tenor, just coming out then, seeing her home after practice. Conceited fellow with his waxed-up mustache. Gave her that song, Winds That Blow From The South. Windy night, that was I went to fetch her there, was that lodge meeting on about those lottery tickets after Goodwin's concert in the supper room or oak room of the mansion house. He and I behind. Sheet of her music blew out of my hand against the high school railings. Lucky it didn't. Thing like that spoils the effect of a night for her. Professor Goodwin linking her in front. Shaky on his pins, poor old sot. His farewell concerts. Positively last appearance on any stage. Maybe for months and maybe for never. Remember her laughing at the wind. Her blizzard collar up. Corner of Harcourt Road, remember that gust. Brfu! Blew up all her skirts and her boa nearly smothered old Goodwin. She did get flushed in the wind. Remember when we got home raking up the fire and frying up those pieces of lap of mutton for her supper with the chutney sauce she liked and the mole drum? Could see her in the bedroom from the hearth unclamping the busk of her stays, white. Swish and soft flop her stays made on the bed, always warm from her, always like to let herself out, sitting there after till near two, taking out her hairpins. Millie tucked up in Betty House, happy, happy. That was the night. Oh, Mr. Bloom, how do you do? 
Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Breen? No use complaining. How is Molly those times? Haven't seen her for ages. In the pink, Mr. Bloom said gaily. Millie has a position down in Mullingar, you know. Go away. Isn't that grand for her? Yes, and the photographer's there, getting on like a house on fire. How are all your charges? All on the baker's list, Mrs. Breen said. How many has she? No other in sight? You're in black, I see. You have no... No, Mr. Bloom said. I have just come from a funeral. Going to crop up all day, I foresee. Who's dead? When and what did he die of? Turn up like a bad penny. Oh, dear me, Mrs. Breen said. I hope it wasn't any near relation. May as well get her sympathy. Dingham, Mr. Bloom said, an old friend of mine. He died quite suddenly, poor fellow. Heart trouble, I believe. Funeral was this morning. Your funeral's tomorrow while you're coming through the rye. Diddle, diddle, dum, dum, diddle, diddle. Sad to lose the old friends, Mrs. Breen's woman eyes, said melancholily. Now that's quite enough about that, just quietly, husband. And your lord and master? Mrs. Breen turned up her two large eyes. Hasn't lost them anyhow. Oh, don't be talking, she said. He's a caution to rattlesnakes. He's in there now with his law books finding out the law of libel. He has me heart scalded. Wait till I show you. Hot mock turtle vapor and steam of new baked jam puffs roly poly poured out from Harrison's. The heavy noonery tickled the top of Mr. Bloom's gullet. Want to make good pastry? Butter, best flour, demerara sugar, or they'd taste it with the hot tea. Or is it from her? A barefoot Arab stood over the grating, breathing in the fumes. Deadened the gnaw of hunger that way. Pleasure or pain, is it? Penny dinner, knife and fork chained to the table. Opening her handbag, chipped leather, hat pin, ought to have a guard on those things, stick it in a chap's eye in the tram, rummaging, open, money, please take one, devils if they lose sixpence, raise cane, husband barging, where's the ten shillings I gave you on Monday? Are you feeding your little brother's family? Soiled handkerchief, medicine bottle. Pastel, that was fell. What is she? There must be a new moon out, she said. He's always bad, then. Do you know what he did last night? Her hand ceased to rummage. Her eyes fixed themselves on him, wide in alarm, yet smiling. What? Mr. Bloom asked. Let her speak. Look straight in her eyes. I believe you. Trust me. Woke me up in the night, she said. Dream he had, a nightmare. Indiges. Said the ace of spades was walking up the stairs. The ace of spades, Mr. Bloom said. She took a folded postcard from her handbag. Read that, she said. He got it this morning. What is it? Mr. Bloom asked, taking the card. U P, U P, up, she said. Someone taking a rise out of him. It's a great shame for them, whoever he is. Indeed it is, Mr. Bloom said. She took back the card, sighing. And now he's going round to Mr. Minton's office. He's going to take an action for ten thousand pounds, he says. She folded the card into her untidy bag and snapped the catch. Same blue serge dress she had two years ago, the nap bleaching. Seen its best days, wispish hair over her ears, and that dowdy toque, three old grapes to take the harm out of it. Shabby genteel, she used to be a tasty dresser, lines round her mouth, only a year or so older than Molly. See the eye that woman gave her, passing, cruel, the unfair sex. He looked still at her, 
holding back behind his look his discontent. Pungent mock turtle, oxtail, mulligatawny, I'm hungry too. Flakes of pastry on the gusset of her dress. Daub of sugary flour stuck to her cheek. Rhubarb tart with liberal fillings. Rich fruit interior. Josie Powell, that was. In Luke Doyle's long ago. Dolphin's barn. The charades. U.P. Up. Change the subject. Do you ever see anything of Mrs. Beaufoy? Mr. Bloom asked. Mina Purefoy, she said. Philip Beaufoy, I was thinking. Playgoers Club. Matcham often thinks of the master stroke. Did I pull the chain? Yes. The last act. Yes. I just called to ask on the way in. Is she over it? She's in the lying in hospital in Hollis Street. Dr. Horn got her in. She's three days bad now. Oh, Mr. Bloom said. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, Mrs. Breen said. And a house full of kids at home. It's a very stiff berth, the nurse told me. Oh, Mr. Bloom said. His heavy, pitting gaze absorbed her news. His tongue clacked in compassion. Tch, tch. I'm sorry to hear that, he said. Poor thing! Three days! That's terrible for her! Mrs. Breen nodded. She was taken bad on the Tuesday. Mr. Bloom touched her funny bone gently, warning her, Mind, let this man pass. A bony form strode along the curbside from the river, staring with a rapt gaze into the sunlight through a heavy stringed glass. Tight as a skull piece, a tiny hat gripped his head. From his arm a folded dust coat, a stick, and an umbrella dangled to his stride. Watch him, Mr. Bloom said. He always walks outside the lamp posts. Watch. Who is he, if it's a fair question? Mrs. Breen asked. Is he dotty? His name is Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell, Mr. Bloom said, smiling. Watch. He has enough of them, she said. Dennis will be like that one of these days. She broke off suddenly. There he is, she said. I must go after him. Goodbye. Remember me to Molly, won't you? I will, Mr. Bloom said. He watched her dodge through passers towards the shop fronts. Dennis Breen in skimpy frock coat and blue canvas shoes shuffled out of Harrison's, hugging two heavy tombs to his ribs. Blown in from the bay, like old times, he suffered her to overtake him without surprise, and thrust his dull gray beard towards her, his loose jaw wagging as he spoke earnestly. Meshuggah, off his chump. Mr. Bloom walked on again easily, seeing ahead of him in sunlight the tight skull piece, the dangling stick umbrella and dust coat, going the two days. Watch him. Out he goes again. One way of getting on in the world, and that other old mosey lunatic in those duds. Hard time she must have with him. U.P. Up. I'll take my oath. That's Alf Bergen, or Richie Golding. Wrote it for Lark in the Scotch house, I bet anything, round to Minton's office, his oyster eyes staring at the postcard. Be a feast for the gods. He passed the Irish Times. There might be other answers lying there, like to answer them all. Good system for criminals. Code. At their lunch now. Clerk with the glasses there doesn't know me. Oh, leave them there to simmer. Enough bother waiting through forty-four of them. Wanted. Smart lady typist to aid gentlemen in literary work. I called you naughty darling because I do not like that other world. Please tell me what is the meaning. Please tell me what perfume does your wife. Tell me who made the world. The way they spring those questions on you. And the other one, Lizzie Twig. My literary efforts have had the good fortune to meet with the approval of the eminent poet A. E. Mr. G. O. Russell. No time to do her hair drinking sloppy tea with a book of poetry. Best paper by long chalks for a small ad. Got the provinces now. 
Cook and General EXE Cuisine Housemaid Kept Wanted Live Man for Spirit Counter. RESP Girl RC Wishes to Hear of Post in Fruit or Pork Shop. James Carlyle made that 6.5% dividend. Made a big deal on Coates' shares. Cacanny cunning old Scotch hunks. All the toady news. Our gracious and popular vice reign. Bought the Irish field now. Lady Mountcashel has quite recovered after her confinement and rode out with the Ward Union staghounds at the enlargement yesterday at Rathowith. Uneatable fox. Pot hunters, too. Fear injects juices make it tender enough for them. Riding astride. Sit her horse like a man. Weight-carrying huntress. No side-saddle or pillion for her. Not for Joe. First to the meat and in at the death. Strong as a brood mare, some of these horsey women. Swagger around livery stables. Toss off a glass of brandy neat while you'd say knife. That one at the Grovner this morning. Up with her on the car, whish, whish. Stonewall or five-barred gate put her mount to it. Think that pug driver did it out of spite. Who is this she was like? Oh, yes. Mrs. Miriam Dandrade, that sold me her old wraps and black underclothes in the Shelbourne Hotel. Divorced Spanish-American. Didn't take a feather out of her my handling them. As if I was her clothes horse. Saw her in the Vice Regal party when Stubbs, the park ranger, got me in with Whelan of the Express, scavenging with the quality left. High tea. Mayonnaise I poured on the plums, thinking it was custard. Her ears ought to have tingled for a few weeks after. Want to be a bull for her, born courtesan. No nursery work for her, thanks. Poor Mrs. Purefoy, Methodist husband, method in his madness. Saffron bun and milk and soda lunch in the educational dairy, YMCA, eating with a stopwatch. Thirty-two chews to the minute. And still his mutton-chop whiskers grew. Supposed to be well-connected. Theodore's cousin in Dublin Castle. One Tony relative in every family. Hardy annuals he presents her with. Saw him out at the three jolly toppers marching along bareheaded, and his eldest boy carrying one in a market net. The squalors. Poor thing! Then having to give the breast year after year all hours of the night. Selfish those titis are, dog in the manger, only one lump of sugar in my tea, if you please. End of section 11. Recorded by Nathan Jordan. Section 12 of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nathan Jordan. Ulysses by James Joyce. Part 2. The Odyssey. Episode 8. Lestragonians. Part 2. He stood at Fleet Street Crossing. Luncheon interval. A sixpenny at Rose. Must look up that ad in the National Library. An eightpenny in the Burton. Better. On my way. He walked on past Bolton's Westmoreland house. T. 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 I forgot to tap Tom Kernan. S. T. 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 -t Three days imagine groaning on a bed with a vinegared handkerchief round her forehead. Her belly swollen out. Phew! Dreadful simply. Child's head too big. Forceps doubled up inside her, trying to butt its way out blindly, groping for the way out. Kill me, that would. Lucky Molly got over hers lightly. They ought to invent something to stop that. Life with hard labor. Twilight sleep idea. Queen Victoria was given that. Nine she had. A good layer. Old woman that lived in a shoe. She had so many children. Suppose he was consumptive time someone thought about it instead of gassing about the what was it the pensive bosom of the silver effulgence flapdoodle to feed fools on 
They could easily have big establishments, whole thing quite painless out of all the taxes, give every child born five quid at compound interest, up to twenty-one five per cent is a hundred shillings and five tiresome pounds multiplied by twenty decimal system, encourage people to put by money, save hundred and ten and a bit twenty-one years, want to work it out on paper, come to a tidy sum more than you think. Not still born, of course. They are not even registered. Trouble for nothing. Funny sight, two of them together, their bellies out, Molly and Mrs. Moisel, mothers meeting. Pithesis retires for the time being, then returns. How flat they look all of a sudden after. Peaceful eyes, weight off their mind. Old Mrs. Thornton was a jolly old soul. All my babies, she said, the spoon of pap in her mouth before she fed them. Oh, that's yum yum. Got her hand crushed by old Tom Wall's son. His first bow to the public. Head like a prize pumpkin. Snuffy Dr. Murren. People knocking them up at all hours. For God's sake, doctor. Wife in her throes. Then keep them waiting months for their fee. To attendance on your wife. No gratitude in people. Humane doctors. Most of them. Before the huge high door of the Irish House of Parliament a flock of pigeons flew, their little frolic after meals. Who will we do it on? I pick the fellow in black. Here goes. Here's good luck. Must be thrilling from the air. Apjohn, myself and Owen Goldberg up in the trees near Goose Green playing the monkeys. Mackerel, they called me. A squad of constables debauched from College Street, marching in Indian file. Goose step. Food heated faces, sweating helmets, patting their truncheons, after their feed with a good load of fat soup under their belts. Policemen's lot is oft a happy one. They split up in groups and scattered, saluting, towards their beats. Let out to graze, best moment to attack one in pudding time a punch in his dinner, a squad of others marching irregularly, rounded trinity railings marking for the station, bound for their troughs, prepare to receive cavalry, prepare to receive soup. He crossed under Tommy Moore's roguish finger. They did right to put him up over a urinal, meeting of the waters, ought to be places for women, running into cake shops, settle my hat straight. There is naught in this wide world of Ali. Great song of Julia Morkins. Kept her voice up to the very last. Pupil of Michael Balfi's, wasn't she? He gazed after the last broad tunic. Nasty customers to tackle. Jack Power could a tale unfold. Father a G-man. If a fellow gave them trouble being lagged, they'd let him have it hot and heavy in the bridewell. Can't blame them, after all, with the job they have, especially the young hornies. That horse policeman, the day Joe Chamberlain was given his degree in Trinity, he got a run for his money. My word, he did. His horse's hoofs clattering after us down Abbey Street. Lucky I had the presence of mind to dive into Manning's, or I was souped. He did come a wallop by George, must have cracked his skull on the cobblestones. I oughtn't to have got myself swept along with those medicals, and the Trinity jibs in their mortarboards, looking for trouble. Still I got to know that young Dixon, who dressed that sting for me in the mater, and now he's in Hollis Street, where Mrs. Purefoy, wheels within wheels, police whistle in my ears still, all skedaddled, why he fixed on me give me in charge right here it began up the boars three cheers for duet we'll hang joe chamberlain on a sour apple tree silly billies mob of young cubs yelling their guts out vinegar hill the butter exchange band few years time half of them magistrates and civil servants war comes on into the army helter skelter same fellows used to, whether on the scaffold high. Never know who you're talking to. Corny Kelleher, he was Harvey Duff in his eye. 
like that Peter or Dennis or James Carey that blew the gaff on the Invincibles. Member of the corporation, too, egging raw youths on to get in the know, all the time drawing secret service pay from the castle. Drop him like a hot potato. Why, those plain-clothes men are always courting slavies. Easily twig a man used to uniform. Square pushing up against the back door. Maul her a bit. Then the next thing on the menu. And who is the gentleman does be visiting there? Was the young master saying anything? Peeping Tom through the keyhole. Decoy duck. Hot-blooded young student fooling round her fat arms, ironing. Are those yours, Mary? I don't wear such things. Stop, or I'll tell the missus on you, out half the night. There are great times coming, Mary. Wait till you see. Ah, go along with your great times coming. Barmaids, too. Tobacco shop girls. James Stevens' idea was the best. He knew them. Circles of ten so that a fellow couldn't round on more than his own ring. Sin fine. Back out you get the knife. Hidden hand. Stay in. The firing squad. Turnkey's daughter got him out of Richmond. Off from Lusk. Putting up in the Buckingham Palace Hotel under their very noses. Gerbaldi. You must have a certain fascination, Parnell. Arthur Griffith is a square-headed fellow, but he has no go in him for the mob, or gas about our lovely land. Gammon and spinach. Dublin Bakery Company's Tea Room, debating societies. That republicanism is the best form of government. That the language question should take precedence of the economic question. Have your daughters inveigling them to your house. Stuff them up with meat and drink. Michaelmus Goose. Here's a good lump of thyme seasoning under the apron for you. Have another quart of goose grease before it gets too cold. Half enthusiast. Penny roll and a walk with the band. No grace for the carver. The thought that the other chap pays best sauce in the world. Make themselves thoroughly at home. Show us over those apricots, meaning peaches. The not far distant day. Home rule sun rising up in the northwest. His smile faded as he walked. A heavy cloud hiding the sun slowly. Shadowing Trinity's surly front. Trams passed one another. Ingoing, outgoing, clanging. Useless words. Things go on same, day after day. Squads of police marching out, back, trams in, out. Those two loonies mooching about. Dingdom carted off. Mina Purefoy swollen belly on a bed groaning to have a child tugged out of her. One born every second somewhere. Other dying every second. Since I fed the birds five minutes. Three hundred kicked the bucket, other three hundred born, washing the blood off. All are washed in the blood of the lamb, bawling, ma. City full passing away, other city full coming, passing away too, other coming on, passing on. Houses, lines of houses, streets, miles of pavements. Piled up bricks, stones, changing hands, this owner, that. Landlord never dies, they say. Other steps into his shoes when he gets his notice to quit. They buy the place up with gold, and still they have all the gold. Swindle in it somewhere. Piled up in cities, worn away age after age. Pyramids in sand. Built on bread and onions, slaves, Chinese wall, Babylon, big stones left, round towers, rest rubble, sprawling suburbs, jerry built, Kerwan's mushroom houses built of breeze, shelter for the night. No one is anything. This is the very worst hour of the day. Vitality, dull, Gloomy, hate this hour, 
feel as if I had been eaten and spewed. Provost's House The Reverend Dr. Salmon Tin Salmon Well tinned and there, like a mortuary chapel. Wouldn't live in it if they paid me. Hope they have liver and bacon today. Nature abhors a vacuum. The sun freed itself slowly and lit glints of light among the silverware opposite in Walter Sexton's window, by which John Howard Parnell passed, unseeing. There he is, the brother, image of him, haunting face. Now that's a coincidence. Course hundreds of times you think of a person and don't meet him, like a man walking in his sleep. No one knows him. Must be a corporation meeting today. They say he never put on the city marshal's uniform since he got the job. Charlie Cavanaugh used to come out on his high horse, cocked hat, puffed, powdered, and shaved. Look at the woebegone walk of him, eaten a bad egg, poached eyes on ghost. I have a pain, great man's brother, his brother's brother. He'd look nice on the city charger, drop into the DBC probably for his coffee, play chess there. His brother used men as pawns. Let them all go to pot. Afraid to pass a remark on him. Freeze them up with that eye of his. That's the fascination, the name, all a bit touched. Mad Fanny and his other sister, Mrs. Dickinson, driving about with scarlet harness. Bolt upright like Surgeon Mardell. Still, David Sheehy beat him for South Mead. Apply for the Chiltern Hundreds and retire into public life. The Patriots' banquet, eating orange peels in the park. Simon de Dallas said, when they put him in Parliament, that Parnell would come back from the grave and lead him out of the House of Commons by the arm. Of the two-headed octopus, one of whose heads is the head upon which the ends of the world have forgotten to come, while the other speaks with a Scotch accent, the tentacles. They passed from behind Mr. Bloom along the curbstone, beard and bicycle, young woman. And there he is, too. Now that's really a coincidence, second time. Coming events cast their shadows before with the approval of the eminent poet Mr. Geo Russell. That might be Lizzie Twig with him. A.E. What does that mean? Initials, perhaps? Albert Edward, Arthur Edmund, Alphonsus Eb Ed L. Esquire. What was he saying? The ends of the world with a Scotch accent? Tentacles. Octopus. Something occult. Symbolism. Holding forth. She's taking it all in not saying a word, to aid gentlemen in literary work. His eyes followed the high figure in homespun, beard and bicycle, a listening woman at his side, coming from the vegetarian. Only vegibobbles and fruit. Don't eat a beefsteak. If you do, the eyes of that cow will pursue you through all eternity. They say it's healthier. Wind and watery, though. Tried it. Keep you on the run all day bad as a bloater. Dreams all night. Why do they call that thing they gave me nut steak? Nutarians, fruitarians. To give you the idea, you are eating rump steak. Absurd. Salty, too. They cook in soda. Keep you sitting by the tap all night. Her stockings are loose over her ankles. I detest that. So tasteless. Those literary, ethereal people they are all. Dreamy, cloudy, symbolistic. Esthetes they are. I wouldn't be surprised if it was that kind of food you see produces the like waves of the brain, the poetical. For example, one of those policemen sweating Irish stew into their shirts, you couldn't squeeze a line of poetry out of him. Don't know what poetry is, even. Must be in a certain mood. The dreamy, cloudy gull waves o'er the waters dull. He crossed at Nassau Street corner and stood before the window of Yates and Son, pricing the field glasses. Or will I drop into old Harris's and have a chat with young Sinclair, well-mannered fellow, probably at his lunch? Must get those old glasses of mine set right. Gertz lenses six guineas. Germans making their way everywhere. Sell on easy terms to capture trade. Undercutting. 
might chance on a pair in the railway lost property office. Astonishing the things people leave behind them in trains and cloakrooms. What do they be thinking about? Women, too. Incredible. Last year, traveling to Ennis, had to pick up that farmer's daughter's ba and hand it to her at Limerick Junction. Unclaimed money, too. There's a little watch up there on the roof of the bank to test those glasses by. His lids came down on the lower rims of his irides. Can't see it. If you imagine it's there, you can almost see it. Can't see it. He faced about and, standing between the awnings, held out his right hand at arm's length towards the sun. Wanted to try that often. Yes, completely. The tip of his little finger blotted out the sun's disk. Must be the focus where the rays cross. If I had black glasses... Interesting. There was a lot of talk about those sunspots when we were in Lombard Street West. Looking up from the back garden. Terrific explosions they are. There will be a total eclipse this year. Autumn sometime. Now that I come to think of it, that ball falls at Greenwich time. It's the clock is worked by an electric wire from Dunsink. Must go out there some first Saturday of the month. If I could get an introduction to Professor Jolie, or learn up something about his family, that would do too. Man always feels complimented. Flattery where least expected. Nobleman proud to be descended from some king's mistress. His foremother lay it on with a trowel. Captain Hand goes through the land, not go in, and blurt out what you know you're not to. What's parallax? shows this gentleman the door. Ah. His hand fell to his side again. Never know anything about it. Waste of time. Gas balls spinning about, crossing each other, passing. Same old ding-dong always. Gas, then solid, then world, then cold, then dead shell drifting around. Frozen rock, like that pineapple rock. The moon... Must be a new moon out, she said. I believe there is. He went on by La Maison Claire. Wait, the full moon was the night we were Sunday fortnight exactly. There is a new moon. Walking down by the Tolka. Not bad for a Fairview moon. She was humming. The young May moon. She's beaming. Love. He other side of her arm, he, glowworms la amp is gleaming, love, touch, fingers, asking, answer, yes, stop, stop, if it was, it was, must, Mr. Bloom, quick breathing, slowlier, walking past Atom Court, with the keep quiet relief his eyes took note, this is the street here, middle of the day, of Bob Doran's bottle shoulders, on his annual bend, M. Coy said, they drink in order to say or do something, or chasser la femme, up in the coom with chummies and streetwalkers, and then the rest of the year sober as a judge. Yes, thought so, sloping into the empire, gone, plain soda would do him good, where Pat Kinsella had his harp theater before Whitbread ran the Queen's. Broth of a boy. Dion Bucico, business with his harvest moon face in a pokey bonnet, three pretty maids from school, how time flies, eh? Showing long red pantaloons under his skirts, drinkers drinking, laughed spluttering, their drink against their breath, more power, pat, coarse red, fun for drunkards, guffaw and smoke, Take off that white hat, his parboiled eyes. Where is he now? Beggar somewhere, the harp that once did starve us all. I was happier then. Or was that I? Or am I now I? Twenty-eight I was. She, twenty-three. When we left Lombard Street West, something changed. Could never like it again after Rudy. Can't bring back time, like holding water in your hand. Would you go back to then? Just beginning then, would you? 
Are you not happy in your home, you poor little naughty boy? Wants to sew on buttons for me. I must answer. Write it in the library. Grafton Street, gay with housed awnings, lured his senses. Muslin prints, silk dames, and dowagers, jingle of harnesses, hoof thuds, low ringing in the baking causeway. Thick feet that woman has in the white stockings. Hope the rain mucks them up on her. Country bread, cha bacon. All the beef to the heels we're in always gives a woman clumsy feet. Molly looks out of plum. He passed, dallying, the windows of brown Thomas, silk mercers, cascades of ribbons, flimsy china silks, a tilted urn poured from its mouth a flood of blood-hued poplin, lustrous blood. The Huguenots brought that here. La Casa e Santa, Tara Tara, great chorus that, Tari Tara, must be washed in rainwater, Meyer beer, Tara, bom bom bom, pincushions, I'm a long time threatening to buy one, sticking them all over the place, needles and window curtains. He bared slightly his left forearm, scrape nearly gone, not today anyhow, must go back for that lotion, for her birthday perhaps. June, July, August, September, 8th. Nearly three months off. Then she mightn't like it. Women won't pick up pins. Say it cut slow. Gleaming silks, petticoats on slim brass rails, rays of flat silk stockings. Unless to go back. Had to be. Tell me all. High voices, sun-warm silk, jingling harnesses, all for a woman. Home and houses, silk webs, silver, rich fruit spicy from Jaffa, Agendath Nitame, wealth of the world. A warm human plumpness settled down on his brain. His brain yielded, perfume of embraces all him assailed. With hungered flesh obscurely, he mutely craved to adore. Duke Street, here we are, must eat, the Burton, feel better then. He turned Combridge's corner, still pursued, jingling, hoof thuds, perfumed bodies, warm, full, all kissed, yielded, in deep summer fields, tangled pressed grass, in trickling hallways of tenements, along sofas, creaking beds. Jack, love, darling, kiss me, Reggie, my boy, love, his heart astir, he pushed in the door of the Burton restaurant. Stink gripped his trembling breath. Pungent meat juice, slush of greens, see the animals feed. Men, men, men. Perched on high stools by the bar, hats shoved back, at the tables calling for more bread, no charge, swilling, wolfing gobfuls of sloppy food, their eyes bulging, wiping wetted mustaches. A pallid, soot-faced young man polished his tumbler, knife, fork, and spoon with his napkin. New set of microbes. A man with an infant sauce-stained napkin tucked around him shoveled gurgling soup down his gullet. A man spitting back on his plate, half-masticated gristle, gums, no teeth to chew, chew, chew it. Chump, chop from the grill bolting to get it over, sad boozer's eyes, bitten off more than he can chew. Am I like that? See yourselves as others see us. Hungry man is an angry man, working tooth and jaw. Don't! Oh, a bone! That last pagan king of Ireland Cormac in the school poem choked himself at Sletty southward of the Boyne. Wonder what he was eating. Something... Galoptious. St. Patrick converted him to Christianity. Couldn't swallow it all, however. Roast beef and cabbage. One stew. Smells of men. His gorge rose. Spatten sawdust. Sweetish, warmish cigarette smoke. Reek of plug. Spilt beer. Men's beery piss. The stale of ferment. Couldn't eat a morsel here fellow sharpening knife and fork to eat all before him, old chap picking his tootles, slight spasm, full, chewing the cud, before and after, grace after meals. Look on this picture, then, on that. 
scoffing up stew gravy with sopping sippets of bread, lick it off the plate, man. Get out of this. He gazed round the stooled and tabled eaters, tightening the wings of his nose. Two stouts here, one corned and cabbage. That fellow ramming a knife full of cabbage down, as if his life depended on it. Good stroke. Give me the fidgets to look, safer to eat from his three hands. Tear it limb from limb, second nature to him, born with a silver knife in his mouth. That's witty, I think, or no. Silver means born rich, born with a knife, but then the illusion is lost. An ill-girt server gathered sticky, clattering plates. Rock, the head bailiff, standing at the bar, blew the foamy crown from his tankard. Well up, it splashed yellow near his boot. A diner, knife and fork upright, elbows on table, ready for a second helping, stared towards the food lift across his stained square of newspaper. Other chap telling him something with his mouth full, sympathetic listener, table talk. I munched hum un through Unchester bunk a munch day. Ha? Huh? Did you faith? Mr. Bloom raised two fingers doubtfully to his lips. His eyes said, Not here. Don't see him. Out. I hate dirty eaters. He backed towards the door. Get a light snack in Davy Burns. Stop gag. Keep me going. Had a good breakfast. Roast and mashed here. Pint of stout. Every fellow for his own, tooth and nail, gulp, grub, gulp, gob stuff. He came out into clearer air and turned back towards Grafton Street. Eat or be eaten. Kill, kill. Suppose that communal kitchen, years to come, perhaps, all trotting down with porringers and tommy cans to be filled, devour contents in the street. John Howard Parnell example, the provost of Trinity, Every mother's son, don't talk of your provost and provost of Trinity women and children, cabmen, priests, parsons, field marshals, archbishops. From Aylesbury Road, Clyde Road, Artisan Dwellings, North Dublin Union, Lord Mayor in his gingerbread coach, Old Queen in a bath chair, my plate's empty. After you with our incorporated drinking cup. Like Sir Philip Crampton's fountain, rub off the microbes with your handkerchief. Next chap rubs on a new batch with his, Father O'Flynn, would make hers of them all. Have rows all the same, all for number one, children fighting for the scrappings of the pot. Want a soup pot as big as the Phoenix Park, harpooning flitches and hindquarters out of it. Hate people all round you. City Arms Hotel, table de hote, she called it, soup, joint and sweet. Never know whose thoughts you're chewing. Then who'd wash up all the plates and forks? Might be all feeding on tabloids that time, teeth getting worse and worse. After all, there's a lot in that vegetarian fine flavor of things from the earth garlic, of course. It stinks after Italian organ grinders, crisp of the onions, mushrooms, truffles, pain to the animal, too. Pluck and draw fowl, wretched brutes there at the cattle market, waiting for the pole-axe to split their skulls open. Moo! Poor trembling calves, meh. Staggering bob, bubble and squeak, butcher's buckets, wobbly lights, Give us that brisket off the hook. Plop, raw head and bloody bones. Flayed, glass-eyed sheep hung from their haunches. Sheep snouts, bloody papered, sniveling, nose jam on sawdust. Top and lashers going out. Don't maul them pieces, young one. Hot, fresh blood they prescribe for decline. Blood always needed. Insidious, lick it up, smoking hot, thick sugary, famished ghosts. Ah, I'm hungry. He entered Davy Burns. Moral pub, he doesn't chat. Stands a drink now and then, but in leap year once in four. Cashed a check for me once. 
what will I take now? He drew his watch. Let me see now. Shandy Gaff? Hello, Bloom, Nosy Flynn said from his nook. Hello, Flynn. How's things? Tip-top. Let me see. I'll take a glass of burgundy and let me see. Sardines on the shelves. Almost taste them by looking. Sandwich? Ham and his descendants. Mustard and bread there. Potted meats. What is home without plum trees? Potted meat. Incomplete. What a stupid ad. Under the obituary notices they stuck it. All up a plum tree. Dingham's potted meat. Cannibals, wood with lemon and rice. White missionary, too salty. Like pickled pork. Expect the chief consumes the parts of honor. Ought to be tough from exercise. His wives in a row to watch the effect. There was a right royal old man who ate or something, the somethings of the reverend Mr. MacTrigger. With it an abode of bliss, Lord knows what concoction. Calls, mouldy, tripes, windpipes, faked and minced up. Puzzle find the meat. Kosher. No meat and milk together. Hygiene. That was what they call now. Yom Kippur. Fast spring cleaning of inside. Peace and war depend on some fellow's digestion. Religions. Christmas turkeys and geese. Slaughter of innocence. Eat, drink, and be merry. Then casual wards full after. Heads bandaged. Cheese digests all but itself. Mitty cheese. Have you a cheese sandwich? Yes, sir. Like a few olives, too, if they had them. Italian, I prefer. Good glass of burgundy, take away that. Lubricate. A nice salad, cool as a cucumber. Tom Kernan can dress. Puts gusto into it. Pure olive oil. Millie served me that cutlet with a sprig of parsley. Take one Spanish onion. God made food. The devil the cooks. Deviled crab? Wife well? Quite well, thanks. A cheese sandwich, then. Gargonzola, have you? Yes, sir. Nosy Flynn sipped his grog. Doing any singing those times? Look at his mouth. Could whistle in his own ear. Flap ears to match. Music? Knows as much about it as my coachman. Still better tell him. Does no harm. Free ad. She's engaged for a big tour end of this month. You may have heard, perhaps. No. Oh, that's the style. Who's getting it up? The curate served. How much is that? Seven D, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bloom cut his sandwich into slender strips. Mr. McTrigger. Easier than the dreamy, creamy stuff. His five hundred wives had the time of their lives. Mustard, sir? Thank you. He studded under each lifted strip yellow blobs, their lives. I have it. It grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Getting it up, he said. Well, it's like a company idea, you see. Part shares and part profits. Hey, now I remember. Nosy Flynn said, putting his hand in his pocket to scratch his groin. Who is this was telling me? Isn't Blaze's Boylan mixed up in it? A warm shock of air heat of mustard haunched on Mr. Bloom's heart. He raised his eyes and met the stare of a bilious clock. Two, pub clock five minutes fast. Time going on. Hands moving. Two, not yet. His midriff yearned, then upward, sank within him. Yearned more longly, longingly. Wine. He smell-sipped the cordial juice, and bidding his throat strongly to speed it, set his wine-glass delicately down. Yes, he said. He's the organizer in point of fact. No fear, no brains, nosy Flynn snuffled and scratched, flea having a good square meal. He had a good slice of luck. Jack Mooney was telling me, over that boxing match, Myler Kogue won again that soldier in the Portobello barracks. By God, he had that little kipper down in the County Carlo, he was telling me. Hope that dewdrop doesn't come down into his glass. No, snuffled it up. 
for near a month, man, before it came off, sucking duck eggs by God till further orders. Keep him off the booze, see? Oh, by God, Blazes is a hairy chap. Davy Byrne came forward from the hind bar in tuck-stitched shirt sleeves, cleaning his lips with two wipes of his napkin. Herring's blush, whose smile upon each feature plays with such and such replete. Too much fat on the parsnips. And here's himself and pepper on him, Nosy Flynn said. Can you give us a good one for the gold cup? I'm off that, Mr. Flynn, Davy Byrne answered. I never put anything on a horse. You're right there, Nosy Flynn said. End of section 12. Recorded by Nathan Jordan. Section 13 of Ulysses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nathan Jordan. Ulysses by James Joyce. Part 2. The Odyssey. Episode 8. Lestragonians. Part 3. Mr. Bloom ate his strips of sandwich, fresh clean bread, with relish of disgust, pungent mustard, the feety savor of green cheese. Sips of his wine soothed his palate. Not logwood, that. Tastes fuller this weather with the chill off. Nice quiet bar. Nice piece of wood in that counter. Nicely planed, like the way it curves there. I wouldn't do anything at all in that line, Davy Byrne said. It ruined many a man, the same horses. Vintner's sweepstake, licensed for the sale of beer, wine, and spirits for consumption on the premises. Heads I win, tails you lose. True for you, Nosy Flynn said, unless you're in the know. There's no straight sport going now. Linehan gets some good ones. He's giving scepter today. Zinfandel's the favorite. Lord Howard de Walden's won at Epsom. Morney Cannon is riding him. I could have got seven to one against St. Amant a fortnight before. That's so, Davy Byrne said. He went towards the window and, taking up the petty cash book, scanned its pages. I could, faith, Nosy Flynn said, snuffling. That was a rare bit of horse flesh. St. Fruscrin was her sire. She won in the thunderstorm, Rothschild's filly, with wadding in her ears. Blue jacket and yellow cap. Bad luck to Big Ben Dollard and his John O'Gant. He put me off it, eh? He drank resignedly from his tumbler, running his fingers down the flutes. Eh, he said, sighing. Mr. Bloom, champing, standing, looked upon his sigh. Nosy numbskull. Will I tell him that horse Linehan? He knows already. Better let him forget. Go and lose more. Fool and his money. Dewdrop coming down again. Cold nose he'd have kissing a woman. Still, they might like. Prickly beards they like. Dogs, cold noses. Old Mrs. Riordan with the rumbling stomach sky terrier in the city arms hotel. Molly fondling him in her lap. Oh, the big doggy bow wowsy wowsy. Wine soaked and softened, rolled pith of bread mustard, a moment mawkish cheese. Nice wine it is. Taste it better because I'm not thirsty. Bath, of course, does that. Just a bite or two. Then about six o'clock I can. Six. Six. Time will be gone then. She. Mild fire of wine kindled his veins. I wanted that badly, felt so off-color. His eyes unhungrily saw shelves of tins, sardines, gaudy lobsters, claws, all the odd things people pick up for food. Out of shells, periwinkles with a pin, off trees, snails out of the ground, the French eat, out of the sea with bait on a hook, silly fish learn nothing in a thousand years. If you didn't know risky putting anything into your mouth, poisonous berries, 
Johnny Maggery's roundness you think good. Gaudy color warns you off. One fellow told another, and so on. Try it on the dog first. Led on by the smell or the look, tempting fruit, ice cones, cream, instinct. Orange groves, for instance, need artificial irrigation. Leibtreistrasse, yes, but what about oysters? Unsightly like a clot of phlegm, filthy shells, devil to open them too. Who found them out? Garbage, sewage they feed on, fizz and red bank oysters, effect on the sexual. Aphroditus, he was in the red bank this morning. Was he oysters, old fish at table, perhaps? He young flesh in bed, no June has, no are no oysters. But there are people like things high, tainted game, jugged hair, first catch your hair. Chinese eating eggs fifty years old, blue and green again. Dinner of thirty courses. Each dish harmless might mix inside. Idea for a poison mystery. That Archduke Leopold, was it, no, yes, or was it Otto, one of those Habsburgs, or who was it used to eat the scruff off his own head? Cheapest lunch in town, of course, aristocrats, then the others copy to be in the fashion. Milly to rock oil and flour, raw pastry I like myself, half the catch of oysters they throw back in the sea to keep up the price cheap no one would buy caviar do the grand hawk in green glasses swelled blowout lady this powdered bosom pearls the elite creme de la creme they want special dishes to pretend they're hermit with the platter of pulse keep down the stings of the flesh know me come eat with me royal sturgeon high sheriff Coffee, the butcher, write to venisons of the forest from his ex. Send him back the half of a cow. Spread I saw down in the master of the roll's kitchen area. White-hatted chef like a rabbi. Combustible duck. Curly cabbage a la Duchesse de Parma. Just as well to write it on the bill of fare, so you can know what you've eaten. Too many drugs spoil the broth. I know it myself dosing it with Edward's desiccated soup, geese stuffed silly for them. Lobsters boiled alive. Do take some Tommy gun. Wouldn't mind being a waiter in a swell hotel. Tips, evening dress, half-naked ladies. May I tempt you to a little more filet lemon sole, Miss Dubidad? Yes, Dubidad. And she did, Bedad. Huguenot name, I expect that. A Miss Dubidad lived in Killiney, I remember. Du de la French. Still, it's the same fish, perhaps, old Mickey Hanlon of Moore Street ripped the guts out of making money, hand over fist, finger in fish's gills, can't write his name on a check, think he was painting the landscape with his mouth twisted. Muakil. Ah, acha ha, ignorant as a kish of Bruges, worth fifty thousand pounds. Stuck on the pane, two flies buzzed, stuck. Glowing wine on his palate lingered, swallowed, crushing in the wine press grapes of Burgundy. Sun's heat it is, seems to a secret touch telling me memory. Touched his sense, moistened, remembered, hidden under wild ferns on Howth. Below us, bay sleeping, sky, no sound, the sky, the bay purple by the lion's head, green by Drumlick, yellow green towards Sutton, fields of undersea, the lines faint brown in grass, buried cities, pillowed on my coat, she had her hair, earwigs in the heather scrub, my hand under her nape, you'll toss me all, oh wonder. Cool, soft, with ointments, her hand touched me, caressed. Her eyes upon me did not turn away. Ravished over her I lay, full lips, full open. Kissed her mouth, yum. Softly she gave me in my mouth the seed cake warm and chewed. 
mawkish pulp her mouth had mumbled sweet sour of her spittle joy i ate it joy young life her lips that gave me pouting soft warm sticky gum jelly lips flowers her eyes were take me willing eyes pebbles fell she lay still a goat no one high on ben howth rhododendrums and any goat walking sure-footed dropping currents screened under ferns she laughed warm-folded wildly i lay on her kissed her eyes her lips her stretched neck beating woman's breasts full in her blouse of nuns veiling fat nipples upright hot i tongued her she kissed me i was kissed all yielding she tossed my hair kissed she kissed me me and me now stuck the flies buzzed his downcast eyes followed the silent veining of the oaken slab beauty it curves curves our beauty shapely goddesses venus juno curves the world admires can see them library museum standing in the round hall naked goddesses aids to digestion they don't care what man looks all to see never speaking i mean to say to fellows like flynn suppose she did pygmalion and galatea what would she say first mortal put you in your proper place quaffing nectar at mess with the gods golden dishes all ambrosial not like a tanner lunch we have boiled mutton carrots and turnips bottle of allsop nectar imagine it drinking electricity god's food lovely forms of women sculpted junonian immortal lovely and we stuffing food in one hole and out behind food kyle blood dung earth food have to feed it like stoking an engine they have no never looked i'll look today keeper won't see bend down let something drop see if she dribbling a quiet message from his bladder came to go to do not to do there to do a man and ready he drained his glass to the lees and walked to men too they gave themselves manly conscious lay with men lovers a youth enjoyed her to the yard when the sound of his boots had ceased davy byrne said from his book what is this he is isn't he in the insurance line he's out of that long ago nosy flynn said he does canvassing for the freemen i know him well to see davy byrne said is he in trouble trouble nosy flynn said not that i heard of why i noticed he was in mourning was he nosy flynn said so he was faith i asked him how he was all at home you're right by god so he was i never broached the subject davy byrne said humanely if i see a gentleman is in trouble that way it only brings it up fresh in their minds it's not the wife anyhow nosy flynn said i met him the day before yesterday and he coming out of that irish farm dairy john weiss nolan's wife has in henry street with a jar of cream in his hand taking it home to his better half she's well nourished i tell you plovers on toast and is he doing for the freeman davy byrne said nosy flynn pursed his lips he doesn't buy cream on the ads he picks up you can make bacon of that how so davy byrne asked coming from his book nosy flynn made swift passes in the air with juggling fingers he winked he's in the craft he said do you tell me so davy byrne said very much so nosy flynn said ancient free and accepted order he's an excellent brother light life and love by god they give him a leg up i was told that by a well i won't say who is that a fact 
Oh, it's a fine order, Nosy Flynn said. They stick to you when you're down. I know a fellow was trying to get into it. But they're as close as damn it. By God, they did right to keep the women out of it. Davy Byrne smiled, yawned, and nodded, all in one. I a charge. There was one woman, Nosy Flynn said, hid herself in a clock to find out what they do be doing. But be damned, but they smelt her out and swore her in on the spot of Master Mason. That was one of the St. Ledgers of Donnerail. Davy Byrne, sated after his yawn, said with tear-washed eyes, And is that a fact? Decent, quiet man he is. I often saw him in here, and I never once saw him, you know, over the line. God Almighty couldn't make him drunk, Nosy Flynn said firmly. Slips off when the fun gets too hot. Didn't you see him look at his watch? Ah, you weren't there. If you ask him to have a drink, first thing he does, he outs with the watch to see what he ought to imbibe. Declare to God he does. There are some like that, Davy Byrne said. He's a safe man, I'd say. He's not too bad, Nosy Flynn said, snuffling it up. He's been known to put his hand down to help a fellow, give the devil his due. Oh, Bloom has his good points, but there's one thing he'll never do. His hand scrawled a dry pen signature beside his grog. I know, Davy Byrne said. Nothing in black and white, Nosy Flynn said. Paddy Leonard and Bantam Lyons came in. Tom Rockford followed, frowning, a planing hand on his claret waistcoat. "'Day, Mr. Byrne. Day, gentlemen.' They paused at the counter. "'Who's standing?' Paddy Leonard asked. "'I'm sitting anyhow,' Nosy Flynn answered. "'Well, what'll it be?' Paddy Leonard asked. "'I'll take a stone ginger,' Bantam Lyon said. "'How much?' Paddy Leonard cried. "'Since when, for God's sake?' What's yours, Tom? How is the main drainage? Nosy Flynn asked, sipping. For answer, Tom Rockford pressed his hand to his breastbone and hiccuped. Would I trouble you for a glass of fresh water, Mr. Byrne? he said. Certainly, sir. Paddy Leonard eyed his alemates. Lord love a duck, he said. Look at what I'm standing drinks to. Cold water and ginger pop. Two fellows that would suck whiskey off a sore leg. He has some bloody horse up his sleeve for the gold cup. A dead snip. Zinfandel, is it? Nosy Flynn asked. Tom Rockford spilt powder from a twisted paper into the water set before him. That cursed dyspepsia, he said before drinking. Bread soda is very good, Davy Byrne said. Tom Rockford nodded and drank. Is it Zinfandel? Say nothing! Bantam Lyons winked. I'm going to plunge five bob on my own. Tell us if you're worth your salt and be damned to you, Paddy Leonard said. Who gave it to you? Mr. Bloom, on his way out, raised three fingers in greeting. So long, Nosy Flynn said. The others turned. That's the man now that gave it to me, Bantam Lyons whispered. Prt! Paddy Leonard said with scorn, Mr. Byrne, sir. We'll take two of your small Jamesons after that, and, uh, stone ginger, Davy Byrne added civilly. Hey, Paddy Leonard said, a sucking bottle for the baby. Mr. Bloom walked towards Dawson Street, his tongue brushing his teeth smooth. Something green it would have to be, spinach, say. Then with those raunch and rays searchlight you could. At Duke Lane a ravenous terrier choked up a sick knuckly cud on the cobblestones and lapped it up with new zest. Surfeit. Returned with thanks, having fully digested the contents, first sweet, then savory, Mr. Bloom coasted warily. Ruminants, his second course. Their upper jaw they move. Wonder if Tom Rockford will do anything with that invention of his, wasting time explaining it to Flynn's mouth. Lean people, long mouths to be a hall or a place where inventors could go in and invent free. Course, then you'd have all the cranks pestering. He hummed. 
prolonging in solemn echo the closes of the bars Don Giovanni, a sinor teco im invitasti. Feel better? Burgundy. Good pick-me-up. Who distilled first? Some chap in the blues. Dutch courage. That kill any people in the National Library. Now I must. Bare, clean, closed stools waiting in the window of William Miller, plumber, turned back his thoughts. They could, and watch it all the way down. Swallow a pin, sometimes, come out of the ribs years after. To round the body, changing biliary duct spleen, squirting liver, gastric juice, coils of intestines like pipes. But the poor buffer would have to stand all the time with his insides entrails on show. Science. A senior teco. What does that teco mean? Tonight, perhaps? Don Giovanni, thou hast me invited to come to supper tonight, to rum the rum dum. Doesn't go properly. Keys. Two months if I get Nanetti to. That'll be two pounds ten, about two pounds eight. Three Hines owes me. Two eleven. Prescott's Dye Works van over there. If I get Billy Prescott's ad, two fifteen. Five guineas about, on the pig's back. Could buy one of those silk petticoats for Molly, color of her new garters. Today, today, not think. To the south, then. What about... English watering places, Brighton, Margate, peers by moonlight, her voice floating out, those lovely seaside girls. Against John Long's, a drowsing loafer lounged in heavy thought, gnawing a crusted knuckle. Handyman wants job, small wages, will eat anything. Mr. Bloom turned at Gray's confectioner's window of unbought tarts and passed the Reverend Thomas Conlon's bookstore. Why I left the Church of Rome, Bird's Nest. Women run him. They say they used to give pauper children soup to change to Protestants in the time of the potato blight. Society over the way Papa went to for the conversion of poor Jews. Same bait. Why we left the Church of Rome. A blind stripling stood tapping the curbstone with his slender cane. No tram in sight wants to cross. Do you want to cross? Mr. Bloom asked. The blind stripling did not answer. His wall face frowned weakly. He moved his head uncertainly. You're in Dawson Street, Mr. Bloom said. Molesworth Street is opposite. Do you want to cross? There's nothing in the way. The cane moved out trembling to the left. Mr. Bloom's eyes followed its line and saw again the dyeworks van drawn up before Drago's, where I saw his brilliantined hair just when I was horse drooping, driver in John Long's, slacking his drought. There's a van there, Mr. Bloom said, but it's not moving. I'll see you across. Do you want to go to Molesworth Street? Yes, the stripling answered. South Frederick Street. Come, Mr. Bloom said. He touched the thin elbow gently, then took the limp-seeing hand to guide it forward. Say something to him. Better not do the condescending. They mistrust what you tell them. Pass a common remark. The rain kept off? No answer. Stains on his coat, slobbers his food, I suppose. Tastes all different for him. Have to be spoon-fed first. Like a child's hand, his hand. Like Millie's was. Sensitive. Sizing me up, I dare say, from my hand. Wonder if he has a name. Van. Keep his cane clear of the horse's legs. Tired drudge get his doze. That's right, clear. Behind a bull, in front of a horse. Thanks, sir. Knows I'm a man. Voice. Right now? First turn to the left. The blind stripling tapped the curbstone and went on his way, drawing his cane back, feeling again. Mr. Bloom walked behind the eyeless feet, a flat-cut suit of herringbone tweed. Poor young fellow! How on earth did he know that Van was there? Must have felt it. See things in their forehead, perhaps? kind of sense of volume, 
weight or size of it, something blacker than the dark. Wonder, would you feel it if something was removed? Feel a gap? Queer idea of Dublin he must have, tapping his way round by the stones. Could he walk in a beeline if he hadn't that cane? Bloodless, pious face like a fellow going in to be a priest. Penrose, that was the chap's name. Look at all the things they can learn to do. Read with their fingers, tune pianos, or we are surprised they have any brains. Why we think a deformed person or a hunchback clever if he says something we might say. Of course, the other senses are more. Embroider, plate baskets, people ought to help. Work basket I could buy for Molly's birthday. Hate sewing, might take an objection. Dark men, they call them. Sense of smell must be stronger, too. Smells on all sides, bunched together. Each street's different smell, each person, too. Then the spring, the summer, smells, tastes. They say you can't taste wines with your eyes shut or a cold in the head. Also, smoke in the dark, they say get no pleasure. And with a woman, for instance, more shameless not seeing, that girl passing the Stuart Institution, head in the air, look at me, I have them all on, must be strange not to see her, kind of a form in his mind's eye. The voice, temperatures, when he touches her with his fingers, must almost see the lines, the curves. His hands on her hair, for instance, say it was black, for instance, good, we call it black. Then, passing over her white skin, different feel, perhaps, feeling of white. Post office must answer. Fag today, sent her a postal order, two shillings, half a crown. Except my little present. Stationers just here too. Wait, think over it. With the gentle finger he felt ever so slowly the hair combed back above his ears. Again, fibers of fine, fine straw. Then, gently, his finger felt the skin of his right cheek. Downy hair there too, not smooth enough. The belly is the smoothest no one about. There he goes into Frederick Street, perhaps to Levenston's Dancing Academy piano, might be settling my braces. Walking by Doran's public house, he slid his hand between his waistcoat and trousers, and, pulling aside his shirt gently, felt the slack fold of his belly. But I know it's whitey yellow. Want to try in the dark to see. He withdrew his hand and pulled his dress too. Poor fellow! Quite a boy, terrible, really terrible. What dreams would he have, not seeing? Life a dream for him. Where is the justice being born that way? All those women and children, excursion, bean feast, burned and drowned in New York. Holocaust, karma they call that transmigration for sins you did in a past life. The reincarnation met him pike hoses. Dear, 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 pity, of course, but somehow you can't cotton on to them some way. Sir Frederick Falconer going into the Freemasons' Hall, solemn as Troy, after his good lunch in Earl's Fort Terrace, old legal cronies, cracking a magnum, tales of the bench and assizes and annals of the blue-coat school. I sentence him to ten years. I suppose he'd turn up his nose at that stuff I drank. Vintage wine for them. The year marked on a dusty bottle. Has his own ideas of justice in the recorder's court. Well-meaning old man. Police charge sheets crammed with cases. Get their percentage manufacturing crime. Sends them to the right about. The devil on moneylenders. Gave Reuben J. a great straw calling. Now he's really what they call a dirty Jew. Power those judges have, crusty old toppers and wigs. Bear with a sore paw. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Hello, play card. Miris Bazaar, His Excellency, the Lord Lieutenant, 16th, 
Today it is, in aid of funds for Mercer's Hospital. The Messiah was first given for that. Yes, Handel. What about going out there, Ballsbridge? Drop in on Keys. No use sticking to him like a leech. Wear out my welcome. Sure to know someone on the gate. Mr. Bloom came to Kildare Street. First I must library. Straw hat in sunlight, tan shoes. Turned up trousers, it is, it is. His heart quopped softly. To the right, museum. Goddesses, he swerved to the right. Is it almost certain? Won't look wine in my face. Why did I? Too heady, yes, it is. The walk, not see, get on, making for the museum gate with long, windy steps. He lifted his eyes. Handsome building, Sir Thomas Dean designed. Not following me? Didn't see me, perhaps. Light in his eyes. The flutter of his breath came forth in short sighs, quick, cold statues. Quiet there, safe in a minute. No didn't see me after two just at the gate my heart his eyes beating looked steadfastly at cream curves of stone sir thomas dean was the greek architecture look for something i his hasty hand went quick into a pocket took out read unfolded agendat nitem where did i busy looking he thrust back quick agendat Afternoon, she said. I am looking for that. Yes, that. Try all pockets. Hanker, Freeman, where did I? Ah, yes, trousers, potato, purse. Where? Hurry, walk quietly, moment more, my heart. His hand looking for the where did I put found in his hip pocket, soap lotion, have to call tepid paper stuck ah soap there i yes gate safe end of section 13 recorded by nathan jordan